this long time, we are live at the Chess Space Studio with the discount day, 25% off. And uh, I will let Daniel King enter the scene. And there's my first guest for tonight. Hello, how Daniel, are you? it is lovely to see you. Thanks for joining in. How are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> a little flexible. bit rushed. A little bit rushed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but, uh, a lot of people are a little bit rushed, so I appreciate it highly that you can uh, you had the chance to make it. As we can see already, this is your Fritz trainer, your latest Fritz trainer. I have a little something for you prepared. Um, oh, because, okay. Well, I mean, some people, probably most of the people know you already. So uh, I found a couple of your Fritz trainer DVDs. Uh, okay. These, yeah. these are just those. Uh, there's a couple of more. So let's my babies, my babies they are. They are actually your absolute babies. Yes. So, I'm nice. still not done. Give me a second. Okay, good, good. Okay, so we're almost there. Yeah. Just n never mind the quality. Just <laughs> check the height. <laughs> so everybody who is here and listening right now, I have to announce a raffle about those babies, about Daniel King's babies. These okay. are 28 lovely fritz trainers when do you remember the year when you started the first one i think it was 2006 2006 so yeah some time ago the first one was there but they are mostly or almost all of them are pretty timeless so if you get all of them uh, you definitely will learn something about timeless chess. timeless that is the word it is timeless. a good word hi murat like great culture Oh, there's oh, the, you're, you're, something you're missing, going on in the studio. Oh, you're missing in the picture, Daniel. I'm so I'm so sorry. Ah, ah and I know why. Okay, that thanks thanks for letting me know. Okay, so uh, I was talking all the time, uh, obviously, but of course I have to actually make a Bildschirmaufnahme. Yeah, these are the technical problems. This is much much better. There we go, finally. Okay, so let me adjust this and there. Pardon me. So now you can see me and Daniel. Uh, hi, Murat. Hi, everybody. So now let me quickly announce what I wanted to say. So Please. whoever buys a Fritz trainer by this young gentleman over here, Mr. Daniel King, in this okay. next half hours, uh, enables themselves to win a 25 euro voucher for chest base. We will announce this every half hour until the whole stream is over. So if you always wanted to get some Daniel King stuff, now is definitely the best time so far. Excellent. That also, sounds that sounds good. Well, we just started. Do you have like uh, one of your what? Do you have like a favorite one or the one which you have like, uh, let's say the most heart and soul in it? Is there one of them? Okay, well, first of all, I put my heart and soul into all of them. That. That, was, that was a trick question, and you answered yeah, good, it correctly. Good, good trick question. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to close the window. Go, the go for it, yeah. yeah. It gets a bit chilly here, that's true. Uh, well, no, no, no. It's, it's a, Actually, it's a beautiful, uh, beautifully sunny day. But that's really? just oh, it's thunderstorms actually, announced in Germany. Yeah. Okay, we've got 20, 24 degrees here today. In, oh. It's absolutely stunning, yeah. Okay, nice one. So the weather's better in London than Hamburg. I'm, I keep telling everyone there, but no one believes me. It's true. I, I don't believe you either. No, uh, well, just, just the stats. It's easier to, you know. Anyway, um, <laughs> heart and soul. Um, well, I really like. Uh, this is a tricky question. I really like um, the King's Gambit DVDs, twenty-seven and twenty-eight. Yes. And obviously, it's oh, now you're out of the, the picture. Yeah, oh God, that's because uh, you know I played the King's Gambit as a kid. Uh, you know, in my well, actually, right through my teenage years. So you know, up to a, a fairly you know decent, decent level. You know, sort of twenty three, twenty four hundred. You know, I played it right up to to that level. My goodness, um, and really enjoyed it. Um, and I found it really interesting to go back to revisit these old lines yeah, and, yeah. you know, to test them, to test them, you know, how do they stand up? Um, 
you know, under computer analysis. Yes. Some some do, some don't. <laughs> but but also, you know, to find lines and th that are practically very difficult for one's opponent. True. So, for example, you know, there are, there are some lines that um, a computer thinks might be a little bit dubious, but in practice score extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really sort of discovered a lot about that kind of thing and, you know, discovered a lot about the... the um, kind of players that are still playing the King's Gambit and actually with remarkable success because they've picked out very cleverly lines that in practice score very, very highly for white um, that have, basically it's about complexity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in theory, one could say, oh God, yeah, well, Black's doing okay. But actually in practice, Black scores quite badly in a lot of these lines because it's so complicated. Um, and prime example of that is a line which which I recommend on the DVD, uh, where uh, Peter Lecko defeated uh, Vasily Manchuk. Oh, oh, sorry, the other way around. Yeah, Vasily I just Manchuk. thought like, wow, Peter Lecko. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Least the player least likely to play the King's Gambit, Peter Lecko. Um, <laughs> He was destroyed by uh, Vasily Manchuk. De okay, destroyed is uh, that's 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 not the right word. He he was outplayed yeah. in an absolutely beautiful way by Vasily Manchuk. Mm -hmm. um, it was a rapid play game, nevertheless. It was a very sensible game, um, absolutely beautiful, and yeah, it was one of the lines that um, I I actually recommended. I gotcha. um, and. So the Kings, the, the, you know, the latest two Kings Gambit ones are really like. Um, but there's one which actually hasn't sold very well, which I really like. And it's called The Squeeze. And I think it's number 13. Unlucky 13. It's, it's either 13 or 14. I think it's 13. I think there it is. Yeah, it's called The Squeeze. No, I, 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 I can't remember what name it was given in German. Sorry. But it was... I, I called it the squeeze, and it's basically, um, I discussed how one outplays someone strategically mm -hmm. with from a superior position where, you know, it's not immediately obvious how one makes progress, um, but there are certain techniques that one can use to get, it's all about control and what features um, are necessary, you know, what you can look out for. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's very, very strategic. Um, and I'm really pleased with that. And and those, uh, like I said, it's not the most popular one, mm -hmm. but I think, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's really good. And actually, um, I've had very nice feet for those that did buy it, um, actually uh, really liked it. So yeah, there you go. That's, that one's a bit left field. Excellent. Um, but, but I really like that one. Nice one. Yeah. So, okay. So there we are. So here's the secret tip for for you to to get a hold of. Um, oh yeah, I should. By the way, uh, this just. Uh, I, how about I will just um, post the. Link. I said it's not the most popular one, <laughs> but I think uh, for your um, all of your Fritz trainers in the chat quickly. That's because good. That I think that'll sell too. This is quite a good idea. One there can actually buy the whole lot. You can. For massive, any... That massive, massive discount. You'd yes. be mad to miss it. Yes, I, I completely agree. And um, yeah, but uh, yeah, it has been bought a couple of times already. So yeah, there's no better chance to, to get it done uh, than today. Let me ask you one question about the King's Gambit. How many people said like, ah, oh, Daniel King, haha, ha, King's Gambit. Was this ever something which you encountered and went like, well, wow, that's very creative or where you go like, okay, I had it coming kind of. It's uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, curiously, um, in England, Nobody. very, very rarely. <laughs> okay. It's only, it's usually abroad when people <laughs> uh, mention it and, and think, it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, fine. But it, it's curiously in England. I mean, King in England is actually 
well, not just in England, but in England and particularly Scotland, King is a, is a relatively common family name. Um, so it's kind of not a big deal. I mean, I would say, for example, it's more more common than say Koenig in in German. You know, King King is really quite a a common family name. I mean, basically, uh, you know, I would love to uh, spin the line that you know I have royal blood. Um, <laughs> however, it basically that it probably meant that my uh, ancestors were were peasants on on uh, the, you know the king's land. It's as simple as that, you know. Um, so, like I said, it no, it, it never crops. Very rarely crops up here. Thank God. Okay, that's very good. Seriously, um, one thing about the king's gambit. So I love it, of course, too, because I love all kinds of gambits anyway. And um, one thing which is a very very interesting thing which I heard about. Um, I don't know who I heard it about, but. If you know the king's gambit quite well, with all the theory, with all the tricks and traps and everything which is this aggressive play, mm. and uh, your 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 opponent um, uh, is an e5 player, well, now your opponent has to probably prepare for or against the king's gambit, and this is something which a lot of players go like, oh, please don't. Don't do the king's gambit, please. I'm, I'm not. I don't want to play against that. It is. Uh, there's so much to. I, I don't know how to play against it, and this is such a nice psychological um, uh, power, in my opinion, that you know this. I, I, it is a sound opening after all, and you can still like. You can always bring it up if you have the feeling like, good. Now is the now is the time to play that against it. Yeah, I mean, ever, yeah. You have to be quite brave to to play it exclusively, <laughs> um, but uh, I think, as you say, there's a certain psychology about it because you know everyone understands in this day and age with computers that this is not going to be played in a world championship match. Mm. So it almost puts it puts pressure on your opponent because yeah. uh, they know. Oh God, you know, I should be defeating this really. But actually, uh, okay. in practice, it's not so simple. Um, it's a bit like, you know, playing the bong cloud. <laughs> um, and, you know, because everyone knows that it's just total rubbish. Um, I mean, I wouldn't put the King's Gambit quite in, in bong cloud territory. But um, however, there is a, a bong cloud variation of the King's Gambit, which actually I... Um, I, I did a 60 minute on I can show I can show that variation please show it to us by the way uh, thanks Jürgen Meyerink it's power play 13 this squeeze so yeah you you got it Jürgen that is correct show it to us uh, the the screen is yours I would love to take a look at that okay let me just by the way thanks everybody who joined us here in this uh, nice little stream is that working, by the way? Can you? That um... looks brilliant. Yeah. So I made our picture a bit bigger, and yeah, we can go. Okay. Very good. Uh, so here we go. Um, so King's Gambit. Uh, now on the the two DVDs or downloads, um, I'm advocating Knight F3. However, yes. I did do a 60 minute video on Knight C3, which. I used to play quite a lot, actually. Wow. This is definitely from my misspent youth. <laughs> um, okay. But it's not as bad as it looks. Now, th this is why I I think I, on the DVD, I think it's called the, the Mason Keres Gambit. Wow, this Mason named guy after, played a lot of crazy stuff. Named after James Mason, yeah. who's an Irish player from the 19th century, and obviously Paul Keres, um you know, from sort of 1930s onwards, Keres was playing it. Um, however, I, in more recent times, I kind of christened it the Bong Cloud King's Gambit for, <laughs> for reasons. Yeah, cultural um, reasons. <laughs> well, it's just that, you know, I, I mean, we know what the actual, the, you know, the, the Bong Cloud is where, you know, where you do this and, and King F2 or... Um, 
I think that's called the, the hammer, hammer schlag, right? Yeah. I, I this, is, this is the bonk cloud. I made it. I made a Fritz trainer about the bonk cloud on the first right. of April, though. But, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I think essentially whenever you move the king out to wherever it is, I, it's, I mean, they're all variations of on a theme. Absolutely. <laughs> on bonk cloud theme. So um, anyway, so it, it, I sort of gave it an unofficial name of the. Uh, it's very know, fitting. Bring, bring it more up to date. But uh, as I said, I used to play this quite a lot in serious games. Um, this is difficult for Black to handle if you if you have no clue. Uh, because, okay, I mean, White is a threat here. White plays knight f3 and d4, and you're going to take here. King steps out of the way, and suddenly you have a massive position. Uh -huh. The Black has to react very energetically here. And yes, yeah. Even when black does, you know, it's not that clear. I mean, in fact, you know, this is one of the best moves, which I wouldn't say is particularly obvious. And even when we get to this position, I wouldn't say it's particularly obvious what black should play here. Huh. And, and, you know, this is a fascinating position. Um, I mean, there are all alternatives for black, but, you know, that's basically the main line. So if you want something really wacky, then, you know, you can buy the 60 minutes on that. But, uh, but knight f3 is... Uh, the what, what I advocated on the DVD is the, the main line, and th and this is sensible. So th this is the Kizaritsky, um, you know, one of the the main, um, or, or you know, one of the many lines that which is sort of recommended as uh, well, not exactly a refutation, however, you know, better for black basically. Yeah. Instead of but instead of playing h4, which you could you could say is you know, one of the old main lines. Um, and uh, I think, you know, black generally knows what to do in those kind of positions. The move that I advocated on the DVD is actually knight c3, um, which, is, I mean, it's a very, very old move, but there's there's a lot to this. And after g4, I mean, if you want to be very creative, you can, you can give up these, um, which, which is great fun. I mean, this it's probably not very good, but it's also terrifying. But actually, the move that I like here is knight e5. Again, a very old variation, yeah. which is absolutely not bad for white. Mm -hmm. um, and it tempts black into playing this. It definitely does, yeah. So white has to play g3. Oh, my goodness. And, and this is the main line, oh. and queen g4. I mean, this is fantastic fun. And now there is one move which is sensible and there's one move which is i mean I'm, I'm giving away all the secrets but this is a this is a really nice trap i mean black should exchange queens here and in fact i mean this this end game I mean, white's uh, gambit to the pawn however white has very free development huh. and you know these the pawns are split and you know if white you know just has has a very nice structure here basically and you know castles queen side or you know, bishop here, and um, this is actually really nice compensation. Um, but you'll find that some players attempted into playing g2 check. Yes, uh, because I also is, thought like this looks why why not that? Yeah. Uh, well, indeed, because black is a rook up, which you know in <laughs> could <laughs> could be decisive. Maybe. Um, but in fact, white has a very strong move here. So what what should white play here? Go on, I'll have it. Have a guess. Yeah. Okay. So um, for you at uh, the for you viewers at home, thanks for joining in. If you want to guess with us, you're yeah, free please. to write in. I can't what? see the chat actually. Is the chat on? The chat is on. Yes. Um, I, I haven't got the broadcast, so I, I can't see the chat. Yeah, there is not too many people, but it's actually filling up. I, I can see that's around uh, fifty. So hi on YouTube, hi on Twitch. Thanks for joining us. Get the DVD now. You can win. 25 euro um, voucher for the chess based shop. You ha has to be one of Daniel King. So if you if you enjoy his work anyway, now is the time to uh, appreciate that. Good. Um, now it says my internet connection isn't that uh, doing that well. Well, I hope that was just uh... a <laughs> Queen H5 is a suggestion. That, Queen H5 is an excellent move. That whoever's... looks very good. Yeah. Whoever suggested this, and yeah, this Mike, is thanks. 
um, this is a very good move. And after after this, okay, what's what's the move for White now? Yeah. So now I am. I'm thinking if it's too slow, but maybe it isn't. And actually, yeah, I can see the advantage now. Probably, if I may make a guess, I guess it is d4, just like yeah. That. So so d4 just opens this up. Yeah. Um, and this queen is completely cut out of play. Wow. And this is just a winning position for White. Um, because if if d6, then you take takes and now there's a there's a big juicy oh, check here. okay and that's game over and and you know white even follows up with castle's queen side and you know the king is completely safe nice. i mean it's an absolute you know it's a lightning attack basically um but there, there are some funny variations here i mean there are there's some really nice tricks and traps actually which b7 needs a little bit of thought oh yeah huh. okay so so that's that's your next question. <laughs> How would you deal with that? Because actually, you know, this has occurred in a few games, and actually, whites didn't always get it right. Okay, so there there looks, of course, it looks very tempting and obvious to do some damage on f seven. The question is with which piece. And now that that is the question you yeah. see. So yeah, the king has a nice retreat on d8 i can see okay so i believe well this is just uh, me guessing again if you take with the knight that oh that is a double check so that might actually be it right taking with the knight instead with the queen well in fact yeah if you take with the queen in fact is a mistake yes okay so here i mean actually white hasn't got an obvious follow-up here. Now, I mean, in this game, I mean, it's still, this is still uh, on the edge, but black has an incredibly strong move here. I mean, you know, this is not obvious because the queen is still cut out of play. It can't yeah. take here. You know, white threatens to win a rook, but actually black has an incredibly strong move here. Beautiful move. Perhaps uh, we could we could ask our viewers. My gosh. Okay, yeah, the, the, that is going to be interesting. Yeah, please, uh, if you know the answer, just type it in the chat. Um, I will check it and immediately uh, tell, yeah, if you can even find it. That's <laughs> because... So black to play here. Black is a yeah. really strong move. Nice, nice trick. Hmm. It looks difficult for... But I mean, it looks like black is still in absolutely in, dire in, in straits. Agony, yeah? Yeah. It looks desperate, but actually there's a really, really nice idea. And this, see, this is the thing about the King's Gambit, that the, 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 you know, the, the needle can swing like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it can, you can go from, from minus five to plus five, you know, either way. <laughs> That needle is like in a constant flux. I mean, this this is the joy of the opening. Um, nice. yeah. Okay, any suggestions there? Or no suggestions, and I'm also, to be honest, I am quite clueless. I really, I really don't know, honestly. That is, uh, and it's funny because it's just a couple of moves played. You have to know and have a good answer. Yeah, and th I mean, this is really interesting, and it just shows that you know how uh, you know how much jeopardy there is in the position. Okay, no, um, go go for, tell us, please, Daniel. That that okay. it has to be solved now. I, I, Jesus, come on. Okay, so it covers f seven, um, and if queen takes, which you know on, on any normal day of the week would just give white, well, white only the exchange down. But actually now rook f eight, and uh, this is really bad. This is really bad. That is crazy. And if queen h three, then then this one and or you can see it's you know the pieces are flooding out basically so in fact if we go back that's the reason why queen takes pawn which looks like the most obvious move yes. on the board in fact is a mistake and knight takes is the correct move uh with with some threat so let's just continue a little bit yes please so we'll now let's throw that one open so white's play 
Okay, so I would I would still go for the double check. I think uh, knight d6. Okay, now let's ask our viewers. Okay. Well, we 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 might have a draw as white. <laughs> you can you can you can escape with a draw, yeah. But there's something well, a little bit better. There must be something a little bit better. Very interesting. And no suggestions. What's our chat say? Yeah, the chat is... Uh, oh, there we go. Finally, uh, Lucardos, thanks. Oh my goodness, you're right, Lucardos. Oh, why don't I... S I, uh, I am so blind and I'm embarrassed. Of course, it's Queen E8. Beautiful. Queen E8. Oh yeah. my lord, why don't I... S I uh, this is not my day. Great, and I'm having a live stream today. Okay, Knight of Seven, so there we go. Easy. Yes, Jürgen, Mike, thanks, thanks. Uh, now you woke up, guys. Thanks for for joining in and uh, writing something. <laughs> so, so basically, if we come back here, um, Black is lost in this position. Uh -huh. But but this shows, you know, how easy it is still to to throw it away. Um, so yeah, that's that's just you know one fun variation that you know I look at on the DVD. And in fact. The best, as I said, the best is to exchange queens. And then, you know, white has very interesting compensation there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, that's been played a couple of times. And, you know, white has, white has done absolutely fine there. You know, won some some very nice games, actually. Um, so there we go. That's just one, one little example of uh, the King's Gambit in action. Yeah, it's, and as I, I said, there way. are some very interesting lines that I think um previously weren't explored very much from from the white viewpoint yeah but yeah. you know players have discovered in in recent years that actually you know you don't have to play the king's gambit in in one particular way you know you can actually play it quite positionally sometimes quite strategically um and you know there is there are some really nice lines actually just, let me i'm just going to show one particular line Go for I, it. I realize we're, we're running short of time we are but like guys it's the last two minutes time if you buy something from daniel king now you have a chance for the raffle to get 25 euro so last chance last minutes we have a timer when something is bought now is still the chance okay show, okay show, show us so just very quickly um of course um yeah from this position um, so we've just been looking at G4 and then knight E5. Yeah. Um, but one of the main lines, I mean, this this position can arise from Fisher's defense, which, uh, you know, Bobby Fisher famously published an article in 19, I think it was 63 or 60, 62, could have been 62, I can't remember, oh. um, where he, he called it a bust to the king's gambit. Basically, you know, he said, I've refuted the king's gambit. And... And d6 was his move. Um, and this is one of the lines. But it, it's really interesting that, in fact, Fisher's defense these days is considered to give white actually pretty nice chances. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of the lines that, you know, in, in practice does actually very well for white. Okay. Um, and one of these lines is this. After uh, In this position, you know, the old 19th century way was to play bishop c4 and so on. G3 is really interesting. Okay. Um, I mean, it used to be thought that in these kind of positions that black automatically, you know, had such a clear advantage because, you know, this is a protected pass pawn. Mm -hmm. You can't, H3 can just be met by H5. So yeah, this pawn remains on F3. It's been discovered latterly that after bishop B3 and queen D2 and castle's queen That's side. Long, yeah. White has massive, a massive attack. You you basically you put a rook in the middle. Yeah, you control um, the center beautifully. And well, the point is this: that you're going to play knight f5, or sometimes knight d5, and yeah. whenever that's taken, it just opens up the e file. Um, and there are some, as I said, there are some very very nice games in this line played by serious players. Ponomaryov has played this Jeez. with White. Um, it, yeah, it's it's fantastic fun. So that's one of the lines that I explore. And what I like about it is that at first glance, it looks as though 
Black is doing rather well. True. And it's one of those positions that is really easy to, you know, sucker your opponent into, you know, <laughs> you just lure them on. And yeah. suddenly, yeah. actually, not so easy. So there you go. I can I can see we're over time. But anyway, yes. you, you can tell I had I had a lot of fun with the King's Gambit. Um, so yeah, I mean that that would be you know one of one of my personal favorites. But um, but if you're interested, you know, if, if viewers are interested in openings, well, I look at um, King's Gambit, Queen's Gambit, Nidor, French. Uh, these basically, you know, th this was my opening repertoire. Um, <laughs> But also, you know, I look at middle games, you know, middle game strategy and end games as well. You know, I, I have sort of end game essentials, you know, pawn end games and rook end games, you know, knowledge that you just have to know. Yes. Uh, not, you know, I don't go into, it's not encyclopedic, but, you know, this is really essential <laughs> knowledge. So anyway, I hope viewers have some kind of idea of what's what's in, in my power play series. Thank you so much. It was such a delight to have you here, Daniel. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Wave goodbye to Daniel. This okay, is... I'm, am I out of here now? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, throwing, I'm throwing you out. The next ones are waiting already. Thanks a lot, Fantastic. Daniel. Okay, listen, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, have a, have a nice time. All Thanks right, I'll see you later. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Bye. Bye, bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this was Daniel King. This is, yeah, the beautiful... King Scambit and um, yeah, I love this opening really, really much, and I hope you enjoy it too. Werwolf, thanks uh, for for joining in. We have somebody here coming up soon in a short moment, Mr. Robert Rees. Let me try to get him into the um, where 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 was this again? He must be here somewhere. Oh, here, here is. Okay, wait a second. No, that is not him. There he is, Mr. Robert Rees. There you go. Look, what? Who drew this, Robert? You look like a comic figure. Yeah, yeah. One second, one second. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you somehow you don't allow me to share my video. That's not fair. I'm so sorry. Um, how could I? Why did I ever do this? Maybe like this? You're so mean to me, Arna. I, but I wanted to see this comic uh, figure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it working now? Yes. Now it, it does. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. Uh, Robert, for, okay. So, first of all, I have to quickly announce thanks for being here. And now the time begins. If you get a Fritz trainer, by Mr. Robert Rees, then uh, you have the chance to enjoy the raffle for a 25 euro gift voucher card. You will get it next week. I will post the link of all of Robert Rees' um, uh, products in the chat right now. Click on it, get it now, and um, yeah, you're, you're part of the raffle. And as we can see, we're like uh, roughly almost 60 people. That means you have a very high chance uh, of uh, maybe being one of the lucky ones. And Robert, so first of all, now I have to ask you, uh, who drew this comic uh, figure? Or is it an app or what was that? Well, it's, uh, it's a friend of mine, uh, Simon Williams. I think he created it for, uh, for me. Simon uh, Williams, the yeah. Ginger DM, created Ginger this DM. for you. Yeah, How cool did. is that? Yeah, That's yeah. so awesome. This is one of your latest Fritz trainers, Calculation Training Booster. And you have done a lot of calculation training or a lot of training, which is um, like a bit different from the Fritz trainers where you're going too deep into the openings. Uh, hi, Chess Zebra, by the way. Thanks. Thanks, everybody who is writing into the chat. It's nice to have you in. I'm always uh, welcoming your, your comments and say hi to Robert if you want to. Uh, calculation is a big theme for your Fritz trainers and you are, are you a calculation monster? Do you love calculating positions yourself? I do, I do, but I, I have to be honest, at some point I realized that I was a lazy player and <laughs> I kind of forced myself to, to become more active and I think improving your calculation abilities, it will help you in all different uh, 
areas, different aspects of the game, uh, opening wise, but you also will look for more aggressive type of uh, positions when you feel confident. If you don't feel confident, you, you're, you're trying to, to get out of these uh, sharp battles. Yeah. So I even forced myself to, to work harder on it. And definitely with my students, I try to encourage them to, to work on their calculations. So one of the reasons I do have a lot of material, it's, uh, it's for my students, but also for my DVDs, of course. Excellent. So you're, yeah, you're doing the kind of the best thing, um, what should be done. You are pushing the players to go into the uh, crunch zone, to go into the tough zone. And to, yeah, well, as we all probably know, and I think everybody can agree with this, uh, often when we do something where it hurts, for example, going to the gym, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and then you have uh, some muscle pain the next day. Well, The calculation training is probably as simple as that. I've done a couple of uh, calculation trainings with Elizabeth Peets. She will join later in the show as well. And it is always, it's painful for, for the head. What do you um, say? How long should you calculate? Calculate, or does it depend on the person, or well, both. is there no de limit? De depends on a lot of factors. Yeah, depends on uh, the moment in the game. Like you should sense. Uh, that's also what I try to discuss in the DVDs. You yeah. should sense the, the right moment when to calculate, when not, when to cut off your calculations. Like you, you feel like it's too unclear. Uh -huh. You you can decide to postpone the decision to calculate or just make a general uh, assumption that, uh, well, it's uh, it looks slightly better. At least I am slightly better. Um, let's not go too deep. And um, <laughs> you, you, it's also trying to become practical when to calculate and when not. Uh, but of course, you, you should not uh, you should not uh, avoid the, the, the complications and uh, get yourself out of the comfort zone, as you said. Yes. What, what about time management? Do you have like something Uh, where you go like, okay, this is the amount of time I will calculate on this very difficult position, or do you go like, well, that's the 10 minute limit, I have to stop now and make a move? <laughs> yeah, well, there are, there are a couple of things, and I, I discussed them also in, in, in DVDs. Um, yeah. In general, there there's after a certain point, you're not going to calculate any new lines. So it, de it depends with every player. But Normally, um, after 10 minutes, you're not going to see much new stuff. <laughs> oh, um, wow. oh, my God. Well, it depends if you I go really deep it. in the line. But a lot of players who are uh, viewing this interview now also, they uh, recognize it from their own games that um, um, you, you start calculating and then you go back. Mm -hmm. You try it again and you go back. And the, yeah, okay, it's not not very practical depends if you go into a very deep forcing line yeah okay then uh, at some point you can discover new things but very often there are also positions which are not forced at all you you see a couple of moves and you go back you see a couple of moves and you go back and that's not uh, what you supposed to do uh... and also about time management in general what i notice with a lot of students uh, i have they uh, they tend to spend a lot of time also in in the opening to try to be as precise as possible But mm -hmm. you know that the critical moments in the game, they often uh, come at a later uh, stage. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't want to hear all these truths, but yeah, <laughs> it is a big part of it. Can you show us a little um, bit uh, from one of your Fritz trainers? Have you prepared some some something which we can make some guesses with or something? Yeah, definitely. I, I, there's one uh, one of my favorite exercises. I will uh, share oh. my screen. Let's go. I like favorite exercises. So And you good. you can see it, right? I, I can I see it. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Let so me quickly adjust our picture so the chessboard is visible. And for you at home, you can start guessing with us. Oh gosh, okay. Well, we have. Yeah, so here. it's a it's a game from the Sitges uh, tournament, which was played in December. It was a tiebreak game. It's a blitz game, which explains the the mistake we are going going to get to see gotcha. by a strong uh, grandmaster. It's a game uh, set to Raman against uh, Lucas van Forest. Oh, okay. And two, as you can see, why it is um, why it is an exchange and two pawns up? What can go wrong here? Yeah, so it's why to play, and you gotta be uh, gotta be very precise. Okay, Jürgen. By the way, it says very often if you calculate too long, it is a sign you can't calculate it. That there is some truth in this too. Make a guess. What is uh, so? White's white's to move, right? 
Yes, it's um, it's wise move. How and, to continue? Yeah, and uh, as as a little piece of advice, uh, especially when you're material up, like in a situation like this, it also does help when you start thinking about the opponent's uh, resources here as uh, as well. Yes, there must. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, this is this big big problem I often have that uh, if I would have a position like this as white. I would probably feel uncomfortable because, yeah, I have a piece more. So this should be won by white, right? And then I have to just prove it. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of pieces around the king. And, um, yeah, that that makes it a bit... <sighs> you know, there are, there are two type of people, I believe. People like you, Arne, who believe that uh, it, it should be... Uh, I mean, it could be an unpleasant situation you're in. But there are also people who don't sense the danger at all. Uh -huh, uh -huh. True, yeah. Anyway, um, we have a suggestion. Random, uh, random solver says rook c one and c six. These are let's let's have options. a look. If if you if you play the move rook c one, mm. looks like a very looks, safe move. Like you're protecting uh, your king even better. The rook is closer to the king. You're threatening the queen. But what is black going to do now? Well, there is a check, right? But that doesn't that doesn't help black that much, I think. So there, um, there is a, there is a check on e4, and then if you go king a1, the checks are over. Exactly. Right. So this is what people probably expect. But let's mm -hmm. go back, and also as uh, playing with white, you got to consider all black's uh, forcing options. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, but here some some people say, but uh, but rook f one, it's it's uh, or queen queen c one. Oh my goodness, Locardos! Excellent. You oh. you can sacrifice the queen, and then the uh, rook comes down, and checkmate is oh, in inevitable. Oh God, the shock must be so. Oh. When exactly. you play this secure move, and you get that on the exactly. board for oh. exactly but let's let's go back because there are actually quite a number nice. of uh, tricky uh, ideas here because um it looks like white is just winning but if white is going to play a random move like uh, which is what uh, white did in the game white played here the move queen a5 yeah what is uh black going to do in that case okay what is going to happen after queen a5 i have i have an idea uh i want the people so uh -huh, okay look locardo's good chess player it seems already has some some interesting suggestions here anybody else want to give a tip no but um also jürgen said the uh, queen c1 before yeah i think uh, i think uh locardo's is right again it is it should be queen e4 check right with the same Very pattern nice. Which which was missed by a twenty six hundred player. Okay, even though it's a blitz game, still yeah. it's uh, it's uh, very important to be alert of uh, these kind of tactics, and it's the the same mating motive on yeah. the on the back rank. Brutal, brutal. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful example. You're right. That is, uh, gosh. So what the heck is uh, White supposed to play here? Uh, is my question because it's uh, well. Okay, yeah, what what the what the heck can white do? Yeah. Well, you, you need to anticipate the threats. That's also part of uh, calculation, of course. Yeah. And a lot of people uh, spot that queen takes e4 is a big threat here, and that's why they uh, thought that uh, rook c1 is is an option. But we have yeah. seen that's not not good. Um, so is it is it rook e2, d2 e2? Is this one option or is it still? Like, let's let's have a look. Rook D E two, like overprotecting the pawn on on E four, but there's a big uh, drawback uh, to no. this particular move. No. Oh gosh, there is a yeah. I I can see it. Uh, for you, uh, what about E four? Mm. King A one to avoid the checks. That's uh, John Kula. That is a very 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 good idea. We, we will get there in a e second. Yeah. Yeah. We. Yeah. But Lucado says e5 too. But of course, there's a. Let me say it. I think there is a check on d3. And or then... or just just we have seen oh, the, gosh, the, right. the problems before with the king with you the back take, rank. You just take the rook on e2, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it's the the same mating mating motive again. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> so every time it's a mating motive in a, in a slightly different uh, form, yeah, whether it's a, a deflection motive on E4 or, or on E2. Um, so I'm the not best even move, an, an yes, hour in and then making terrible, terrible, terrible decisions. I didn't even see the smothered mate from, from Daniel King just uh, uh, <laughs> like 15 minutes ago, which was so clear. I, I, I feel terrible, but it's good because the people at home can make more guesses like this. So, yes, sorry, I uh, didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, so um, the only there's only one way for White to, to win this game, and it's a prophylactical move. It's the move uh, King A1, as mm -hmm. mentioned already. Mm -hmm. And it's with the idea to get out of that uh, check uh, uh on, on e4 so uh black no longer has any checks you may consider here taking the pawn on e4 anyway yeah. uh with with a deflection uh, motive but and now, yeah and now there, there are various moves but you should keep in mind that wherever the white rook goes uh the the black queen can follow let's say if you play something like rook c1 at, at least I can try to annoy your annoy you with a move like Queen C4, and we go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. So very very important with this uh, kind of um, positions. It's important to realize what is the exact problem and how can you uh, anticipate it. Yeah. Try to determine what the problem is, and then all these lines. It's the back rank, and White's back rank is not very stable. So how can you um, do something about it? Okay, so what to do in this situation? How to uh, deal with this annoying back and forth of... Um, oh, gosh. Well, I have, an, I have a little idea, um, but it is actually... No, it's not working. I'm terrible. The, the, this is such the, a difficult position, the Robert. The, yeah, the truth is it's not the most spectacular position, but it's something people often associate with calculation that there should be a brilliant combination. Yeah. But in this case, um, you have to take some defensive measures first. And uh, the best move here, it's not the only winning move, but by far the best move here is bringing the rook back to d1, which is a sort of invisible move, right? Like you didn't really expect the rook would go back to, uh, to defend uh, the, the other rook on e1. But of course, you cannot take the rook because then the queen can be taken. And that means that after rook d to d1, suddenly white has a double threat to take the queen and to take uh, the bishop. And now, uh, let's say, uh, black goes away with the queen. We can move our rook and we have consolidated our back rank and from here on, we are able to extend our advantage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My. But it's a uh, it's 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 a little little tricky uh, tricky exercise. But I, I thought it's very nice that when you see this position at first, you think it's an easy win for White. Yes. But the, the truth is that there's only one uh, winning uh, move. My God. Yeah, that's a absolutely stunning example. Wow. Very very nice, Robert. Indeed. Um, Chess Zebra, thanks for uh, purchasing one of Robert Rees' uh, Fritz trainers. You are part of the raffle, obviously. So, yeah, maybe the 25 euro gift card is going to you next week. We will and you make me very happy as well. So, thanks and for that. And you make Robert very happy, which is very nice. We <laughs> always want to make Robert very happy. That I can tell you. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, uh, do you have uh, any other example or... Um, we still have a couple of minutes left, so we can have some small talk, but um, if you have something... Sure, I, I, I do have another tricky uh, example. Let me oh, uh, okay. find it. Um, I'm, I'm just so scared that I'm that my chess knowledge is like... I have the feeling I'm an ELO 23 at the moment. We will come back <laughs> to this later when we are talking about Komodo 3, where you can even have a computer play with an ELO of 1. I will have some questions about that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Yeah, right so again. Uh, another position, and it's it's pretty much uh, similar to the to the previous example. Like oh. White has a big material advantage. True. Uh, it's uh, a queen and two pawns versus a, a rook and a bishop. And um, but on the other hand, the, the knight is hanging on yes. uh, on e two. So Black is about to regain some material. But the question is what to do here as uh, as white. And I can um, reveal already there's only one winning continuation. <laughs> and it's but it's also trying to understand 
uh, what the danger, uh, where the danger lies in this position for, for white. Does black have any uh, counter ideas apart from uh, regaining uh, material by taking the knight? There are some other factors um, to be considered here as, as well. So I don't want to lean too wide out of the window, but I think I might see the real threat which black has to offer. Um, by the way, Mike Weddington, thanks a lot. Uh, bought two calculation uh, trainers in the past. Uh, Robert is even more happier about this. Fantastic. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what can we what can we do here, guys? Um, so, well, probably we might have to defend our knight. And what is the threat? I can see a clear threat building up here against white. Um, if you have any idea, type it into the chat. I'm curious. Mm, I don't see, I really don't see um, which move we can make so far. Well, and, and, and don't worry, yeah, in, the, in the game, uh, former world champion Antoinette Stefanova also made a wrong decision. So things are not that simple at all. But she, um, she played here to move king, at, king f2, like okay. very natural move, right? Yeah, totally, to yes. defend the knight and uh, attack the bishop. But what do you think? What is black going to do with this piece? Mm. I'm not sure if black will do uh, that much, but if so, then it would go to g4, I guess. Very nice. Very nice move because the bishop is safe. Yeah. And it uh, deprives the queen from getting back to uh, to h3 at exactly. some point. Exactly. Yeah. One of the last spaces for the queen. Exactly. Wink, wink. Yeah. And, Mike, um, Mike well, this was played in the game. And now after uh, white played h3 to challenge the bishop, there followed bishop e7, threatening the queen. And the queen has only one square to go to, queen h6. Yeah, that's the problem. And now um, we attack the queen once again, bishop f8. And despite the material advantage, white had only uh, uh, a way to, uh, to force a draw. There was not much else uh, white could do. Right, so yeah, that's it's it's not really bad, but it's uh, given the the circumstances, it's a pity to white to has, let that, your that, opponent. That's like a loss for white, of course. Exactly. So, um, Werewolf let's go. Also back. wrote king f two. So werewolf, it, it it wasn't the you just got a draw, but you are only as good as uh, Antoinette Stefanova. That's an elo of two thousand four hundred sixty nine <laughs> to that point. So don't worry about that. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, Let's go back so we understand. There's the threat of bishop takes e2. And uh, if you play a random move, if you're not fast enough, bishop g4 could come when the queen is trapped. Yes. What can I do about it? Um, okay, so king f2 doesn't work. The queen is still in... Well, you know, I'm, I thought about queen h3 for a second, but hmm, maybe it's actually, and then queen g2. It's not such a bad idea, but the, the problem is that probably if the bishop goes back, oh you're, no, you're not able to get in there. <laughs> that is so mean. What a move. Yeah, very beautiful. Okay, I'm wrong once again. And okay. now, the, now the difficult thing comes, as it's impossible to defend against both threats, but you can create, uh, set up a new um, uh, counterattack. Oh, now I see it. Now I see it because Locardos, once again, uh, I think has the right idea. Or does he actually not? Now, well, let's see. So Locardos says h3. H3, and the idea is that if you take the bishop, the, um, then the, the king comes closer, I guess, right? But then I think the queen is trapped once again, right? But okay, from material point of view, this is also already a big improvement for black with uh, two bishops and a rook for the queen. Yeah, you might not even want to have a draw now. True. <laughs> exactly. Maybe black is going to play for a win. So no. now I, I'm, I'm going to help you guys because this, this is a tough one. Yeah, it is. The only move, the only winning move here for white is to drop back with the knight to, to c1. Maybe you looked at that and I, thought it's it's just no, too I bizarre didn't. to be true. I didn't even see that because my goodness, why? So yeah, and bishop g4 again, right? Only only attempt here for black because otherwise the queen just escapes. Yeah. So bishop g4. And now the main point of why it's a previous move is that the knight comes to d3. Oh, beauty. If you oh, attack the queen, God. 
we have the check on e5. Oh, that is nice. That is nice. And you king goes away. Yeah. And of course, the queen is still hanging. Yeah. So the we, we got to move the queen. But now the big difference having the knight on e5, it's not that even that we are threatening to take the rook, which is of course a nice advantage. But the main point is that after bishop uh, f8, you can now take the pawn on e6. Yeah. That is actually you win now. Yeah. And after any other move, let's say if you uh, move the rook and attack the queen, then the queen is relatively safe on, on h7, uh, threatening the rook. Um, if the rook moves, you can also take the, the bishop on g4. Yeah, so get out of there. E eventually, we will untangle and to get out of there, exactly. That was a tough cookie indeed. Nice one, Robert. No, this this is, this is a tough one. Yeah, this definitely. is a tough one, of course. So you you have um, yeah a lot of Leo Fritz trainers uh, are about this calculation. It is exactly those positions which we us players have on the chessboard every now and then. And um, yeah, I and this enables you to recognize new patterns, new ideas in a certain situation where you go like, oh, wait, I had this once upon a time. I know how to play this probably. Maybe I should just move the king to the side here. There is some danger going on. You have your spider senses a bit more uh, stronger like this. So, um, yeah, wow. Um, by the way, Locardus, thanks for giving up your tips and just guessing wildly because that's what the fun is about. It's not uh, using an engine and always being right. It was a good idea, so I like that. Hey, Zipke! Hey, Zipke! Hi, <laughs> Hi yeah, Robert. We have a Dutch Hi, colleague here. You can you can um, unshare the screen again, Robert. Thanks for, for this nice little insight. Thanks for now, and uh, I wish you a lot of fun uh, for the rest of the day, Arne. Thank you very much, Robert. So this was Robert Ries and... Uh, yeah, guys, get the calculation trainer. Um, the last mid, last three minutes are running. You still can get it. You are enabling to a raffle of uh, 25 euro. Um, Zipke, Robert, you, you know each other, right? I mean, because you're Dutch chess players, I assume. Too well. Yeah. Too well. We, we, we met each other before. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I met Zipke a couple of times at the board as well. <laughs> Bad memories of that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay, that's good. But uh, have you ever played against each other a couple of times too, or? Not that I can remember. Oh. Robert, well, do we have games? It's too modest. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Guys, um, yeah, uh, Robert, okay, uh, do you want to give any last uh, words of nice advice? You still have uh, two minutes on this beautiful uh, Not in particular, just what I wanted to say is that for, for me, the... Um, the calculation exercises, the, the Fritz training uh, format is, is really great with the interactive uh, section. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in this case, I just showed you uh, bri briefly two examples uh, of a short uh, variation. But uh, in most of these examples, in 29 in total in, in the latest uh, DVD, uh, there are multiple questions. So mm -hmm. sometimes there is a bad move and you got to punish it or there's a great move and you got to find a, a follow up. And that's uh, just great with the interactive format. That's the only thing I wanted to say, not to give any uh, further plug on my uh, on my own uh, work. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I I think that's uh, why the um, interactive section stands out and it perfectly matches with the uh, with the calculation uh, format. Excellent. Yes, right. about, it is a discount stream. It's a discount day for Chespe, so we get really like. Uh, um, uh, yeah kind of promote uh, the the products you have made you've put a lot of work into and everybody has done this so uh, why not just go like listen of this course is yeah, available yeah. <laughs> right now so i think it's totally fine like this thanks a lot robert so thanks a we, lot we speak soon right see you soon all the best have a nice thank day bye, bye. bye thank you so this where do i put this i think here on on my stack next to the all the Daniel King uh, DVDs, Fritz Trainers, 28 in total. This here, this is you. Uh, are you here? Yeah, you can see that. Zipke Ernst. And it hi. is... Hi. First of all, yeah. First of all, hi. How are you doing? Is, is everything good in your chess life? <laughs> yeah, perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That sounds, that sounds very, very good. Now, uh, I have to quickly um, promote your, um, your Fritz trainer because it is your one and only so far 
there are maybe some in the pipeline, but this is the flexible open Spanish. Yeah. I will post the link into our chat because uh -huh. as you know already, if you buy this Fritz trainer or the 60 minute video even, you enable yourself to uh, win a voucher uh, worth 25 euro next week and you can use it for anything you want in our chess-based shop. And since we are uh, roughly 60 viewers, your chances are quite big to, to get this voucher. Um, Sipke, so the open Spanish. This is, this is a, a full uh, on one of the most, I would say most played openings in the world. Is it something which you can... Sure, it's uh, one of the most played openings, but it's definitely uh, one of the very uh, uh, most reliable lines that uh, one mm -hmm. can uh, play to have on your repertoire when facing one E4, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, the Nidorf uh, of the Sicilian uh, is is a, a high quality weapon. Uh, but if you look in the E4, E5 openings, then yes. I think there's the Berlin Wall, and uh, well, there's the Open Spanish and the Marshall. Those I think are the top three, and of course also the 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 Petrov defense. Uh, oh, they so. are really uh, quality openings. Huh. For you at home, what is your favorite opening playing e4, e5 uh, as black? Do you like it when your opponent plays uh, the Juy Lopez or the Italian game or the Petrov? What is, uh, I, I'm just curious, I want to know what is one of your favorite uh, openings at home? Uh, well, at, yeah, at the yeah, moment. For you, Rob, uh, for you, Sipke, what is your favorite opening at the moment? <laughs> Well, I, I rather I, I would rather face the real Lopez at the moment uh, because yeah. I think Italian is uh, kind of uh, uh, tricky nowadays. Uh, getting more so dangerous. <laughs> it's getting more dangerous. Yes, there are so many uh, interesting new ideas, and I think also uh, bit wide. If you have to choose between the Italian and the real Lopez, I think uh, to learn all this real Lopez theory. I'm not sure it's really worth it. I think the uh -huh. Italian is just a lot more compact and uh, yeah, therefore uh, I think uh, wow. that's a, that's a, if you, if you need to pick an opening against E45 at wide, then I would choose the Italian. Yeah. Wow. Oh, some honest and very interesting words. That is, uh, yeah, I personally, I, I mean, there's the old story or the old saying, when you learn chess, you learn the Italian right from the start, right? And then it is difficult. Yeah. Then it just depends on, can you ever get out of the Italian? Will you ever play something like first D4 or either, or uh, even go Rui Lopez or go into the Sicilian terrain? How was it with you? Did you also, did you also grow up with the Italian game? Um, that's a long time ago. <laughs> and, um, Do you remember? Yeah, yeah I, I actually quite quickly uh, switched to more uh, D4 openings with white. Huh. Um, I probably did play some Italians, but probably when I was like uh, a, a young teenager and very quickly I started to play the real Lopez because, oh. um, yeah, but back then the Italian did not have the same reputation, obviously, as it has now. I think that all started probably... 2005 or maybe later oh. that actually the Italian was picked up by by uh, by world-class players and uh, and white was successful with it okay I actually didn't know that that is fairly interesting um can you give us a little insight about uh, the open Spanish well sure I can uh, do I that um yeah, so uh, what's the best uh, thing that I can uh, do? Is just show a game or, uh, show, share or the some screen, lines? Show, yeah. show whatever you want to uh, yeah. show us, which okay, might yeah. be interesting for us. Maybe where we can make some guesses, because yeah, that's always like it's always nice uh -huh. to include the people. Okay. Which we yes, always that's do a, anyway. that's that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in that case, um, I need to hide the notation. Yeah, um, not necessarily, best. because I think I will put our uh, videos on top of it. Aha, okay. Yeah. So, okay, interesting. So I can just share the screen. You can just and share then... it and it should, be, it should be over the notation. 
Okay, good. Okay, then I'll do that. Let's hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. And how there is it? we are. Yes. Good. Uh, okay. Just in time, yeah. I did it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show you uh, one of the games that I played uh, when I was still very young. And uh, the open Spanish uh, very quickly became the cornerstone of my uh, repertoire with Black. Uh, okay. I believe that uh, in 1995, uh, there was this world championship match between uh, Kasparov and Anand. And Anand used mm -hmm. the, uh, the open, open Spanish. And, uh, and that's the moment uh, that I started to pick it up. And also because there was a, a brilliant... A uh, little book by Krasenkov uh, that was published in 1995, and uh, yeah, um, I liked it also because not too many players um, played it at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I had this uh, big fascination for one line, uh, and that's the line uh, that occurred in this game with a very interesting material imbalance. Oh, so, um, I love that. That's always yeah. exciting. <laughs> That's definitely always uh, exciting. Okay, so this game was played in 1996. Uh, my opponent uh, was uh, is uh, Martin Solefeld, who is also a GM uh, nowadays. Wow. Um, yeah. So the game continued as follows: Knight of three, Knight c six. So yeah, here yeah, Bishop c four, very good move. Yeah, but. Uh, my <laughs> opponent, my opponent, for the uh, purpose of <laughs> when bishop b5, which is, of course, also interesting. I play a6, bishop a4. Yeah, now actually, so on this Fritz trainer, I also give um, repertoire suggestions against bishop take c6, mm -hmm. and of course, also against bishop c4. Um, yeah, it's it's a complete repertoire against uh, e4, e5, right? Com so complete is it like? No, not, this... I think it's Spanish only. Yeah, Spanish yeah. only. I'm sorry. But, yeah. yeah, 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 no, no, but no, uh, but um, I'm sorry, but I always, uh, I always, I, and I lost a lot of games, so I don't yeah. do this anymore. But I played uh, in this variation. I played uh, knight to d4, the bird uh, defense. Uh, here, here, here! Already knight d4. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's yes. uh, that's. Um... I, I lost too many games with this. Yeah, I can so... imagine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. You, wouldn't you wouldn't really recommend it to. Wouldn't <laughs> recommend this as a as a lifetime repertoire, so to say. No, <laughs> no. Um, good, good. Yeah, actually, uh, even after bishop c4, you can go knight d4. Yeah, that's a very famous trick because after knight yes. takes e5, there's queen g5, and then after bishop take f7, king e7, I believe. Uh, that uh, white is just lost, or knight takes f7. It's it's quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, knight takes f7, and then there's this beautiful trick. And the anecdote about it is that my second game I've ever played in my life, I was white in exactly you were this white. position. Aye. Seven moves later, Aye. I was checkmated. Well, and, people and, had high and you didn't give me. up. Yeah, you didn't give up on chess anyway. Wow. I, yeah, <laughs> you tried right. Actually, yeah. it made me stronger. Yeah, it's always, oh, everybody should have this experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, actually, my very first club game, I, I just got checkmated. What's this called? Uh, this, 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 this queen h5, bishop c4 stuff. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah I, actually, I, 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 I forgot, the, the, the I forgot oldest, the name. One of the yeah. oldest uh, things in the yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. Okay, anyway, uh, the opening uh, event is as follows Knight of Six Castle. And uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with uh, what is now the open real opus. Well, Bishop e7 is the, the closed real opus. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, uh, open real opus is when you take the pawn on e4. Brave. Yeah. yeah, brave, brave. But actually, it's not a problem. Our king will be out of the center in no time at all. Okay. So uh, we are uh, move like rookie one doesn't really harm us at all. In fact, uh, many, many people play this way. Don't yeah. know any theory on the open, open, open Spanish, right? Uh, it's a very logical move. It looks very, very logical. I would play it myself yeah. too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, but in this case, uh, you can just uh, play knight c5, mm -hmm. and you're attacking uh, the bishop on uh, a4. Uh, so white can take on e5, but uh, we can just uh, develop bishop e7. That's a fine move. Oh, and okay. uh, yeah, we're anyway going to, going to 
pick up this uh, bishop uh, at some point. Actually, there's also no problem with just taking first on e5. Rook e5, bishop e7, bishop b3. Probably uh, black is actually slightly better here uh, because we can just take this bishop and uh, then castle. Oh my and goodness. of course, at this moment, having bishops uh, is maybe not too important, but uh, maybe in some end game, uh, 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 this can be uh, quite quite uh, uh, quite pleasant advantage for black. Yeah, so long term, black is doing quite well here. I like that. So, and I, I suspect that uh, okay, maybe the positions are not not the most interesting, but it's black actually who is fighting for an advantage here. I believe uh -huh. after d4. It's a bit different. Here it's time to, to uh, play the move b5, bishop b3, so that we are now able to support our uh, knight on e4 with the move d5. Okay. And now white will take on e5 with the pawn, and then we will defend the pawn on d5 with bishop b6. And Whew. here this is an important moment for white. Uh, white has to choose a line here. Okay. And um, there are four main moves that are uh, extensively covered, of course, uh, on, on the DVD. Uh, well, there's bishop e3, there's queen e2, uh -huh. in order to prepare rook d1. Yes, that and doesn't so look that nice. Looks, looks, looks logical, yeah. Uh, there's the move c3. And the move yeah. knight d2. C3 was played in this game, which was the main move at that time. And knight okay. bd2. Knight bd2 is, uh, in, uh, became much more popular uh, after Kasparov destroyed uh, Anand in, I think it was the 10th uh, game <laughs> of the match in 1995. Then it appeared that the matters were not so simple for black. Oh my gosh. Um, so, yeah, the 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 the, the game has, has continued with uh, C3, mm -hmm. yeah, and now uh, at that time, if I recall correctly, the main move was Bishop E7, but I played Bishop C5. Okay. Now B D2. So the point of C3 uh... is that White can bring the Bishop to C2 and put some pressure on this Knight on E4. Okay. Yeah, so black continues finishing the de development, and now after bishop c2, uh, we have there... to make a decision yes. what to do with this knight and on now e4. Now I understand why you said it's a material imbalance, I believe. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's a thing which you don't have in mind normally, but then again, where to move the... Yeah, well, you can go to g5, but it looks dangerous. Yeah, it looks a, looks a bit, uh, yeah, that looks very dangerous. Yeah, but this bishop on c1, yeah, you don't want to go knight g5. Yeah, that's probably, probably white will take it. And then after queen takes g5, we well, since there's this bishop d4. here, there's knight e4. And uh, yeah, I would be scared. Yeah, I would be too. scared. Yeah, yeah so that's, no, that's we, no we're not going to do that. Yeah, Of course, it's an option to support the knight with f5. That could be played as well. Oh, okay. I didn't think of that. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting that's, uh, because if takes knight takes back, and then we have a nice open line. Okay, that would be fantastic. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm I'm afraid that after f5, <laughs> white will take ampassan, and then we will have to play knight take f6. And actually, I never had a good look at this position, mm -hmm. uh, but probably something is a bit off here. So yes, I don't totally trust it. But f5 uh, is probably a move, and the same is uh, you can also support this uh, knight on e4 with the move bishop f5. Uh -huh. uh, that's uh, actually uh, also covered on this uh, this yeah. fist trainer uh, because there are some um, yeah classical games uh, in, with this position, so yes. had to include it as well. Looks quite looks quite okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I really liked this move. Okay, guess guess what? Well, Arne. yeah, so <laughs> I, I think I know it already. Uh, if you want to make a guess uh, at home right now, type it into the chat quickly what you think so we can engage a little. There's uh, almost 60 people here. So, um, yeah, it would be, would be cool if you can... Uh, 
just type something in the chat too so we know that you are also there and uh, enjoying this and um y yeah so it's very very interesting because uh, uh can we win something you can um baba craft if you get uh fritz trainer from zip Ernst. in the next 15 minutes you uh are in the raffle for a 25 euro voucher from chess base every half an hour we have a new raffle for the 25 euro for the person who is online here and shows us a little bit about their fritz trainer so my guess i, I just to not delay the show too much i would just take on f2 right I mean, absolutely it, it has to happen i guess and that's fairly interesting yeah because um i think now so you have too. to you have to explain a lot i am afraid <laughs> uh yeah well of course normally it's not good to exchange a knight and a bishop for a rook and a pawn and that's because um yeah the two minor pieces in the middle game or in the opening usually are much much stronger than a rook and a pawn however in this case, with the move f6, Oops. black immediately manages to activate uh, this rook. And also the e-file will be opened, so this rook on a8 will also very quickly join in. And then, of course, it's a totally different story. Yeah, For example, uh, I'm pretty sure that many people have seen the following kind of game. Uh, bishop c5, d3. Uh, I have I have had students that went eight six here, for example, yes. because uh, because after knight f six, there is the they were afraid old... for the move knight g five. Yeah. Fried liver is it Castle. already or no no, no. But yeah but it, no 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 but this is yeah it's a famous position of course yeah it's I wouldn't say it's famous it's just uh, something. This uh, it, kind of motive. I'm sorry. Happens. Yes, you're right. You're yeah. right. It's a. It's something which all of us learn at one point. That's yes. what I wanted to say. Yeah. Not famous, but famous for learning. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so they uh, ma many players starting out. They're really afraid for this, and actually, they they think they lose material here. Well, uh, in fact, if you have an engine at home and you you switch on the engine here, it probably says something like it's plus two or plus three for black. Yes, uh, this is uh, the minor pieces are just much, much stronger here. Okay. And that is because there are zero open files for uh, the white rooks. Yeah, mainly. Plus yeah, three is a lot. I didn't expect that, to be honest. But I thought actually, like it's actually two, it's it's a bit of a guess of be, mine. Yeah, but okay, uh, but probably okay. it's plus two. I mean, we we probably all feel the same. I would always have like um, I would even have like uh, three minor pieces against the queen in the opening. If it would be the first five to six moves, then I would always go for that uh, because yeah. they have too much power, too much influence it, yeah. in the opening. Of course, yes. It depends, of course, a bit on the position. Yeah, but my, the three minor pieces, that can be a lot. Yeah, that can definitely be a lot, yeah. especially if you also have just a safe king and just a solid position. Then probably three minor pieces are often better than uh, than a queen. Yeah. But so, you decided to yeah go for this because it was this position where you can or maybe even should play something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I took on F two because uh, just like I Wolfgang said, by the really, way, thanks for your chat. <laughs> I really like this uh, this material imbalance and uh, the attacking options that Black has here, and um, yeah, by playing many of these uh, uh, these positions in Blitz, I, I got a very good feeling for it. Oh, mm -hmm. Which is something, by the way, I really recommend you when you pick up an opening. Yeah, just play lots of blitz with it, uh, so that you, uh, yeah, uh, that you learn uh, how to handle those type of positions. Wow, yeah. what an interesting advice! I let me say it like this: I completely, I come hundred percent agree. I learned so much by so much by trying out my new openings by just blitz gaming them for. Uh, yeah, yeah. You do it for months, of course, and then you get used to it, and then you go get a feeling for it, and yeah. So great advice, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I think so, especially if you do so online and actually also check regularly your games with uh, with the help of a database or that's an engine. That's the important that's, thing, that's, which uh, I that's missed a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you uh, what happened in the game. King G one, of course, understandable. The king doesn't feel very safe on uh, F two. 
Yeah. And I bring all my pieces into play now. Rook a e8. Nice. And yeah, Black has sort of completed already his development. And uh, Black, uh, White uh, still has the Rook on a1. And the Bishop on c1, they, they don't really yeah. participate. The Knight on d2 also has to do a couple of moves to get, yeah, like this. Yeah. So White goes Knight f1, Knight e5. That's a little trick, by the way. <laughs> is it? Yeah. There's What's no knight takes e5. Knight takes e5 is a blunder. Because then... It's always oh, good to see a no, back rank mate, course. right? <laughs> yeah, it's always good. Yeah, so... True. White actually has to give up a pawn. Yeah, okay. But um, White does manage to exchange the queens. And... But you take that, you say like, okay, here we I, go. I take the pawn. And now um, the thing is that um, I just think that the rook and the two pawns are, are, are pretty good here. And especially since my rooks uh, are so active, um, yeah, I believe that... Uh, that black has uh, excellent chances in this kind of end game. Uh -huh. So there's not a no attack anymore, but uh, but uh, my idea is something like uh, like uh, bishop h3, and uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, bring the rook to the second rank. Excellent. And um, yeah, I would also like to make some exchanges. For example, if I can take away white's bishop pair, then I'm really happy. So if I manage to exchange. Uh, these bishops, I think uh, my chances increase. Mm -hmm. Also, exchange of rooks, I think uh, I'm happy with that as well. Yeah, especially because it's going more and more into the end game. Uh, Svetlana Demchenko will be online too today, and she made uh -huh. a Fritz trainer about material imbalances. And okay. we even had a show about this. Yes, it was super well. interesting, and I never knew. Um, what to take care of. So uh, one of the things which we learned sometimes, uh, a rook um, is even more powerful in an endgame against a bishop yeah. and uh, and a knight, which I didn't know, yeah. for example. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And that's what we will see here as well, actually. Okay. Yeah, so I'll so qu quite quickly that. now go to the critical moments. Okay, let's go. Because, uh, yeah, I, I I had a pretty good feeling for how to play this type of position. So I was kind of happy that my opponent then drew d3 here. Because, uh, um, but actually, it's simply not that easy for white here. How will white ever make any ever progress? Yeah. Because uh, white's king is kind of in a... Well, sort of a cage, let's yeah, say, yeah, with this yeah. bishop on h3. And um, yeah, uh, it's very difficult to expel this rook on f3. So I I completely understand uh, White's decision to exchange the rooks. Um, and since it's now an endgame, it's time to bring the king into play. Wasn't the most accurate move of mine because it allowed uh, White here to do something uh, bad to my pawn structure. Yeah, it's, it's with, with B4. Ah, yeah, fixing, fixing, fixing it. it. Yeah. Yes. But okay, but yeah. To, so you had to change, so you had to play A5 or? Yes, absolutely. And then, and then A4, yeah. okay. Gotcha. That was the move, A5, yeah. yeah. But we were not that good at that time. Yeah, so <laughs> A3, A3 is what my opponent played. And then, then yeah. I, I understood, okay, yeah, I have to go A5. And now after Knight of one, that's a nice little exercise, I think. No, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Knight of one. Knight of one. Here, I was happy to make another exchange. Bishop f5. <gasps> oh, and the isolated pawn. So White had to think. Hmm. Shall I or shall I not? Well, actually, White doesn't have a lot of choice. So White has to take. Okay. G takes f5. And there and we now, have it. Bishop balance. e3, and this is the, the critical moment. Ooh, yes. Okay. Yes. So it is black how to, to continue. move. And it's how black to continue. It's black to move. Mike, make guesses. Uh, Milos uh, was, I think that was uh, for a bit earlier, knight to d4. You can make a new guess. What would you play here as black? That is the critical moment. And it is nice because it's not like those, like, I think it's not that, like, 100%. Mm, moves where you yeah where there is a tactic or something or maybe there is maybe i'm wrong so what to do here 
Very interesting. So how long were you uh, thinking about this position over the board at this particular moment? Was it quite a while? Do you remember? Well, it was 1996 and I, 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 I don't remember. I did not write down the times that I I, I, gotcha. uh, I thought. I, did, I think I found it pretty quickly, but... Uh... So, well, okay, here we go. Wolfgang. Wolfgang says F4. I thought about this too. F4, what, yeah. What is the idea with F4? You take this bishop from the e-file right yes and um, what is the exact activate the rook yes Jürgen Meier Meiering says the same f4 yeah. activate the rook exactly and then you would go exactly. to e2 I guess e2 or or even e1 e1 yes e1 is yeah. better because e2 you then the bishop just goes back to d2 I guess yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. the knight, the knight will probably come to D2. even the knight. Yes, yeah, yeah that's yeah. even better. Yeah, true. Yeah, ah, that's very, a... very good, clever. Yeah. So nice. F four, okay. that was a nice move. Well found, guys. Uh, yeah, it's all about activating the rook. If I can get the rook uh, to B one uh, or A one, uh, well, I'm going to attack the B two point. That's 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 the weakness in uh, White's position. Exactly. Yes. So after Bishop take F four. Actually, rook e2. If bishop d2, uh, I, I like this uh, move. Uh, I think it's pretty bad because after a4, actually white is stuck here. Jeez, it's yes. almost too <laughs> There's no more moves Oh my here. goodness. Yes, okay, but, okay. Uh, so the but, knight is definitely... Yeah. Yeah, this is what I didn't see. Also, uh, Wolfgang, yeah, rook e2, I thought so too, but it is the knight which will go to d2 and then yeah. black mm -hmm. has a bit of a harder time. Yeah, but so like rook e1 is better. Yeah, you yeah. can go to b1 quickly. And well, first a4. you have to play for it, of course. Wow. So this is probably the moment that your opponent realizes that doesn't look good for me at all. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah, I think the position is just uh, lost now for white. Yeah, This is yeah. one of those cases where a rook is stronger than two minor pieces. Super interesting. And yeah, uh, yeah usually yeah, it's going to be either this, this pawn or this pawn that is going to decide the game. Uh -huh. um, so the game continued like this. I pick up this pawn. Yeah. Uh, bring also the king, king e6. I play this to... It's a useful move. It also stops bishop d6 defending true, the pawn on yeah. this. Uh, oh, on yeah, the two. next one you can pick up, true. Yeah, that, that will be... Uh, yes, I play king e6, king d3. Uh, now rook a2. Yeah, this is a... Uh, this is not a this is not a good sign for your position if you have to go this way. Yeah, exactly. C C five, the next one. Yeah, oh, the, in the end. Oh, nice one. Technique, a lot of technique. Still, I would struggle. I would struggle with <laughs> trying to find the direct ways. Oh, although it is very clear for you, maybe. Excellent. Yes. Wow. See, my opponent uh, resigned. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, well that was uh, that was uh, of course, um, yeah, uh, a, a really nice win. Uh, I think uh, I think it was a model game uh, uh, for how to play this this type of positions in which you are uh, uh, have the rook against uh, two minor pieces. Yes, and uh, yeah, I've always had very good results in uh, this type of. Uh, yeah, in this type of positions, uh, simply because I uh, I really appreciate the rook and the pawn uh, more. Uh, I, I really like this line. Yeah, funny, so interesting and so good to know because is this? Uh, I mean, this is going into some mainline territory after all. So this is something which people have on the board every now and then a similar, quite similar position, and mm -hmm. then they might not decide to go for the rook. Um, minor piece exchange at one point. So, yeah, you give yeah. them some hope like this. Just a quick uh, Wolfgang, why not King F2 after Rook E1 in the crucial position? Let's get back to this uh, one, one um, second again. Uh, Elisabeth will come in uh, in a short moment, but she is actually ending a seminar this m minute, so we have a little couple of minutes extra time. So, um, which moment? It, it when, when there's the crucial moment with F4. Ah, yeah. Okay. 
So here, um, the yeah, what about, uh, uh, wait, rook, nick, rook e1, king f2. But then yeah, the rook just goes the to b1 again, right? Similar, yeah, just yeah. rook b1. If white goes b4, I'm going to fix this pawn oh, on a3. Okay, so this is a good question, yes. This is a weak, weak pawn. Next. I get it, yeah. So I eat it. That cannot be defended very yeah. well or, or at all, I think. Yeah. And that is even, yeah, that's even more straightforward to get the A pawn to become a queen. Probably, I would say. Probably, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you can um, unshare the screen. That was uh, very interesting and informative. I didn't uh, expe <laughs> expect it to be um, such a such a nice uh, lesson here. This was uh, intense and good. Now you're actively playing a lot still, right? You're in the, the Bundesliga and all of that. How I play some leagues. Uh, well, the German Bundesliga, it's very tough. I had a tough last <laughs> weekend. Uh, it's considered one of the strongest yeah, leagues in the course. world. Of course. Right? So yeah. it can happen. It can happen. The Dutch League, uh, well, I'm fighting a relegation with my team, but uh, personally, I have a very good season. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, uh, yeah, I've, I, I'm definitely active. I, I I, I have some plans for, for this summer to play some tournaments and yeah. uh, uh, but most of it uh, most of what I'm doing is coaching still. Excellent. Yeah, and you can feel it uh, especially when you watch the Fritz trainer. So much insight, so much knowledge and that's always uh, uh, very, very nice to to listen to it because uh, it, it feels like it's um, effortless. Although I know that you're putting effort into this, but it feels as if all those moves are just easily... Well, uh, you are just a very talented player. I think some players are just very talented and then it feels very effortless for you. You know the right answers very often. That's how I felt I... when I was watching your I doubt if I'm that uh, talented. <laughs> what else no, can uh, you say now? <laughs> uh, of course, of course. It took a lot of hard work for me to become a GM, yes. Uh, Indeed, yes. I, I'm not like one of those Indian uh, kids Super that kids. got GM at uh, age, age uh, 9 or 10. Uh, it took me like 26 years or 27 years actually to become a GM. and uh, So there's a lot of hard work and... Uh, yeah, that helps also when you uh, to explain it to others. I think Definitely, yeah. if you are really talented uh, and it's effortless, that actually probably <laughs> you have a tough time explaining. Uh, that is so interesting. Very good point. Yeah, I, I like the, love your honesty for this. Um, sooner or later, by the way, you will see um, an interview between uh, Zipke and me. Hey, Ellie! Hi, sorry, I still have the wrong don't, don't background. Worry. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I it's didn't also, change it yet. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, that doesn't matter. So it's a, it's a protest training after all, what we're doing here anyway. <laughs> but I just wanted to quickly um, um, before before I send you home Zipke we have an interview it's meet the Fritz yeah. trainer it was super enjoyable because we found out a couple of things uh, in your private light, uh, light uh -huh. too uh, which is, is I, I still I still love some facts uh, you will see it sooner or later because uh, as I mentioned before there's another Fritz trainer coming out sooner or later so yeah we will we're all looking forward to this thank you so much Zipke it was yeah, very enjoyable yeah. And um, yeah, have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Both of you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. <laughs> Ellie, you Hi. are here. You made yes. it. And with all the pressure, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of people who have some uh, tight schedule. Let's exchange this Fitz trainer. <laughs> I will put this one here and get out your... Badur, no, it's not the Badur Jobava London. That would be a bit too long, but it is the Jobava London system. We were talking about it in the German, in our German show. Ellie and I have a German show, a show going on. It's Ellie's Schatztruhe, like Ellie's treasure chest. And um, we are at episode 56, meanwhile, or, or more. I don't know. It's like, it's crazy lot of fun. And super interesting themes and everything. And um, yeah, we were also talking about your Fritz trainer, the Jobava London system. It's something which is a little different from the London system. Can you emphasize a bit about it? 
Well, there is one main difference, actually. In the Chubaba London system, the knight gets early on C3, mm -hmm. which has two purposes. First of all, it's easier than to castle longside. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the knight on C3 has some sneaky, sneaky ideas connected with knight B5. True, yes. The drawback, however, on this move, I mean, there's also a drawback compared to the normal London system is that since the knight is on c3 the center like with the pawn on d4 is not as protected compared to the usual london system with c2 c3 okay and also sometimes like when your opponent plays with a6 the knight at some moment should be maneuvered again because the knight on c3 then is not doing much but the fact is making the life for white's king easier in terms of long castle nice i love long castling I'm a long castle guy. Can you say that something like this? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, would you say that there are some people who prefer to castle long or short? Or is it just like, well, of course, I don't care. It just depends on the position. Yes, it should be actually a choice which is taken to the objective of the position. I know that you don't care much about the objectives. <laughs> we had these discussions Some before. Discussions every now and then about that. Yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I like to uh, often take um, the sword wielding person and just attack everything which comes in in my way and ellie is always trying to cool me down giving me some calculation training and other things especially the variation training wow what lessons we had i can tell you so yeah um thanks everybody for for joining by the way if you want to say hi to ellie and if you want to buy her fritz trainer do so now because now is better than ever i will post the link of uh, ellie's fritz trainers because it doesn't matter which Fritz trainer you will buy right now from Ellie or in the next half hour because until yeah six o'clock you have time to buy a Fritz trainer by Ellie and you enable yourself for a raffle of 25 euro because it's the 25% show after all, which you will get next week on top. So there's uh, just 66 people watching at the moment. So your chances are quite high, actually. And uh, yeah, Robert Rees, there was also some people who bought his calculation trainer. And uh, if you enjoy, oh, let's just see, like, let's there, that's a bit better. If you enjoy Ellie's work, and if you like Ellie uh, personally anyway, now is the chance to appreciate that. Um, Ellie, do you have anything which you can show us from your Fritz trainer, maybe? Yes, I will show you like a third variation, which I think is one of the most um, interesting ones. Let's go for it. Yes, but before that, maybe I will give a small introduction of like what is actually like uh, on this DVD in terms of all the variations, right? Before I get into the variation um, concerned. Oh. How about that? Uh, I'd love that. Go for it. Uh, yeah, at, I will let's, share let's, this trick screen, right? Share it, but uh, anti burnout tours. Hi, I just bought the Torah and Jobaba a few hours ago before reading about the advertisement for this event. Will that also count for the raffle? This would be great. Um, since you are writing this, since you didn't know about this uh, raffle, if there is a lack um i will consider you to it's my decision i'm making the decisions here so thanks for writing that uh, you're in this raffle too probably okay sorry now it's your turn Eddie. okay let's take a look so before i get into the line i wanted to show you today i mean like some of the chapters more carefully one of my favorite chapters okay i want to give you a small introduction what it's about all right. And of course, like in these DVDs, like I don't pay much attention to the move orders because my second move is almost always C a knight C3. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, D4, D5, for example, and now knight C3 and then bishop F4. But you can also choose the move orders. It yeah, depends sure. because some move orders are good against a certain lineup and other move orders. For example, if your opponent plays here C6, then bishop f4 is a bit rubbish because of queen b6 and then you should be happy to play the karakan if your opponent doesn't play the karakan it's a good choice right gotcha. it's the same it's the same if you play knight c3 here and your opponent plays e6 also now bishop f4 is not that great because um even so i'm not knowing the reason exactly why i just know that i spared the tempo of knight f6 
Mm -hmm. And here probably there is some things connected with uh, Bishop B4 at some point, if I'm not mistaken. I just know that in this move order also you should play E4 and heavily play the French. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. I like to play e4 in this position anyway, nonetheless. And it is uh, also interesting uh, yeah, to, to keep this in mind about the move order depending on what you might encounter. But this is part of your preparation for your opponent. If you know yes. they're a French player, Karo Khan, you know what you're into. And here, if you play bishop f4, I mean, in this move order, I think the difference is like here that I can play c5 immediately. Now, knight c3, I think, doesn't make much sense. I mean, you have to double check what I'm saying, but I think this is the thing why, um, if you want to play the Chibaba London, then knight c3 is against the c5 stuff, because after e3, you also have some other kind of tricks which make knight c3 in the next yeah. move less appealing. But okay, let's skip the move order. I mean, um, if you play both London systems, then you are safe because you can choose whatever, right? That's why I met the DVDs in uh, in both directions with C3 and with Knight C3. So let's um, give uh, let me give you like a small um, uh, summary of what is is, is this um, DVD about. Just a quick, quick question from from a viewer, Gatsa Bluesman says, Hi, Elizabeth, people tell me the London system can be very dull. Is this your experience? Not like, that's not a critic question. I think it's just, a, it's a valid question. Well, my honest opinion to that is London, no matter if Chibaba London or normal London, is perfect for rapid templates. Because the setup is always very easy. Mm -hmm. And if you know the plans, you save a lot of time. And especially in the quick time controls, it's very good to have a system which is safe. Yeah. And I mean, like the structure already with E3, D4 and F4 is usually very safe structure. And your king safety is not under danger. And it's very important to have a safe king in quick time controls because it's hard to defend when you have less time from the logical point of view. Interesting. And uh, for the classical time controls, if you know that your opponent cannot prepare and is not expecting London, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But if, like in my case, I, I, I don't play London in the classical games anymore because everybody knows that I played and it's my pet line. And second of all, like there are too many variations which are equalizing. Interesting. Great uh, answer. Okay. Thanks for the great question, Gaza Bluesman. Okay, let's keep on. So, so after bishop f4 here, if I'm not mistaken, white has a lot of, uh, black has a lot of moves. There is a line with g6, which we will check today a little bit more carefully. Then instead of g6, there's of course e6. Mm -hmm. Then there is c6, there's a6, and there's c5. <laughs> oh, the only, the only pawn move which moves a little bit further. Yeah, true. So the thing is like, apart from g6 and a6, and c6, you have always a knight b5 ideas, which means, sorry to say that, also bishop f5 is possible here, but it's, I think, um, similar to some kind of uh, move orders. Okay. So let's make it not difficult. If e6, then immediately you should play with knight b5, because otherwise you expect bishop b4. This is also the reason why the move order without knight f6, which I showed at the beginning, is um, like the difference, because I don't have knight um, b5 in time and the mm -hmm. knight is on g8. So knight b5, you attack. Here, actually, like bishop d6 is rubbish because you simply take the bishop and you are happy. Here, black has the choice between bishop b4 check in order to um, defend the bishop on a5. The other option is knight a6. And both of these options are given on the DVD. Okay. So far, so good. The good thing about knight b5 is I have c3 available again, and then in the most cases, I go back to a3. Okay. Okay. In case of a6, then of course you don't have knight b5. Same news. <laughs> Very good follow up. Yeah. So this is, is a6 like, does it happen quite often? I mean, it is obviously to to prevent this move, right? Is this a thing which is like uh, really in, in the theory? Um, it is a move which is actually one of the main moves. My goodness, I didn't know. Sorry, okay, I, am, I just really didn't have uh, that uh, knowledge about this. Interesting, okay. 
So um, here after a6, you play e3, and the important thing is that in case of c5, at any moment you take. All right. You need to take it, otherwise, uh, well, it's the best thing to take because you have some ideas connected with knight a4. And if you take, then you get the bishop pair. Jeez. Oh. And c3. Oh. Okay. Yes. I just didn't see it for a moment that black actually. I mean, this is the idea just to keep in mind. Then after bishop f4, um, well, a6, as I said, c6 is possible. If the structure with c6, you always try to play f3 and e4 or f3 and g4, depending if the bishop goes to f5. For example, like f3, bishop f5, and then the idea is connected with g4, h4 ideas. And mainly, like here, you castle alongside. Wow, it's so it, it all looks so untypical from the normal d, d4 uh, variations. It's really interesting. Yes. So what is left um, is, of course, after bishop f4, g6. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's probably also, I mean, I've seen this quite often. And this we will like discuss. And instead of um, after bishop f4, g6, I think I left, ah, yes, I have one more thing. Bishop f4, c5, e3 has to be played because knight b5 is tricky, but it doesn't work because of queen a5. And then there is some tricky lines, but it's bad for, for white, I can tell you. But you can try it in a blitz game. <laughs> oh, God, I probably wouldn't. That looks terrible. <laughs> oh, but if you say so, yeah, I see. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Some some discovered things and everything. All right. Yes. So last but not least, um, yes, leaves only g6. All right. And after g6... Then actually, like in my last um, DVD on the normal Chubaba, I suggested the line with E3, mm -hmm. for example, Bishop G7 um, and H4, mm -hmm. which is not bad and which in my opinion is quite good. And apart from that, here actually after E3, um, in my opinion, instead of Bishop G7, C6 is more precise not to even play Bishop G7 in order to have B5 immediately. But this is not part of the Chubaba London. Okay. And so it means that after e3, um, yes, c6. So in this DVD on Shubaba, I play, oh, I suggest to move, um, no, I, sorry, I suggest to move first queen d2. Sorry for that. <laughs> Don't worry, because yeah, this is a pattern I love to, to uh, engage with, which is getting, I mean, there is the idea of getting the bishop to h6, right? Yes. Yeah. So queen d2 has two purposes, bishop h6 and long castle. Mm-hmm. Perfect. That's I love this variation. Okay, <laughs> mm. that I hope this doesn't disencourage you, <laughs> because I like this variation. That, um, but it is such a valid plan, and I uh, had like some success stories with this. Yeah. So um, here after Queen D two, many options. There is C six, which I like. There is Bishop G seven, mm -hmm. and um, yes, these are the options. I think C five immediately. It must be in a different chapter. Here, I'm not sure this is working, but I have to look in the next file of mine, so I can't tell you now by heart. No worries. Here in this one, I discussed C six. Uh, C six is, in my opinion. An option, but maybe not the best one for black because after f3, bishop g7 and e4, you get the center. Wow. And to get to the center is always good. Uh, that's so. This was why you were pointing and out f3. Yes. And then after e5, the knight on h5 doesn't have many squares. There is some trick with g4. And if the knight goes, then you have this typical h4, h5, uh -huh. and you mate him. So just to give you, like, here a small introduction on bishop e6. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is also this awkward looking move, which is not that yes. awkward because, wow, well, you don't need those pawns at the moment. So, yeah. Here, after like um, bishop e6, um, I suggest a3 to wait. Because, oh. like, black has to decide whether to castle or not, right? Yeah. So, it's just too good to wait to see what he's doing. Oh, this is. You're so close. If, if knight bd7. Then I can play e5 and you don't have this move. Mm. If b5, then okay, you weaken yourself and it's clear you will have a long castle. 
So it's hard to make another waiting move for black. Mm -hmm. In this line, castle I suggest for black knight g2. And here, um, well, I discussed d takes c4, c5, and knight bd7. I don't want to get too deep into detail because I want to show all the other lines. Sure. All I can say is that, um, well, for example, if c5, then e5, if knight h5, then bishop e3, and um, the problem is this knight. Mm -hmm. For example, like knight c6, and then g4. Oh, yeah, that is a problem. <laughs> if something like knight bd7, then e5, knight e8, because knight h5 is and then this h4 plan, which I mentioned. Lovely, yes. So the only thing is maybe like they should open up the position to have some, because there's an actually a rule if the center is static, wing attacks are easy to do. Hmm. If the center is not static, but dynamic and opened up, then wing attacks are more dangerous. Okay. Because you might get to hit back in the center. This is just a kind of basic rule. It's good to keep in mind. We have so to make here, another Ellie's chest, uh, treasure chest about that. Yes, <laughs> but here, for example, like in this position, it's no more sense to play h4, h5. You play in the center. Uh huh. For this reason, because we are a little bit open in the center. Okay. If knight bd7, okay. I mean, like I don't know what to say. It's uh, probably long castle because I think this is over here in my line. I'm not even sure I give it because um, the files here I do, they are not updated, to be honest, but they are updated on the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> um, if C5, then simply D5 and Knight G3. I mean, okay, you play just not on chess, but here it's already plus minus. This is so, it is so interesting because it's um, going into the very different terrain, uh, which is normally those, I mean, if you... Am I right if I say like D4 is normally a bit going into the closed position territory? D4, yes. But I mean, like the difference between D4 and E4 is that E4 is much more concrete. So if you are someone who doesn't love to learn a lot of theory and want to be more the natural player like me, the lazy natural player like me, you should rather play like D4 openings. Because most, I mean, like in, in the D4 openings, you're more flexible to avoid concrete play. I cannot believe it. The Svetlana tells me the exact same, like you are. Yeah, but I mean, like, I'm, I'm by my style, I should play E4. And actually, in the most important games, I play E4. But then, actually, I'm also learning like a dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if I'm lazy, you know, and I'm lazy most of the times, I play D4. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Now, next variation. Here I discuss um, b5 immediately. Yeah, that is interesting. Of course, we play a3. Uh huh, okay. Now, um, if, if a5, there's no threat. A8. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Sorry. So yeah. here, the best move by black is knight h5. Oh. Because, okay, bishop g7, actually, I'd simply play um, the old games as bishop h6. I suggest on my DVD e4, which apparently is a novelty, at least in the normal games. Uh -huh. But also bishop h6 is fine because, okay, the bishop g7 doesn't make sense if bishop h6 is coming loose a tempo in a way. And if you play b5, you should already, like, try to attack on that side. Okay. Yes. So okay. that's why um, the moves I mainly give is knight bd7 and knight h5. Mm -hmm. Knight h5, this is I show because this is the main line, then bishop h6 nonetheless. If you don't take, I take and you can't castle, so that's why they take, take uh -huh. and try something like with queen a5, b4 ideas. Uh -huh. And here the positions become funny. Wow, indeed, I like it. Very, very... Uh... If you want to, 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 to do the modest approach, you go back and you say like you don't want stress. If you want to do the Arne Keller, you take G4 into the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. So, and after G4, um, here, B4 is the only move to take uh, caution to. Oh my gosh. Knight A2. Oh my gosh. Okay, you don't have a choice, right? And you need the move before. You need to move the before, that's by Knight A2. Okay. And here you simply take the piece and you say like, oh, it's good. Queen takes d4, c3, queen h4, checking d1, and you have some fun. But it's better for white. It's a Holy piece. Holy moly. Yes. What the heck this is, is just... 
Gatsa Bluesman correctly said, this doesn't look dull at all. You're breathing life into it, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, this is your most exciting line from the line with immediate P5. Yeah. I like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, last but not least, the most, um, well, important line in terms of the best line for Black. Okay. Otherwise, the, the, the line would be too great, right? <laughs> <laughs> so after bishop g7, f3, what do you think is the move to be played here in order to avoid this e4 stuff? Oh, uh, let's ask the viewers, what do you think is the best way to avoid the e4 move by white again, which Ellie has shown us a couple of times already? What would you play? as black. Can you quickly flip the board one time? Ellie? Ah, flip the sorry. board, sorry, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how to avoid e4? Can you even mm. avoid Not e4? avoid it, to make it totally unattractive. I see, okay. Well, well, that is a... Uh... Come on, uh... Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's e even the move you would play by your style. B5? No, not B5. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not B5, but you're close, very close. <laughs> okay. No, it cannot be. What? No, it cannot be. No, no, I can, I, I don't think this is the... Like, I, which move? Well, G5. Not G5, yeah. not B5. But, I mean, you should attack the center before the center is in white's control. This is like... Yes. So C5? Yes, C5. Because now after c5, I mean, e4 is, e4 is just rubbish. I mean, you lose the control in the center. Knight c6 is coming. Maybe then you have this opposition. This is rubbish. Not so good. No, OK. And oh. here, of course, you can blunder with white if you think that you are like winning after knight b5. Because, OK, if knight a6, then you are happy. Because this constellation in the London, no matter if it's the Chubada London or the normal London, is always good for white because the knight will on a6 never be anywhere. And then I can play with e3, 3, 3, 3, and I have long term advantage. And this might oh. protect and, with a4. And in the worst case, back to a3. Okay. But here after knight b5, simply castle. And after knight c7, like black doesn't care. He takes on d4. I take the exchange. He plays knight c6, e5, and he kills me at the center, and he has huge uh, compensation. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's why after c5, um, e3 is possible, but I think it's land, so d takes c5, at least to be consequent, taking the pawn. Thank you, Gatza, Wolfgang, Milos. Yes, I was wrong. c5 is correct. You were all right. Okay, good. <laughs> so d takes c5, knight c6, threatening e5, and now, of course, and d4, so we should keep control uh -huh. of d4 as so we play e3. Here e5 is premature because after bishop g5, you get too much pressure on d5. That's why it's not um, suggested in the database, but it's on the DPT explanation, of okay. course. So um, castle, long castle, and also here e5 is bishop g5. And that's why here two moves, e5 still and queen a5. Uh -huh. um, queen a5, then simply king b1. It's a natural move as long castle always involved. Queen takes c5, knight a4. Knight takes c5 is a blunder because of the back rank. <sighs> So knight is, this, is this really not working? I'm sorry. Okay, it because after bishop h6, no, which you, no, bishop no, 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 h6? No. So you take or uh, you take on d d8? Yeah. And the 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 uh, knight takes back. The rook takes on d8. And, and then rook d8 and and ah, uh, you mean like take take and yes, bishop and f8? Bishop H, yeah. And now black to move. Oh, okay, okay. I see it. I saw it. Okay, I am sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe I should have shown it, but no, let me no, know. No, it's just, like Rook is winning for Black. Yeah. Okay. So, do you want to quick quick guess uh, at home? What is the next move? Uh, we, oh, no, we have not uh, much time left. So, show the move, please. Bishop f5, and, mating on c2, yeah, and it's game very, over. Very, very nice, actually. Yeah, that's uh, cute. So that's why Queen Knight a4 should be played. Queen a5 only move because, and then you exchange and you mm -hmm. play this ending, and this ending is well, it's equal. I said like, I mean, e5 is always bad because of Bishop g5, so Rook yeah. d8, Knight d4, 
Now e5 doesn't work, so a6 to avoid knight b5 and g4 in this position is unclear. Wow. Um, so apart from queen a5, there is um, also the move e5 here and after bishop g5, now d4. Uh -huh. But also this position after knight e4, queen e8 is, I mean, no, here they take on e4 because queen e8 doesn't work, so they take, take and now queen e8. <laughs> and here bishop h6 and last what i want to show, show you is like that there's a huge difference between bishop g4 and queen takes e4 one move is actually getting advantage for white and uh -huh. the other move is much stronger even so i forgot the reason um <laughs> queen takes yeah it's long time ago yeah, bishop takes g7 lot right now so don't bishop worry b5. No, I think uh, bishop g4 is, is, is stronger because after bishop g4, knight f3, taking on e4, take, take, bishop b5. Uh, maybe not. No, <laughs> you know, this is stronger because now you can take on f3 and you get into an ending which is strong. But the funny thing is like that here, after bishop h6, huge chance for black to go wrong and to go queen takes e4 and then you get some advantage actually because the difference is now that after bishop g4 you can take on c6 and on d4 because the knight is not on f3 mm. but this i mean in detail is explained on the dvd i don't want to make it like too complicated i just tell you that such kind of subtleties are there because in the, the most i mean not to sound arrogant but um you can find this kind of analysis up to the moment of um here e5 like queen e8 this is given in like some of uh, of the um, work online yeah but nobody started to check the position after queen e8 and that's why here it's very important for example for black to know that bishop g4 is better than queen takes b4 but it's all explained on the dvd excellent thank you ellie this was this was hardcore and super entertaining and super interesting Nicholas uh, Pert is already in the room because he will start his little section right now. Ellie, thank you so much for, All for right. joining in. Have a lovely evening. Yes, bye-bye, and... everybody. Thanks, thanks, Ellie. And welcome bye. to the show, Nick. It is nice Hi. to see you. Yeah, How you too. You How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. And yourself? I'm doing great. I'm having a blast. I'm learning a lot. I don't even know where <laughs> I have all this energy uh, uh, for sure. I'm just about well, it's just a couple of hours in. So, so maybe maybe, just... maybe your own elo goes up a bit from these talks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would I would really hope so. Yes, that that would be uh, the the best way uh, of an outcome. So what I want to show you at home here is a complete black repertoire versus the English first e5 in comparison to the English. So c4, e5 by Nick Pert. And if you purchase anything what Nick has made in the Fritz Trainer realm, and there is a lot, I will post the link right away in the chat so you can take a look at it for yourself. Just one second. Here we go. So take a look what uh, Nick has made. He has made so many Fritz trainers. If you buy any Fritz trainer or more than one, you are part of the raffle uh, for the next half hour to win a voucher of 25 euro next week. It's all yours. You can purchase whatever you want to at the chess base shop. And you're doing something good for Nick if you enjoy his work. Um, of course, there's the collectors who get anything what you are making. And I hope um, there are some people who do not know what you're doing yet and might get interested because now is the best chance to do so. Nick, um, first of all, how many Fritz trainers? So I, I didn't check. The email, to be <laughs> you, honest, you're putting but... me on the spot now. I don't, yes, even, I I don't even know. Quite, quite, quite a few, I think. Well, if I think it's a very good sign if you do not know the exact number, <laughs> because <laughs> then it must be quite a lot. Now, um, you have made uh, also a couple of Fritz trainers which are a bit different from the others, which is um, for perfectly uh, fitting for a certain ELO range, like 1600 to 1800 or 1800 to 2000, what the mistakes sure. are made. I love those. Can you please emphasize a little bit on, on those two? Because I personally enjoyed them a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, they've actually been um, very popular um, DVDs. That's why I ended up, I think I produced three of them so far, and yeah. I might try and do some more. And they're just looking, I go through um, lots of games for people in the um, desired rating range and try to find like common themes, uh, areas where they might be making mistakes and then make them into chapters. So explaining, you know, this, this is happening and explain the theme. And at the end of each uh, chapter, they then get some interactive examples so they can have a go themselves. Mm -hmm. And I find this is quite nice because um, obviously opening theory is, is really great if it's the opening that you want to learn. But uh, chess isn't all about openings. So it's it's nice to to do something else as well. Indeed, yeah. And I, I liked it. And because even if I, um, I have a ELO of over 1900 at the moment, sometimes uh, you have to really get back to the roots and check out what have you missed in all your chess knowledge. For example, endgames is one of my worst parts in, in the world. So I studied a lot of endgames in the last year, especially. I got a bit better. And I even won an endgame, luckily, my God, the first time in a long while, which I would probably have lost. So this is a good way to get back on track, checking what mistakes are you doing in your range. So I can highly recommend them, not only because I enjoyed them so much. It's a, just a really good thing. But let's talk a little bit. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, I was just saying, I mean, obviously, yeah, you can you can look at the, say, 1800 to 2000, if that's your rating range. And then Did. if your rating goes down, you can go to 1600 to 1800. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully go yeah. back again. <laughs> you have to do one for me from 1000 to 1200 <laughs> at one point, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Sure. So let's see about good. this. Let's, ho let's hope this is not the case. But talking about the, the English opening. So you have made uh, or you claim to have uh, quite a good repertoire against the English. What made you uh, make this particular Fritz trainer here? Sure. Uh, well, I think I'd already covered quite a few different openings. And um, actually, true. yeah, the, the English is um, something which is often neglected by by players. So as becoming more and more popular, it's actually a very serious weapon for white yeah. to use. And people don't always think about what to play, play against the English. They often try to somehow use their own D4 repertoire and try to, you know, sort of mix and mash it. But then the problem is that your opponent might be a bit tricky and try and move order you a little bit. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nice just to have a complete repertoire, I think. And that's what I've provided in case um, anybody, you know, is interested in, in learning a yeah. sort of stand, standalone repertoire against the English. Once again, a weak spot of mine, because um, in the very beginning of my chess life, uh, every time I had the English on the board, I lost. I think I lost five games. So I was scared of playing against the English. And um, yeah, then if you are scared or if you have those thoughts like, oh, God, I just don't like the English. I got one tiny tip in my life in particular, which saved myself from losing more games, which was trying to take... Uh, the knight on c6 as soon as possible. That was very helpful for me. I mean, it's very, very uh, straightforward idea, but um, yeah. Um, do you have anything which you can share with us maybe about uh, your Fritz trainers? Or yeah, I, will, I, I mean, actually, I was I actually played a game actually within the last week, I think only about six days ago, and I got this really, really interesting end game. And um, if you like, I could... I mean, I could show it to you rather than, um, you know, a lot of opening theory and it might Absolutely. be a bit more interesting if that's uh, if that's OK with you. Absolutely. So, no, this must. OK, I'm looking forward to this. I mean, <laughs> come on. It, it, it was surprising, actually, because uh, can I share my screen? Is that OK? Yes, please. Um, so uh, um, I was playing against um, a feeding master in the local area. Uh, Paul Cooksey, who is, um, you know, obviously a very respectable player. I played him quite a few times. Um, yeah, well, one thing I noticed about chess base, maybe I should complain, is when I put the names in, I put his name in and my name in, his one came up with like a little picture. <laughs> and you and don't I, I, picture. I, I, I don't get one. I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do to get a picture I, these I, days? Chess base, if you're watching this, <laughs> <laughs> I will write a little note and give you a sure. picture immediately. I think there there was, uh, yeah, pictures is always, of course, oh, it's, it's always a bit of a difficult thing after all. Uh, I think it's, I, probably, it's probably the way it's probably the way I typed it in. Um, yeah, maybe, it, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I got, I got this. Um, I got this ending, and, and maybe I, I can put some of your chess skills to the test as well. Oh gosh! Uh, <laughs> no, I, I won't put you on the spot too much. Um, so we, we reached this um, this bishop and pawn ending. I, I was playing as black, and it's it's fairly equalish position, but I felt like I had um, a sort of very small advantage because my king is slightly more central than his. And I, I won't sort of um, bore you too much of the details. I'll just go on to the first main um, question and see if you come up with the with the right answer. So. Um, my opponent played g4, and uh, one of the ideas now, if I play 
uh, king to e4 is that um, he he wants to respond with king to c3 and uh -huh. it's slightly awkward just try and try and take my c pawn. Yeah. Um, so so I played bishop b6, which gives him some something to worry about because now if, if he plays king c3, he has to always be aware of bishop a5 check. So giving him a little uh, something to think about. So he played bishop bishop b4. King e4, and now he actually played, I think, which was supposed to be the best move, or certainly quite a good move here, um, which is the move pawn f5. If he plays bishop d6, trying to hang on to the pawn, actually, uh -huh. um, after bishop e3, king king c3, bishop takes pawn. If he trades bishops here, um, black, can... black, yeah, black's going to get there first. You need should to count be. a little bit, but <laughs> black should should get there first. Um, uh -huh. uh, there's so a lot of counting. Come on, sorry. That is calculation after all. So yeah. So yeah. And by the way, the accelerated in chat. Yes, you are absolutely right. I meant the knight on c three, not on c six. Pardon me. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. I think yeah, bishop b four and knight bishop takes c three. <laughs> that was your plan against yeah, the English. Sorry, pardon. Um, but but um, anyway. So so he played f five, which I think was a good move, and mm -hmm. I played pawn takes pawn takes. And so this was the first um, big question because in in my mind, there's two candidate moves here yeah. um one of them is simply to capture the pawn um pawn. against yours gone. is gone no? oh. yeah mine's gone as well i i can't really do too much about that and the other key move here is to play the move bishop d4 exactly and yeah, exactly now the idea of this move bishop d4 is that um, if he doesn't do anything in particular then i'll, I'll just simply capture his f5 pawn and probably i'm winning in that position so there's only one kind of critical move that he can try here i don't know if you can I, it, no, I cannot see. I, uh, I covered our uh, the notation with uh, our video. I believe I know the move, although I'm a bad endgame player. Do you, for you at home, um, what do you think is uh, one of the only good moves White can play here? Well, actually, now that I look at it, I'm seeing two moves, so I have to calculate after all. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I think there's only one move that really... You know, just otherwise, black just simply captures the pawn, and uh, you know, it's, it's got a sort of free hand to attack. Okay. There's only really one move that I was worried okay, about. Maybe then, maybe I'm wrong. Yes, and I, okay. I think I made it up. So, is it the uh, bishop to c3? Exactly, bishop to yeah, c3. Okay. Because yeah. now, yeah. if I avoid the trade, uh, then he can simply push his f pawn. So I'm I, has right too. Yeah, exactly right. Very good. So I got to I got to exchange, and then we get this position. King takes pawn. King takes pawn. So this is this is where your county <laughs> skills come in. So I'd worked out that this position would have appeared more or less by force if I play bishop d4. And so the question is, is is this winning? It's actually um, a symmetrical position, believe it or not, um, with the you know well, king and pawns on both right. sides of the boards. And it's um, black to move. Black to move. So is it is it a win or is it a draw? Now this is this is really um, putting you to the test. There's only really one variation to calculate, but it's quite a, quite yeah. a long variation. I'll see wow. if you can, f can figure okay. it out. <laughs> okay, I think I I have an idea, and it is uh, yeah, it is a bit um, it's going a bit against the the normal idea of what you might think about it. I have a plan in head, so make a guess. Is this uh, how how to is this a one for black? Is it one for white, or is it a draw? What do you think? And what to play next here? So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it can only be one for white if black really messes up because yes. it is symmetrical and <laughs> it's black's move. But uh, so it's really, I guess, I, I mean, when I went into the, when I had the option of going into this, is it winning or is it drawing? Because if how, it's draw, so drawing, so six I'd... days ago, how long did you think on the board? Did you have a little time left or? So yeah, that was when we weren't. We didn't have loads of time actually. We probably had about. Uh, I would say we were down to maybe about fifteen minutes oh. by the time we got to this stage. And uh, so it was just an evening match. So it was quite. We weren't like, you know, flags hanging or anything, but mm -hmm. we couldn't really think for too long. And, um, well, I, I got to this position and I worked out this slide. And then because, um, well, okay, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> but <laughs> I, 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 can sh I can show you the line if you like. And... So here we have the couple of suggestions. The accelerated says black wins because his queen controls a8. That's a good, yeah, th that's uh, really good calculation. Really good and, calculation. And Milo says uh, h5 is uh, what you have to play here. Yeah. So actually, I mean, the the kind of is that move order you play is going to end up more or less. You might as well probably just uh, take the pawn straight away. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, so let's say, let's say White goes for um, goes for the for the a pawn, and we get uh, we get this this position. And um, so yeah. Uh, you're right that the black queen will cover 
uh, we'll cover why it's queening square. So if we play down the line, this is the line which I calculated, we get to this position. However, white has got a very clever move here, which which I think saves the day. <gasps> and I don't know if you can see, um, well, it's got to be a king move, obviously, but where, where can yeah. he put his king? So it's probably n not going to be king to b7. So it this is this is really testing your end game knowledge. Oh One goodness. of the moves draws, the others the others. Oh, all lose. that is so that is so interesting because that I did I thought that is it already. Okay, there is a bit more to that. <laughs> one move, one move draws. All the other moves lose. And this this was kind of the whole line which I was trying to calculate because it's one. It's only really one line, but it's quite. So you have it's, it's four forcing. king moves, guys. Which one is the <laughs> only one to to be the correct one to turn out so now i'm curious who can guess that let's let's look yeah. at so king Hapa hansen thanks for joining in the chat says king b7 it is actually okay do we have any other suggestions because king b7 is, is the least obvious in a way isn't it it does look it's super unobvious yes indeed it's yeah that is funny Okay, a uh, king b6 by Milos. Thanks for joining in. That, okay, yeah. I mean, let, let's have a quick Go look at king it, b6. Nick, yes. So king b6 is unfortunately not, not the right move. Um, and as um, I think one of your viewers pointed out, black will, will queen first, control yeah, white's and queening this. square. And, um, you know, white can't be doing it. If, if white plays here, for example, the black queen can come all the way down and uh, sit in front of the pawn. And the king comes and says hi. Exactly. Wait for the king to come <laughs> as, as backup and pick off the pick off the white board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, white can play the move, which yes, it's, it's just not the move that you'd expect, which is the move king b seven. Actually, al allowing allowing black to queen with check. Well done, Harper Hansen. Very good, very good. If you if you went out, and then when black queens with check, oh my king god, b eight. Just go to b eight, and that is a draw. Oh, and it's que exactly queen and pawn. Now I don't know if you know your queen versus pawn end games, but if it's a bishop's pawn or a rook's pawn, it's a draw. And if it's a knight's pawn or a central pawn, it's winning for the queen. And um, the reason is that uh, the winning the winning technique is to force the white king in front of the pawn. Yes. And then and then on that move, and that move on the move when you and the move when you force them in front of the pawn, you bring your king closer. And the problem with the rook's pawn, if I just quickly just run through it, so white yes. always white always threatens the queen every move. White threatens the queen in order to prevent the black king from moving moving closer to the pawn. If that makes sense. So white's always threatening to queen. Black always has to watch. Black never has a chance to move his king in yeah, yeah. because white's always threatening to queen. And then you get the key position here, and white plays check. And now, um, what does what does white play here? Well, so you uh, probably won one one sensible move. Why? Oh God, I'm so sorry, Nick, that I'm such a failure with my. <laughs> it's uh, it's so disappointing. I'm disappointing myself a little bit. So. Um, He's only got king c8 or king a8. So yeah, then... exactly. So I mean, I I remember that I once got checkmated after I went to king a8, and I still thought it was a draw. I remember this. Yeah, unfortunately, there is no. I mean, if black could, if white had another pawn, black could play queen c7 and then queen c8 checkmate. But he he doesn't have another pawn, and so the problem with this position for from black's point of view is that it's a stalemate situation. So if the black king moves closer. Is stalemate, so you can That's never get the king cool. closer. So whenever, when if you move the queen away, then there's some somewhere. Then white moves the king, and again, it's threatening to queen. So white's always threatening to queen, or is stalemate. And because of that, you can never get your king closer and actually win the end game. Uh, queen against pawn, uh, when it's a rook's pawn, and it's the same actually situation if it was a bishop's pawn. So if you imagine, I don't know if you can you see my annotations. If you just get rid of that for a second. <laughs> Can I yes. draw in there? Does yeah, that work? And, and, and imagine, wow. imagine yeah. I didn't even know this that is, this, works. Is really, this, is, this is really advanced, advanced uh, technology. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's imagine. You guys, you know, I'm just terrible at drawing, drawing it. Imagine <laughs> the white pawn. Well, imagine the white pawn was there. Okay, <laughs> imagine the white pawn was there. Yeah. So white's again queening this way. White's queening this way. Yeah. Where does where does the king go now? This is a really this is a really good point. Do you go in front of the pawn? Oh, well, that that at, at least I know this one. Yes, you go to king a eight in this case. Exactly, exactly. You go into the corner. People know that too. Yes. And exactly, if they take the pawn, it's stalemate. So with with a rook's pawn or bishop's pawn, you've got this stalemate tricks. If it's a, a a knight's pawn or a central pawn, then you can force the king in front of the pawn, and Excellent. and on, on the move, kings in front of the pawn, you can um, 
being your king close and eventually win. So I'll, I'll get rid of my terrible drawings anyway. And, I like um, it a yeah. lot, actually. Yeah, I think it's uh, as we should frame it and put it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll make a career as an artist. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so this it was a really long variation. I mean, I did, I think, and, and so I was deciding, should I go for bishop d4 or king takes pawn? And by put, kind of calculating, even though it was a really long variation, it was only one variation to calculate. Um, I thought, well, he's he's probably gonna he's probably gonna find it because there's there's just nothing else for him to really play. He has to really go down that line. Um, so for that reason, I decided to, to opt for king takes pawn instead because at least it's a bit more um, a bit more complicated. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, the, the sort of fireworks are still far far but from over. So. Nick, Nick, I am sorry, but I have to ask you one question. And I'm sorry, I don't want to delay this too much because we only have 10 minutes left. But sure. I saw in this variation where this symmetrical position was with the pawns and the kings on... on yeah. Uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. This, this one, one, yeah. So what happens if white's king is following the black king and tries to get the opposition? <laughs> yeah, so I, I was actually wondering about that while I was doing the talk. But let, let's just say, for example, uh, let's say white goes... Because it's too um, fast, the, white, the black king is too fast, ca right? ca ca Comes over... You can actually, you can actually trap, you can actually trap, trap it. But no. I was because this actually variation comes up in in a in a minute in one of the other lines. But I'm wondering whether this is winning now because um, the pawn is right back on h7. So I wonder if we play king here and uh, let's say white goes for the pawn. Okay, I haven't actually calculated this. Either, so sometimes these can be quite drawish. Um, so I'm not 100 sure. If this is oh, going to be God, this is so crazy, gonna... right? Yeah. Okay, but I, I had maybe... this in mind, and I think it looks. Yeah. So here, let's just see this. It might be that so the king. <laughs> it's really, it's really, really close because actually, if you capture the pawn on h6, you would make it to d2 now, and it would be a, it would be a draw. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah. here we can go to b3. So and it, it might be. I mean, nice. I, I don't know actually. This is, there might be some draw there. Actually, I, I don't know if I even checked this properly. With the no worries. No but like, worries. I, I'm gonna just see. I'm gonna see if he just pushed the king. Up with it. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe I miss. Maybe I'm miscalculating. Is this thing a draw? Yeah. So maybe I maybe I miscalculated it after all that. Oh, no, it's a draw. It's a draw. It's a draw. Yeah, that's what we we thought it's a draw anyway. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, we thought. Yes, yeah, so it's a draw. Sorry, I'm talking about it. Yeah. It's a drawn line. Um, it's a drawn line. The way we played it, anyway, wasn't Perfect, it? So it was. A, yeah. It was a draw. It was a draw I, either way. Yeah, and I, I, actually, I just you, you to can draw. It. Sorry for that. Yeah, it's really actually really interesting because I think actually after King here, I think White can maybe play King F2. Let me just check this now. You've got me <laughs> curious whether whether King F2. Yeah, King F2 because if you go for the pawn now, yeah, then the King is capturing on H7, which is. Um, which is a draw, but if you play king f2, this is right, then you capture the pawn on h6, let's say black plays oh. h6, and that is now going to be a draw because this you can is... get back to d2. Oh, I mean, unbelievable. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's super complicated. So you, yes, you, you yes. actually right, you were right that it was... Um, I was, just, was, I was just uh, it was drawing. about it. I wasn't right there, but of course... Um, it yeah. was drawing, so... Um, but uh, because I had seen the other line was drawing anyway, yeah, this line is actually just about a draw. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, would have required a bit of technique. Um, so yeah, he would have drawn. Basically, he, he had maybe two options to draw. But great, great, great calculation. Sorry, um, yeah, I just yeah, I didn't want to delay this too much. Let's let's. So you great decided calculation. though. To, so I decided, anyway, decided sharper. That was a good. Yeah, I decided idea. to take the pawn because exactly it's going to be a draw anyway. And then um, yeah, so I, I'll just uh, push on a little bit. But actually, this um, this was actually maybe the next interesting. Uh, um, moments so he played bishop e7 I, I won't um hold you up too long yeah here where i ha had another key choice mm -hmm. between bishop f2 and h5 <sighs> and um it actually uh, i know i've only got a few minutes you've got your next uh, no, no, no yeah it's, uh, it's um, uh, yeah but it's it's going to be fine even if we <laughs> yeah. delay a little bit by the way uh get a fritz trainer from nick perk <laughs> yeah. but I'll, I'll i'll tell you a bit, but actually um i actually made this decision right because there was like, two or three key decisions i think i got the first two right, and then I got one of them wrong. But yeah, here I pay bishop f2 because if h5, then exactly the line happens that you um, just just alluded to oh, previously, funny. which is he can actually get this position. Oh. And this is actually going to be a draw. And and, and it's funny because I've actually had this position once before. I think it's this exact position, actually. Um, and I was playing with black, and I just assumed it was going to be a win and then yes. end up being a draw. And it I remember being so... so I, I remember saying, we look so far ahead of White's King. Yes, exactly. It feels like it just has to You're be on winning. The other side of the board and must win. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel but like you have you to win. To this, there's those it's, key squares a, which uh, Carsten Müller is talking about all the time, and now you entered it, and I think, yeah. Exactly, and you're just in time, just in time to get a draw. <sighs> so either you get the king into the corner, or if they play here, then you, you um, trap yeah. them in. So, yeah, that was um, that th that was actually uh, some a lesson I learned from a bad experience previously, that, uh, you know, don't don't let them trap you in the corner, which is oh, exactly... Excellent, okay. Yeah, so, exactly the reason. so I played Bishop F2 first, well because done. now... Uh, now, if he comes, if he try, he can't trap me in now, because then I can just yeah. come out and block him off. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I won't. Yeah, I know I've got running out of time a bit. So there was there was one really interesting position I, I wanted to show you. So takes. Yeah. Um, king King D five King in. Oh, yeah, knight is really clever with A four, and this is actually where I start to go a little bit wrong. Um, I think I should have just played. I should have just played H five, and mm -hmm. then um, that the line I was worried about actually was after A five. Um, let's say bishop e1 was was basically this position, and um, what I was afraid of is if I play h4, and the bishop takes white white can white can draw this position. Do you see? Yeah, how does he draw? I think you maybe just spotted it. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry that I I, I mean <laughs> that uh, white, white white can actually draw this position now. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's this. Uh, I had this uh, against the uh, player two. And she, yeah, she had, a, it was very similar, this position. And I didn't know that this is actually uh, able to draw. So I calculated it on the board because I had like 40 minutes left. So I was calculating and I thought like, oh, wow, they can actually not win. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, so, he, he, yeah, they can, they can, is like they can capture the pawn. And right now, now this is actually um, also really important. In um, Bishop of Rook's pawn against King, the bishop, if the bishop controls the queening square, you can win. So if I have yeah. bishop and this rook's pawn, it's a, it's a winning combination. But if I had the one over here, it, it would be a draw if, if white could reach if white could reach this corner. Yeah. Yes. So so I had to keep him out of that corner kind of under all circumstances. But he, in this actual position, white's got quite an annoying drawing line, which is he can play king c6, take and just king b7. And that's, ah! uh, that's, that's quite sad. Yeah. <laughs> so I that was... That was oh, that was the variation that I was um, that I was afraid of in the game, and like I said, we didn't have that much time. And I saw this line, I thought, okay, the accelerator you know, got it right. Yeah, this, yeah, this is this could be a nice a nightmare for me. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, and then he he wins the uh, he wins the ball. So so because of that, um, I played a five. But actually, I've got a really nice move here, which is the move bishop d two, and this gives White a dilemma. Um, if he goes for the pawn, which he probably should do, if he goes away from the pawn, ironically, I can actually play h four now. Um, because, oh, because the king too is far away. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like I've burnt a tempo, but it means I can now play h4. Yeah. But if he goes towards the pawn, then I can actually uh, allow him to have the a pawn, and uh, I can just um, simply just uh, you know offer to you know he can't he can't sacrifice the bishop on the h pawn if that makes yeah. sense. He's not able to sacrifice. So then I'll just get rid of his bishop and and queen my pawn. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, I could have won that way. But anyway. Um, yeah, my, my technique was not quite accurate. So I went a5, fearing obviously these little tricks with the a5 yes. and everything. He played bishop d8, and now I should have played h5 here, which still would have been winning. Um, but instead, I played bishop e1, which was actually the move that blunders away the win. And um, <laughs> luckily for me, he returned the favor now by playing <laughs> king c4, which wow. I say we, we were both getting a bit low on time, which what was just a big mistake. Coaster. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, you win, you after h5. I basically had his king cut off, and I can simply win by playing h4 and, um, and tra trade. Again. You win it, and I've, this time I got the pawn on a5, so I'm going to be able to protect that pawn, my bishop, and win his a pawn. And it's the right color um, corner, yes. so it's, so I'll be able to win. But um, yeah, he had a really nice draw to and Maybe I'm just going to flip it. Can I just flip the board sure. from the white's point of view? He actually could have drawn here by playing king e4, which um, I, I pointed out to him after the game. I thought King E4 was much uh, more difficult for me to 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 meet, and he sort of thought that he was lost anyway. But as it turns out, he can actually draw. Um, the main point being after uh, H5, mm -hmm. um, King E3, H4. Remember, he can't take. That's a winning winning position for me. King E2, H3. Can you see what he can play here? Oh. Very clever move to, to draw in this it's position. King f1, isn't it? Exactly, king f1. Jeez. Just completely ig ignore the bishop and get your king into that corner. And uh, that would that would be a draw. Now, I had actually um, seen that. So uh, what I would have actually tried and um, in this position is I was going to try, I was planning to play king g3. And now after king e3, um, I think bishop seven might draw as well, king g2, we would have reached this position. Now, this is a, a really, really good question. This could be a problem. White to play, and I'm not expecting you to get this. White to play. There's only one 
drawing move in oh, this position. What? Okay, ladies Only and one drawing move. This is a really big challenge. I'll be so impressed for anyone who, um, <laughs> who manages to solve this without using a computer. White to play, the only, what's the only drawing move in White this position? White to play, which is the only drawing move? I'm very curious too. So, um, yeah, type in your answers uh, in, in the last uh, one to two minutes. I'm really curious. <laughs> Let's see if you can uh, solve this in, in, in the room, but uh, she will be patient for... Maybe for she can solve it minutes. as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can come in too, Svetlana, if you want to. Uh, it's p- pretty, the, pretty, the, pretty the pressure on, though. Um, yeah, so white to play. Um, so, so, the, so the main point here is um, if white plays... So black's main plan is to play... Um, H5. Can, yeah. I, can I draw? Can I draw my my great drawings? Back to my plans to play basically H5, H4, and and trade the bishop for that pawn, yeah. and then and then Black's got a winning um, position. Uh, so if, for example, uh, White plays um, White plays King F4 here. If White plays King F4, Black will play H5, and um, if White doesn't do anything in particular at that point, uh, then he can play H4 and just 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 uh, push on. Um, now there, there is one thing that White could actually try in that variation, but um, it still wouldn't quite work. So I, I don't know when you want me to give the answer or not. I, I don't know you, if anyone has solved the it. Accelerated says King C five, but King King C five is not possible it's here. A bit too far away, but maybe you you're meaning to get the King two C five. But um, L, uh, here Bishop takes A five is. Uh, uh, also not. Ah, uh, yeah, that is an option. Yes, Bishop takes a five. Says uh, Harper Hansen. Okay, well, I, I have to say, um, if you did that by yourself, many congratulations to Harper Hansen. <laughs> that is actually the only drawing movie. Oh, so, so, so let, let me just quickly say, if King if King f four um, yeah. h five, yeah. the idea of h four, and then um, if White doesn't do anything in particular, h four is going to win. White can get a bit tricky and play Bishop takes pawn here. Now, if black captures the bishop, you see what happens. Oh, you get the pawn. Yeah, you get the pawn with king g5, exactly. Oh, you get the pawn no. with king g5, exactly. But black does actually have a winning move here. Um, <gasps> Which is check on g3. Exactly, check. Yeah. And then the, the h pawn is just going to queen and, and uh, black, will, nice. black will win. So king f4 doesn't work. G- going, going the other way somehow, like, I don't know, going over this way, for example, is uh, you're not going to be in time. Let's say you go over this way, h4, and uh, yeah, you're, just, you're just not in time yeah. um, to, to solve it. So the drawing move is, in fact, and um, very well done to Harper. It's actually yes. bishop takes a5. Yeah, Harper says brilliant move. he didn't use an engine. So Brilliant, brilliant. That. Very Thanks good. Everybody I everybody who's joining in and giving answers to the chat. It's always nice to engage with you. Thanks. Yeah, very good. So I'm very, very impressed if you found that. Bishop takes king f4. And um, the point is now that white, let's say, let's say, for example, black plays some move, let's say bishop d2. Yeah. Um, the, the king will come up to say h5. And then the pawn will be used now oh, as a as a, as a decoy. So yeah, sac- sacrifice the pawn. And then, um, I mean, okay, black can delay it, but eventually he's going to have to take <laughs> Eventually, you have to take that pawn, and then Probably White is. can get the draw. So, oh, this is really a study. My goodness, it, it was it was quite weird because actually, just from a normal game to suddenly end up with all these like uh, crazy lines. I, I I don't want to take up any of your time, but I just thought it was quite. A Thank nice, you nice so game. much, Nick. That was absolutely uh, very stunning. What a beautiful game, and how nice that you just had that very recently. Um, yeah, this is how chess can go if you have positions like this on the board. I mean, uh, well then yeah we all know it it is an absolute beauty nick pert right. ladies and gentlemen i hope you got a couple of his fritz trainers you're into the raffle of 25 euro and thank you so much for being uh, online here nick it was uh, a okay thank, yeah, thanks a lot thanks then okay to you soon thanks then we keep in bye. touch thanks. bye bye, bye. svetlana is next hey svetlana how are Hello, you doing Arnie. i'm doing great how are you I am, I'm feeling absolutely pumped. It's crazy because, um, I mean, it's uh, three hours in almost. No, it's two and a half. So pff, I feel I feel like a newborn child. I'm learning so much in chess. It is exciting. It is fun. And uh, I'm happy to see you again, of course. You look great as always. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start uh, the chit chat, I have to share with you that you can obviously uh, win something if you buy... Uh, Svetlana's Fritz trainer and she has made two already the scotch game and understanding material imbalances we even had a a lesson with um, 
with Sipke Ernst earlier, and uh, there was a material imbalance, and exactly what you are teaching in your DVD has uh, applied. Um, if you buy uh, Fritz Trainer from Svetlana in the next half hour, 25 euro raffle is, uh, you can win a 25 euro voucher for the chess Bay shop next week. And uh, we're just uh, roughly 70 people uh, watching, so your chances are high to win this voucher. It's almost a Fritz Trainer for free. Like, let's be honest, that's how it is. Um, so you made two Fritz Trainers. We have our show. I mean, probably most of you know this already. It's Svetlana's Smart Moves. And we've been talking about both Fritz Trainers already, but we will still take a little bit of a look into this. Um, you have recently played in a bigger chess tournament. Well, it was like a qualification. Do you want to share a little bit how this went? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I played in the Canadian Women's Championships recently. And yeah, it was a qualification for the Olympia team. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the next big event that, uh, that I will go to. Oh, this is very exciting. And uh, not only that, we will even maybe uh, meet up again this year. Let's see uh, how, how things are turning up. If so, then, yeah, there might be a new Fritz trainer coming up soon. So very excited for that. Um, Svetlana, do you want to show us some smart moves of one of your Fritz trainers? <laughs> maybe share some knowledge, some insight. Sure. Absolutely great. Let's go for it. Can you see my screen? I can. That's always working pretty flawless. So we're starting with material imbalances, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Very interesting thing. Yeah, sure. So this is one of the examples that uh, um, we also briefly looked at in the Fritz trainer. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the most classic uh, examples of material imbalances that I could remember because it's also a world championship game between Capablanca and Alakine. So it is it is a very classic example. Yeah. And it is also uh, concerning one of the most common material imbalances that you can think of, which is a rook against two pieces. Mm -hmm. So yeah, here it is um, It is for white to, to find a move and uh, to think whether you would actually go for this material imbalance here or not. Of course, in the Fritz trainer, I give more of general guidelines first of which combination is better in the end game, which combination is better in the middle game, mm -hmm. and what other factors that depends on. But um, you should be you should be able to at least have a guess of what you would play and then find out the right solution. Here we go, everybody. Write in your answers in chat. What would you play? I already made my decision the moment this popped up. Immediately, I, I know exactly what I want to play. And probably I want to play it only because of the combination sake without even thinking like I'm, am I losing just right now or am I winning a piece or whatever so mm -hmm. yeah there's actually a couple of more options of course do you often get material imbalances in your own games yes I do and I'm actually mm -hmm. forcing it often enough because I like it and I'm also I learned a lot by uh, from from your Fritz trainer and the, the Svetlana smart moves course about the material imbalances for me, the most stunning thing when we had the lesson on the Fritz trainer is I think I had my mouth open for a lot of times because I just didn't know it. I didn't know that uh, sometimes a rook is uh, better against um, two minor pieces in end games, for example. I mm -hmm. always thought, I was sure that two minor pieces will always be better. So I always, even in blitz games, I always went for the two minor pieces and then... I yeah, was wondering yeah. why didn't I why couldn't I convert? That's so weird. Me, why couldn't I win? Yeah, in, in my own experience, I've also sometimes felt uncomfortable in some um, material imbalances uh, positions because it was never something that I particularly trained or really learned all of these all of these subtleties. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what inspired me to make this um, this training tool because I found that it was often not something that you would you would really train and yes. you wouldn't really know how to do it. Yeah, I, I've, I've, guys, I highly recommend this Fritz trainer. If you don't have it yet, uh, give it a shot. Really, really. It's uh, very insightful. Now, we have a lot of interesting uh, answers here. I will read them. The Accelerated says Knight C7 check. This is what Lars Lintard also says. 
Frederick Ryan says mm -hmm. knight c7 check, rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, queen takes c7, b4. Wow, long variation. And then we have Mark Leonard, which is saying rook takes c5 looks tempting. And this is mm -hmm. exactly what I thought too. It looks mm -hmm. tempting. So let's take a look. Okay, I we can look at all of these variations. We haven't, the, the right move that has been played in the game hasn't been named yet. But um, all of these ideas are interconnected. So knight c7 is is definitely an option, one of the first moves to look at because it's a check. Um, and this would lead, this could lead to, for example, this type of a material imbalance as well. Um, except this wouldn't be the exact same way as we wanted because we're the ones um, we're the ones who gave our two pieces for the rook yeah. but even yeah even more so black could get away for now with something like king e7 oh. when it comes to rook c5 this is indeed a nice temporary exchange sacrifice and later leading to knight d6 which was probably the idea mm -hmm. um but at the end of the day if you count up all of the material we pretty much just came back to equality mm -hmm. and um for for this reason, we don't really we didn't really get an imbalance here. Yeah. So, I think someone mentioned um, the a connected idea with knight c seven, which was to play before right away. Correct. That was uh, Frederick Ryan. Yes. Yeah. So this is better to start oh, to with start this way with before. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, even though the pawn is hanging, uh, we l can later see how um how we will get it back and we will put the position into into an imbalance so if knight to b4 mm -hmm. which wasn't played in the game but uh if this happens then we have once again the same knight d6 ideas and um we're still we still have a great position we can even uh, i think we want an exchange Change. yeah looks yeah, like we want an exchange so this would be very good <laughs> yeah. This is not exactly an imbalance. This is just an extra exchange, which is also nice. Um, retreating the bishop does not really work either because of this same knight c7 idea. So all of these uh, come back and are connected. And no. it's oh, it's exactly yeah. what we wanted in the first place. But bishop b4 is the move that happened. So what do you think was the reason why we played this b4 move? And what is the continuation from here? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, B4 has been played. So, um, yeah, Wolfgang H. also said B4. That is absolutely correct. Now, yeah, the thing is to, we're opening up this uh, C file, which is uh, the main purpose. And now we can, um, I think we can try to win a piece now like this. But, oh, now I see it finally. Okay, so, um, yeah, that took a bit. But uh, it, that is a clear material imbalance and something very beautiful. So uh, what's your tip? Quickly uh, type in the answer. What would you play as white here? Why was B4 actually the, the move? I, I see the move, luckily. So, um, oh, interesting. Interesting. I I I I've thought I saw something different. I, I get under different answers. Frederick says rook takes c6, queen takes c6, queen takes b4. Wolfgang says rook c6, and the accelerated says also rook c6. That is right. So this oh, was no, the I idea was of b4. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I thought the queen can take on b4. <laughs> <laughs> it unfortunately cannot. I wish we could just win a piece that way, but yeah, it's uh, not working. But yeah, it doesn't come back to to the same type. Well done, guys. You're you're doing very well. Okay. So in the game, we, you can take both of the queen and the rook, and the game rook took, mm -hmm. and we get this position with finally an imbalance on the board, and it is two pieces against um, against the rook and a pawn, which mm -hmm. is one of the most common types of imbalances that uh, you get in chess. Um, in the Fritz trainer, I also cover other ones, so queen and um, queen and two rooks, queen against pieces. Um, so there's there is different types, but this is the most common one, and it appears a lot. And it's really about deciding which. It's about it's more about these imbalance positions are more about even evaluating them and knowing which ones to go for and which ones not to go for. 
And here, would you agree that it is very pleasant to play this for white? And uh, since this is a middle game and since the opponent's king is um, is a bit weak, you would much prefer yeah. the two pieces. Yes, absolutely. No, no, of course. Um, mm -hmm. That's a nice so exchange. So the rest yeah. was not as much of an important moment as that critical moment that I yeah. showed. So um, the rest of the game was really smooth and it uh, it, fl it flowed by very... Uh, very well and there were a few there were a few more moments but just to show how it ended i go more in detail um in this particular example in the in the, the fritz picture. trainer yeah uh, but um it's uh, but the two pieces do end up being stronger than the rook and a pawn and even another pawn was sacrificed but that's the power of the two pieces in the <laughs> middle game especially combined with a queen or some other pieces mm -hmm. is because these two pieces can outpower the rook especially when it comes to an attack and this was one of such examples and that's exactly what you do when you have the two pieces and capablanca ended up winning this game in a really nice fashion with a tactic oh, in the end smooth yeah mm -hmm. very nice yeah so that's that's a bit about uh, the material imbalances and especially the one with the two pieces against a rook and a pawn is that in the middle game um it's hard to give one one guideline that will apply to every single two pieces against the rook and pawn positions but in the middle game especially if the opponent's king is unsafe and if there's more pieces in in the attack like a queen it's a really good combination and usually you would prefer having having the two pieces indeed yes super interesting yeah a lot of things uh, which i which i didn't know before and you're explaining them very well get it now you still have 15 minutes left um <laughs> but let us take a short look if you still have uh, something prepared for the scotch game yeah sure we can take Excellent. a look at the scotch game how did she score at the canadian championship second right yeah yeah there was my 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 Miley. Daughter, Miley, thank you. Is the girl that got yeah, first, she yes. She got nine out of nine, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Scotch okay. game. Yeah, an opening I have I the next one. In my youth. Mm -hmm. An opening I love to play in my youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've also played it for quite a few years, and uh, it is a very interesting opening, in my opinion. I really like it. And um, in the first trainer, it's a, the Scotch game, and there's um, a shorter... There is also a shorter um, addition to it, which is the Scotch Gambit. So the Scotch game starts with with these moves with d4 here. So in the Scotch game, you would recapture here with the knight, whereas in the Scotch Gambit, um, you don't take this pawn back and you sacrifice it temporarily and play bishop c4. So these are the two openings that I really like to play. And um, both of them have different ideas and they're slightly, yeah, they, they do have slight differences. But uh, the main portion focuses on the Scotch game, which is the which is the more popular line, and um, yeah, this is this is the one that I cover the most. Mm -hmm. Do you play it as white ever? I do not anymore. But I got a huge appetite after your uh, Fritz trainer to try it out again because I also I mean when we were uh, checking out the. Uh, a uh, nice, interesting variation in uh, Svetlana's Smart Moves, our our uh, series, our weekly series. I found that after bishop uh, c5 and taking on c6, the queen goes to f6. And that I thought like, wow, really? And that, that was quite uh, interesting. What do you mean, here? Yeah, so the now the knight takes on c6. And then the queen goes okay. to f6, and that that would be yeah. one line, for example. This can happen, right? In in mine, I recommend to play another line as opposed to this um, knight c6. Although this also exists, and uh, uh, this is also theory and has been played a lot. Yeah. Um, I kind of give some of um, some of my preferences. You don't always have to go for the exact line that I recommend, uh, but um, it's uh, I. I covered this knight b3 line, which is actually in, um, involved with long castling. So that's not very a very common thing that you would see too often in yes. the in the Scotch game. If you because the 
typical lines are more about uh, bishop e bishop e3 and then queen comes to f6 and c3 so these are more um more of mainstream lines yeah um but uh, the ones i like to play um and um uh, i think would be also enjoyable for people who uh, probably like to have opposite side castling and some attacks going on would be these lines where you would castle long the opponent might castle short and then you can have kings on opposite side of the board and start yeah. to have an attack i just want to um, mention that uh, when tihon and i played against you you of course used the scotch uh, game yeah. against us and you uh, unfortunately crushed us well yeah because of this long castling it was uh, it was really really tough i have to say so yeah i like i like your uh, attempt for for the long castling mm -hmm. uh, frederick says some guy named Gary yes, used to play it. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. Some guy named Gary actually popularized this opening um, because it was one of those, um, it has existed for many centuries already, mm -hmm. uh, but towards, um, yeah, I think towards the, the 20th century, it started losing its popularity a bit because it became an opening that was analyzed a lot and, um, and, there, and there just weren't as many people who were, who were playing it anymore, it became an opening that was kind of easily equalized. Mm -hmm. But then in the 1990 World Championship match, um, it was a sensation when Gary Kasparov used it against Anatoly Karpov. The first game he played it, um, it ended in a draw. And then he used it again a few games later to, um, to score a win. And that's what uh, kind of uh, started Don't the popularity of the squash game <laughs> once again. And it um, and it went back into style, and of course, since then, now many players use it as well. Um, it is not as popular as, let's say, the Rui Lopez or the Italian, uh, but to me, um, it has at least one advantage over those two. It's that it's less theory to learn, which uh -huh. yes, uh, which I really like, and it's one of the reasons why <laughs> I started playing it myself. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it's also one of the options, and. Um, the guy named Gary actually did, did a lot for this opening. He played it a lot uh, in his career. Nice one, yeah. Yeah. So one of the um, games, um, one of the games that I wanted to quickly show just as a as an introduction to the Scotch game is actually by Kasparov. Um, so he was playing this against Nikolic, and um, huh. it is one of the games that really shows the style of uh, of the Scotch of what it can be like. Oh, so right now we're in the main line, which is also in the Fritz trainer. And um, it is the one that probably you will see the most often if you start playing um, the scotch, because most people would uh, would probably know this. It's either this or the bishop c5 line, mm -hmm. which are the two the most popular ones. So this is the one that is the most theory heavy, probably, uh, because it has a few really forcing moves. Like, for example, queen e7, it pins the pawn, so we have to defend the pawn. And then the opponent's knight is hanging, so they have to move the knight. So it kind of <laughs> goes by really fast. Yeah. And um, it is a bit forcing in a way. So then we continue with c4, attacking the knight. And this is already a moment where your opponent can, uh, can go a bit off and that's how you will know if your opponent really <laughs> knows the lines here, because the main move is bishop a6. Oh my goodness! Which I guess you wouldn't come up with just randomly if you're if it's your first time seeing this line, yeah. um, because your knight is attacked and it might just not be noticed. Most people who know theory will of course play this, but um, knight b6 has also been played a lot, and I believe this is actually this has been played um, in one of the world, world championship um, games between mm -hmm. Gary and Karpov. So it used to be the main line, but nowadays, um, nowadays Bishop A6 is considered better. So there's many, many lines here. This is kind of the key position, which I go over a lot in, um, in the analysis. Yeah. So there's many moves here. There's G6, there's G5, um, there's Long Castle, there's even some Queen H4s, Queen B4. Um, options. So yeah, this is kind of like something which, yeah, yeah. This is the one that ha that is the most, um, um, which, which is the most important position to to know. And uh, this is the one with the most theory in this particular game. I'm not sure if we'll be able to look at uh, all of the subtleties of the game, but um, Gary Kasparov's opponent played g5, mm -hmm. and the idea of this move. Once again, it's not a very 
easy move to just find over the board if you have never seen this before um, because it looks a bit weakening but the main idea is to take f4 under control uh, because this is what white often tries to do here to protect the pawn and to just gain more space and um, yeah the game continues by just developing the pieces for both sides um, there can be both ways to castle for funny. there's both ways to castle for both of us actually for both white and yeah, for true. black we can choose um we can choose whichever way according decided. to the situation but um yeah the reason why i'm showing this game is that it's a very um it's a very attacking game it is in gary kasparov style of course and it can also happen from the scotch um and uh, it can be a very attacking opening especially um yeah especially with such opposite side castlings except here white didn't even castle if you remember um yes, I think do I you did. remember what what came next here i'm i'm sure i've shown you this game before i'm sure once. too it, there's a memory of absolutely coming back to me but i do yeah. not I so the next move is the key move yeah it is it is a key move and that's um that's what makes this game fascinating to me and uh, it's okay. had a really nice continuation. So I'm not sure if it's my memory or if what about a3? It is not a3. <laughs> so it's not there's a there. there's a bit of a knight c2 threat right now. Yeah, but it, I thought I didn't care because after bishop d3 I might have a good attack, but it's not. No, problem. true, true. You would still have a good attack. Yeah. So but is knight... it uh, is it castling maybe? If you castle, um, then I think I might take on a two and just and then come you back. just go back. Yeah. Okay. Not a, not fun, guys. What 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 did White play here? What is uh, miss? What it is a very strange move. The guy called to... Gary play here. Yeah. Um, but I like the move. Very strange move. King d one. Oh, Frederick Ryan. King d one. What about that? Is that the move? That is the move. Oh, Frederick. Do you, you 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 knew this by heart wow not bad so, not bad yeah it's not very something you see very often where True. you just don't castle and with the center so open uh, opened up and um you just decide not to do that but the point is that you're actually threatening to trap this knight so if you think about it this knight has no squares to come back to funny because they're all they're all taken and this king d1 actually has a threat of a3, which was your initial idea. And not only that, it also gets away from this... Um, yeah, nasty line. From, e. from the center being open on the on the e file. And it also allows us to bring the rook this way. So mm -hmm. surprisingly enough, with the center so opened up, um, white was able to just stay, uh, stay there on d1 with the king and uh, ignore the rest so i'm not going to say that you every single time you play the squatch you're going to have your king here in the center and <laughs> have the same type of uh, attack going on but um, it's a very dynamic opening and there can be many options like i said you can there's both sides castling for both white and for black so um there's many attacking options and this is just one of the examples of how it how it uh, went and this is why i really like this game because it shows all of the attacking potential of the scotch um at this point i think uh, gary should already be pretty much winning because the bishop is just the light squared bishop is really strong and um black's light squared bishop is not really doing much here so mm -hmm. it ended pretty soon with a nice bishop maneuver um onto d onto threatening to go bishop d5 check and um Although I would love this game to finish with mate, it actually <laughs> did not because he just uh, decided to win it more technically and um, traded queens. But there was no no real mate. There was no there. mate. Yeah, okay. There was yeah. no mate. But, but it looks but as if it should have been. <laughs> it, yeah, it looks like it should have happened. But instead, he decided to win what, one or two pawns. Two pawns, which that's, is good enough out of the opening okay. on, move, on move like uh, 25. Yeah. I feel like. That is a pretty good outcome of the opening. You've but something. yeah, this is um, yeah, this is just one of the examples that the scotch can be a very dynamic and attacking opening, mm -hmm. and the scotch gambit is um, also has a lot of tactical ideas, and um, yeah, sometimes it goes the more positional route depending on which lines you pick and depending on which lines your opponent picks.
mm-hmm. but uh, but in general it can go you can take it in both directions and it is suitable for both positional players and for attacking players and um, that's why I I really like this this opening excellent thank you so much for this uh, very very cool insight and uh, this absolutely brilliant game I am really worrying what's going on with my head because yes I remember not only we had the material imbalance position uh, on our show Svetlana Smart Moves we also had the Kasparov game and I hardly remember anything and it hasn't it wasn't that long ago um, so two months uh, ago yeah oh gosh two months only no this cannot be really oh, yeah but uh, I didn't show you the imbal- the same imbalances no game, I think. okay oh gosh this gets, it gets even worse because I thought I had that already <laughs> I mean, so maybe, maybe I'm just, I'm just trying to save you, but uh, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cooperating. You're, no. you're not taking. I'll it. just take this. I'll take this L, this big, big L of not knowing what I'm doing here. Yeah. Okay. Um. So let me quickly check if everything is fine here. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, da, da, da. And uh, yeah. Okay. Everything is fine here. So sooner or later, we will have, um, I think, the interview with the Komodo 3, which, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, check out. I'm just waiting for Larry and Mark to come in. Um, Was it any difficulties from Canada to tune in today? No, not really, right? For you, it is one o'clock, I think. Yeah. As far as I know, yeah. We always do our our show uh, for, for Svetlana. It's in the morning. And Svetlana, can I can I say it on camera? You're, you're not particularly the morning person. But, yeah. and, and for me, it's in the afternoon when I uh, often have like a little bit of a dead uh, dead point for myself. So I'm sometimes I just ate and then I'm like, OK, let's go for it. So, yeah, but that's how the situation is. I think it's it's fine after all. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Svetlana, so I will see you very soon because we will record our newest uh, Svetlana Smart Move show, which you will probably see everybody mm, one or two days later. So, yeah, looking forward to this. And thanks once again for joining tonight and, yeah, or today. Yeah, thank you. Good luck with the rest of the stream. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Bye. Bye. So here we are once again, everybody. Um, thanks for staying strong and uh, with me for all the time. I can slowly but surely uh, feel it now that, yeah, it's, it's been three three hours. So well, I guess uh, I can do a couple of hours more. We still have, uh, we're halfway through. It's half time. Yeah, that's that's basically what it is. And we're talking about this little lovely baby here pretty soon. I'm, I'm a bit worried, a tiny bit. Because um, I I think there should be at least one person <laughs> from the Komodo three team here. That would be some something I would go like, well that's that's good news. But nobody is too little for it now. Hmm. Well, um, what can I tell? Well, anybody uh, did anybody of you? I just. I'm just curious. I just want to know for myself. So from all of the viewers right now, did anybody buy uh, a Fritz trainer at the discount? day? Is it something you're looking forward to every May? And is it like this day where you go like, finally, it's time to get the, the Daniel King collection or um, like a bigger program like Chess Bay 16 or Fritz 18 or even Komodo 3, which is even on discount. Um, yeah, because... If there there is, um, I don't want to, to, to pull it down too much, but there are, are some websites which have a discount every day almost. And then I'm thinking like, is this even a discount day sometimes? So I'm not so sure about this. So yeah, we will have, we, we owe, uh, how many years has been this discount? Probably ages so far. Guys, talk with me. I need I need some entertainment. Uh, how do you like the show? How do you like the stream so far? Is it is it something nice? Is it something where we can learn something together? Or um, because this is after all, it's a test balloon. It's something which we are testing out, and maybe sooner or later we're making this a bit bigger. We're branching this out. We're having 
different guests. We might have a quiz show. We might have more prizes to offer. Talking about prizes, well, that is one thing which is happening so or so, even, even if um, there is no Larry Kaufman or Mark Leffler, what you should definitely do now is you should go and buy Komodo 3 if you haven't done so yet. Because right now you are also participating in this in our raffle if you buy it in the next half hour between 7 and 7.30. You have the chance to win 25 euro as a voucher for the chess base shop next week. So if you wanted to buy Komodo 3 anyway and you did think like, hmm, shall I, shall I not? I think there is no better time than to do this right now. Ah, so unfortunately, no way, what happened? Both both super players, I already had a really nice and fun interview with Larry Kaufman like last year, and I highly advise you to uh, check out the Chess Base news site, search for Larry Kaufman and watch our interview. It was pretty amazing. So, oh, I'm sorry, Bert Larsen, you had a question uh, I have bought all Svetlana's courses, particularly like the uh, Lazy Sicilian she made. Yeah, that's even the 60 Minutes. Thanks, Bert Larsen, for, for uh, going this. Thank you, Lars Lintat. It is very interesting. Thanks uh, for your comments, guys. That cheers me up a little bit. So I wanted to quickly uh, share the story with um, Larry Kaufman because it is quite um, amazing, after all. Um, what happened is that uh, he became a grandmaster at the age of over 60 years. I mean, when, I mean, if you ever have an excuse that you're not the grandmaster yet, so um, where's your excuse now? At the age of 63, if I'm not uh, wrong here. And the story was that he was actually a really good shogi player. So he was uh, particularly good in the um, other chess variant. Um, have you ever played shogi? I never, I, I know a friend of mine played it, but. Uh, I think I was never really interested in, in this, in, yeah. Then you, you know you have chess, and then you would go into learning something new. Turns out this is actually one of the best things you can do for your brain, probably for your chess knowledge, because I asked him the question, Larry Kaufman, did Shogi actually stop you from getting better in chess, or did it help you? Which is a good question, I think. So he answered that um, in the very beginning, he was a little bit confused and some things he had to get used to, but he said he was absolutely sure that this um, was helping him a uh, couple of months later massively because he used his brain from this different perspective. He used those different tactics and could apply to his chess skills. And then he won the US championship. And that was the path to becoming a grandmaster at the age of over 60. And I thought about this for a long time. I thought it fascinating because it is true. I mean, I don't know how it is for you, but do you ever play chess variants or variations like, uh, let's say, Bug House or um, Atomic Chess would be one which comes to mind? Um, because you learn to, to look at the tactics, the strategies and all of this. And then when you play chess again, out of a sudden, in the very first moments, it might be a bit weird, but then you really start to get better. I have the feeling because you, you think in a different pattern. I'm not sure if I'm, I am the only one, but um, yeah, that's how I feel about that. Now, uh, you still have 20 minutes, plenty of time, like 23 minutes, to be honest, to, to get this uh, Komodo Dragon 3. And uh, it will be part of the raffle to get you 25 euro so that's quite nice um the way this is dealt with is of course when you the moment you buy the download or um the dvd we have of course a time when it is bought and then we raffle out who will win this so i do not think that uh, let me check my emails one last time Da, 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 da. So, no, there, no, I, I, I don't know what happened, but both are not available. What a pity. 
But then I have to tell you a story or share with you a story which uh, happened to me and which we will take a look at uh, very soon because the next one after Komodo 3 is going to be Lawrence Trent, my partner in the Trent's tactics area. <clears throat> he's a good tactician. That's why he's good in the fast games and he, yeah, he just uh, naturally sees those tactics. So I prepared a tactic for him. A tactic which I found uh, in our chess base studio because one of my colleagues just built it up. We have a big chessboard there and he built up this position. So I took a look at it and I thought like, okay, this is a bit awkward. You will see it uh, very soon. I will, I will uh, show it to you nonetheless. And I couldn't find it out as hard as I tried. And... Um, only with the help, like with the really, really pushing help of some of the colleagues, then it finally occurred to me what the whole sense was about this. So I will, I hope you will enjoy the, the guessing together with Lawrence, who will go, yeah, who will go a bit crazy about it, because I do not think that you can find it out. So yesterday I checked the position, I put it into chess space, of course. And then I was uh, thinking like, okay, let me check it with the engines. What do the engines say? And they couldn't find the solution. They said that um, black is better and we are white to move and white should actually win this. And I was stunned. I thought like, but the computers have to know. It means it's engines. And we're, there's uh, modern computers and modern engines. So um, I told this to my colleagues and they said, yeah, but uh, maybe they don't have the table bases or something because they are that new. So I, I'm, I'm actually, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Larry and Mark about this. So I didn't know what, what was going on. Oh, course. So what to do? Get me Komodo 3. I want to test this out. <laughs> it's a true story. So maybe there's nothing behind it, but I just want to share this experience with you. And... Uh, I installed it just two hours, no, two hours ago, it's three hours past, four hours ago to check the position. Got it. In like, not even a second. Like it immediately, immediately uh, showed up the right solution. White will win with the right move. And that was quite impressive, I have to say. Uh, that is something which uh, has to be uh, talked about because is it because uh, Komodo is just that good now or does it have the table bases included? Stuff like that. Well, I mean, you can read it for yourself. Also, I would like to know, um, it says playing strength freely selectable between ELO 1 and 3500. So I don't know how it is uh, for you. I never played against anybody who had an ELO of one. I would be really... But here's the chance. You can do that. And then I would love to know uh, how... Like, would be this would be a challenge. Can you lose or can you try to lose on purpose against an ELO one? How would this look like? If you get the fools made in, would the ELO one immediately go like, Sorry, mate, you're checkmate here. I, I mean, I am ELO 1, but I will check this uh, checkmate you lost. You just lost against ELO 1. I'm sorry. Your ELO was roughly 2,000. Now it is 1,000. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I would really like to, to try this out and test this out. Probably you already have uh, Komodo Dragon and um, are trying out some, some fancy stuff with this. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I cannot say anything else that this is a freaking, freaking strong chess program. I'm pretty certain. And this is only my, my personal experience. I don't know how, how much it influences all of this. But um, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about this. Do you have any questions which you want, which you want to ask me, maybe personally? Um, best wishes from Guatemala. I'm a big fan of your products. Always use chess based related products. Well, Beetle... Beetle, thank you so much, and greetings back to Guatemala. Wow, that is, uh, I'm, I'm flattered that you are uh, taking a view from this faraway country. I have never been to Guatemala, obviously. 
Um, is it a nice place to live? Probably the weather is quite good. So, um, cool. The US Chess Federation these days doesn't let anyone get an ELO below 100. Yeah, I think, uh, well, that would be even, um, I, what was the weakest player I ever played against? I think I had a player who had an ELO of, it wasn't an ELO, of course, it was like a German rating and it was 775. Oh, I have to share a story with you quickly. So since we're at it, um, I once in my youth played against uh, a girl which had a rating of 1003 and I came almost 55 minutes late and it was a one hour game. It was a um, it was a team game. <laughs> so, yeah, I had five minutes left and she had one hour left and I could win this. And she was so arrogant. She was like, well, that's, well, now good luck with your five minutes because you are 55 minutes late. And she was right, of course, but she didn't have to rub it into my nose. Well, she lost, so she got what she deserved. And I think she doesn't play chess anymore. I'm not sure if I was the reason for that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, these are the ALO things. Uh, what's your ALO? What is your personal ALO? Who, who is watching here? What is your ALO? Minus 19 less than 30. I was 1930 recently. I lost um, four games out of five. Oh, don't want to talk about it. So let's not talk about it. But now I'm, I'm slowly moving into the direction of 1900. I was five or six years ago. I was 2056. And I thought like, wow, I got it. I got this milestone of going over 2000. Yeah, but uh, that doesn't mean that is the end of the road, is it? Now I want to get to 2,100, especially with all my coaches. Elizabeth Pates, Svetlana Demchenko, Lawrence Trent, even uh, Carsten Müller I'm learning a lot from his endgame magic. And Matthias Deutschmann, who probably most of you don't know. He's a comedian. We're doing a show every two weeks. He's talking about the history of chess a lot and about politics and stuff like that. We won't talk about politics today. No, this is a discount stream. So you still have 15 minutes left to get this beautiful Komodo dragon. Here we go. Jens Petersen, ELO 1812. But now I bought Svetlana's DVD, so soon higher. 100% agreed. I think... You, there is absolutely no way that you will not reach at least 1813. No, but with Svetlana's DVD, um, that should be even a lot more. She is doing, she's so young. She's 18. She's doing such a great job to explain everything. And uh, she's taking good care to make it entertaining too. So, yeah. Well, you know this, of course, because you probably watch our show. Thanks for sharing your uh, ELO. No, but uh, soon you will actually probably go into the 1900 area and then it is not long before you are a 2000 person. Yeah, but then don't give up. Keep on playing because um, do you think it's the age? I'm 42 now. Maybe I just because, yeah, it is a bit, it is a bit worrying. I just had Svetlana here and she was showing some positions and the first one I thought like, oh, we had this already, but she said like we didn't. And the second one, I was sure we had it already. I knew this game, uh, but I couldn't remember anything. Oh, oh well, I'm just uh, 42. So, I mean, as Larry Kaufman, one of the uh, main programmers for Komodo Dragon 3, once I reach the age of 63, I might become a grandmaster. Just you wait. I got it in me. I feel the spirit. I'm just kidding. Oh, I gotta drink a little bit of water because I'm talking and talking and talking. Don't leave yet. And I think I, I actually appreciate that you're not leaving. I still see over 50 people here. Thank you. Thank you. You all want to see a bit about Komodo. I know. But uh, yeah, sadly, it doesn't happen. Let me check the emails again. No, no. There, there's just like it's uh, it's not happening. No. <sighs> Maybe I messed up something with the times. Maybe it was my fault. Go for it and you become Grandmaster when you're 60 plus. There, Lars Lindhardt. No excuses, GM at 60. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I feel very motivated. What do you mean with 50 minutes left for Komodo? Torse, don't you know? 
if you buy the Komodo Dragon 3 right now, in these last 15 minutes which are left, or let's, now it's just 12, but you still have enough time, you are automatically participating in a raffle to win 25 euro voucher for chess base. That's the whole deal. Because, yeah, we just have like 50, 60 viewers, 70. Um, so the chances if you want to buy anything from chess base anyway, and it is this particular thing because you just tuned in and you want that. So that's the by far the best chance because there might be only three, four, five, maybe only 10 people who do the same right now. I think Svetlana is taking the trophy here. She, she, uh, there were a lot of people who, who got her Fritz trainers. Well, good for her. I'm happy for her. So Tarza, that's it. Yeah, if you have Komodo 3, if you do not have Komodo 3, uh, now is the chance to maybe get it because your chances to get the 25 euro um, voucher for chess space next week are quite high. That means Komodo is roughly almost 50 euro only. Wow. But it's not guarantee, of course. Well, that was necessary. I just hope I don't have to pee too badly sooner or later. Well, oh yeah, I, in this time, I'm sorry, I have to write back to Lawrence because I, listen, I will just uh, do some overtime. Uh, let me get to Lawrence because I will tell him, you can come in right now, please. <laughs> Let's see. Hopefully, I think he is busy. As, guys, you don't know how difficult it was to get all the people connected to all the times. Because they had their training before, they had a seminar after, they had something to do before and after, so I had to switch around and all of this. I'm so glad it happened so well until this point. I'm, uh, I'm actually really happy that uh, everybody was uh, joining uh, very well. I will figure out about Larry and, and Mark, something went wrong. Maybe it was the wrong day or something like that. I don't know. But uh, we will we will uh, find out the solution for this. I want to interview them again. Mm, ask them about the Dragon 3. Tarza, ah, thanks. I think about that. Don't know if I need it for chess practice. I completely understand. No, it's not. It's it's uh, That's totally fine. You do not have to. If I just said like... Yeah, if you, if you want to buy it anyway, that would be the best point to do so. Good luck for your chess practice. Watch our shows. Watch uh, Svetlana Smart Moves. Probably online Thursday already again. Uh, and then I'm thinking, like, I learned so many things. Why don't I get better? I played a tournament. Why the name Dragon 3? Beetle, Beton. That is a good question. Well, um, I think I asked... I asked this Larry. So you you mean particularly Dragon, not Dragon 3, because Dragon 3, it is simply because... Oh, there's Lawrence! It is simply because there was already the Komodo Dragon, and then there was Komodo Dragon 2, and now it's the third part. So that is the reason. But the name is the Komodo Dragon is an animal. It's a lizard. And Larry mentioned it in the interview. Please check it out on the news site, because, um, yeah, it's a, quite an interesting story. Lawrence! Hi, my friend. Is this okay? Is this okay like this? I With love it. It's like okay. uh, you have as a green screen, a uh, blurry green screen. Very creative. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I have it blurred out. This or, fits perfectly to your Fritz trainer. Okay. Do you want me to? Uh, what don't, I didn't understand what you wanted me to do exactly. Don't uh, do don't do anything. I will take care of everything. So. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Lawrence, first of all. Um, oh, we're live. We're live. We're live. Let me tweet. And rolling. Let, me, let me just tweet out. You that talk and I'll tweet. Do, do that. You have all the time. You have more time than anybody else because, very unfortunately, uh, Larry Kaufman and uh, Mark Leffler didn't show up. Something went wrong. I don't know what. Maybe they couldn't connect. Something like that. I don't know. But it's, it's fine. I, I was covering everything by talking and talking and talking. And I'm very glad that uh, you, my friend, are joining in right now. Great. Because we're, uh, first of all, so now it is 1923. That's the, that's the clock. Now, until 8 o'clock, all of you at home who buy one of the 
uh, let me give the link into the chat right away. So Lawrence Trent has made, gosh, so many Fritz trainers. Anyway, a few. here, yeah, a couple. So here's the collection of uh, Lawrence, uh, my friend in Trent's tactics, which we solve a lot of tactics, which is so much fun. He is going a bit onto the edge of the openings, which I highly appreciate. This is a bit more, uh, you have first B3, you have even the Albines counter gambit. Yes. And this is, I have to, it's the truth. It is the truth. It's uh, my favorite um, Fritz trainer of all the Fritz trainers out there. Yeah, of course, but okay. because I love to play the Albin's Counter. Because you're an Albin fan. Let me just. So, yeah, I learned a yeah. lot from this. It's super, super interesting. But yeah, it's very specific. It's a niche. I know that. Now, F4, the bombastic bird, is not that much of a niche because, uh, especially in uh, quicker games, uh, this is played so often. It's like a it's like a blitz opening. And Daniel King was uh, promoting his uh, King's Gambit, so it's not that far away. It's a very nice DVD. Anyway, mm -hmm. what are you drinking? Blood? Jesus, you're a vampire. Cranberry juice. <sighs> Good, you said that. Anyway, um, by the way, just yeah. so so you know, Please. I know this is a little off topic, but cranberry in German, they use the word cranberry, right? Mm. There is another yes. word. Yes, when it. you go to yeah, there is there is a there is a word for for cranberry in German, and it's Moosbeer. It's the Moosbeer. That sounds like an animal. Or the Preiselbeer. Preiselbeer, yeah, that yeah. that is the one which, uh, which sounds familiar. Wow. Now, if you go to a restaurant and you ask for cranberry juice, they don't say Preiselbeer. They have Heidelbeer and Blaubeer and all the other beer. <laughs> Cranberry is cranberry in Germany. I don't know. I don't make the rules. It got Americanized. It's it is. because cranberry juice is just such a thing. It uh, is. Let me quickly say yes. from Locardo's greetings to Lawrence. I like the D3 variation in From Scambit a lot. Very Yeah, that's one play. of my favorite novelties of all time, by the way. Thank you so much. I couldn't end my promotion. Let me talk. Okay, sorry. Whoever buys any product of you automatically takes part in a raffle to... Uh, win a 25 euro voucher for chess base for uh, the next week. So if you wanted to support Lawrence or just buy something from him and because you just like this guy, because who cannot like this guy? Do it now. <laughs> well, Do it now. <laughs> so, so go for it. Yeah, you don't have to say anything. You cannot say <laughs> anything, actually. So, um, yeah, this is the link. Uh, take a look at his uh, Fritz trainers. My personal favorite, Albin's Counter Gambit. Come on, you have to take a look at it. You do. Let me tell you this quick story. Um, uh, I think, and I don't know who, it was my colleague Thomas here from Chess Space. He said like, yeah. uh, Morozevich is playing Albin's Counter Gambit. And he, in an interview, said famously, after the question, why are you playing Albin's Counter Gambit? He said like, well, because I know the Albin's Counter Gambit. It is quite solid. And people who play against me have to prepare for it. That was interesting. And I like that because it is a statement. It is like, listen, I got this. So I know that you don't have it. So do you want to prepare for it? No? Okay, then you have to go through all of that. And then Alvin's counter game, it goes on. So, Bird Laws, I strongly recommend Lawrence the Bombastic Birds. Gotcha. I've played first F4, second B3 all my life, and I have a 70% record with it. Gee. Wow. Even That's in serious huge. ICC, FCC. Great for surprise on the board as well. Fantastic. Now, Lawrence. Yes. Normally, you yes. are showing me tactics. Yes. Today, we're <laughs> turning the tables around. <laughs> oh, God. So okay. My, my colleague, uh, Fabian Brinkmann, who's working yes. at Chessbase, he yes. found uh, a, a position which... I have never, ever seen or ever, yeah, it, it's beauty. It's a beauty. Okay. And I couldn't figure it wow. out. And Arne Bracker, who has a rating of almost 2,300 going into yeah, the I, I am territory. Yes. He couldn't figure it out without help. Nobody wow. could. So now, now I I'm put it into the engines. They couldn't figure it out. What? Yes. They were like, You want well, me to figure something out? Unfortunately... That, uh, Unfortunately, oh. black is better. Sorry, you're white, but black is better. Except this little monster here, Komodo 3. I tested it right before the show, I swear. And he got it in 
a split second. God. Immediately, plus 13. I'm not going to get it in a split second, guys. I don't want you to... No, all you cannot. Over. You cannot. You, uh, otherwise, I, cannot. I would uh, say you're a cheater. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Let's, so, how do I do this best? First of all, I have to try to put on my uh, chest base 16. So, let me try to do this now. Okay, we're we're back here. So uh, let's, go, let's go like this. So the chest base is on. I have the position. Give me one second. There it is. And I will share the screen now, okay? Okay. So, and everybody at home, you can also, of course, um, start guessing. Um, I won't, you can also, if don't, don't use the engine, please, if possible. Try to figure it out uh, on your own, of course, but... Um, yeah, it's just a beauty. So here we are uh, at this very position and it is white to play. And uh, I can't see. Wait. Let me see. What? Oh, oh here we go. Yeah, I, I got it now. Okay. Pardon. OK, OK. So, yeah, everybody should see it right now. So, yeah, are you at home? <laughs> this is it's worth uh, staying here. So I'm so glad that Fabian found this. I'm so glad that uh, Thomas built it up in his uh, room. I will give you a couple of hints, of course, every now and then, because, yeah, you can, as I said, you cannot, you cannot find it out. So don't, don't be hard on yourself. Okay. All right. So do you want me to talk through the process or yes. what? what what's... Yes. And I can, okay. we can also make some moves if you want to. Okay. So situation is clear. The Black King is in some kind of a mating net. Now, the question is, how do we exploit this? Hmm. Obviously, the first move you look at is bishop d2 check, and then you see the move b4. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, you see the king gets out by b5. Um, and after that, if knight d6, check king b6, and the king runs away. So that isn't correct. This is, um, although this is a very, very, very good uh, calculation so far, I have to say. So the question is, when the king gets to b5, do we have another way? Because the knight is also on prey. I would love to play bishop c5 there. Uh, because then I'm threatening knight d6 mate. But even after that, yeah, he can move the queen. He can even take the knight and the a6. Okay, so that doesn't work. So so let's go step by step. What yes. do you think is the very first move uh, for you at home, the viewers? If you want to take a guess uh, with us, a wild guess, go for it now. So, um... Well, you would think it's bishop d2 check, but I'm trying to see if I can play knight d6. Ah, knight d6 first, he goes king b6, so that's no good. So I, I think it is probably bishop d2 check. And you are absolutely correct. Bishop yeah. d2 is the move. You were okay. also correct, of course, because there's no other move, literally. Yeah. So but it's maybe, b4. Yeah. And now, it's again, it feels as though taking is correct, but yeah, there's no value in going a takes b4. So let's say bishop takes b4. Perfect. So far, mm -hmm. let me say it yeah. like this to give you a yeah. little bit of a hint here. So far, everything is correct. Okay. So the king so only king has... Uh, oh, okay, so divide. this is a critical moment. So... It is interesting okay, okay, I'm starting to see something. I'm starting to see something. Interesting. Okay. I'm starting to see something very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, now I'm curious. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. What's happening? It. What's happening? I think I've got it. I'm the not cranberry joking. juice is kicking it. in. <laughs> I think I've got it. I'm not even joking. I no. think I've got it. No. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go, I for, think it. I've go got for it. it. So I think here... Lawrence for GM, says Harry, yeah. <laughs> you you think? have this amazing concept of playing the move 96 check and on king b6 only move to play the amazing bishop a5 check. And the point is, if queen takes a5, you play knight c4 check, you win the pawn ending very easy because we come over to f4. So true, if queen true. takes a5, knight c4 check, knight takes queen, um, 
and then the king runs to the f board. And on king takes a5, we now have the move knight c4 check. Uh, the king has only got one square on b5, but the king is in a mating net after king b5. And now we rush the king over to c3 and play a4 mate. And when he goes c5, we go d5 and the queen is in a net. I don't know how close I am, but that's what I... So let me tell you, I got almost e exactly as far as you. And I was so proud of myself that I yeah. could find this bishop a5. It is a beauty yeah. so far. It is a beauty. And then I thought exactly like you. Just bring the king over and um, then it should be checkmate. But... Mm. This is not the case, Lawrence. Oh, no. Shame. Now, listen. Okay. I need, to, I need to quickly go to the bathroom because after three and a half uh, hours, I didn't have okay. any cranberry juice, but I just have to. So I'm gone for five minutes. Would you be so kind and entertain the people sure. with your I'll thoughts? Sure, I'll talking. Yeah, absolutely. I'm back in a moment. Thanks. Absolutely. See you, see you very soon. Get his Fritz trainers. Okay. So apparently... Running the king over to c3 and playing a4 is not correct here, which is very, very upsetting, predominantly because, ah, I think I see the response now. Yeah, because on king d3, c5, d5, he can probably play the move queen d7, and then king c3, queen takes d5, and it's not made. So we're not quite there. So that isn't correct. But we're not far. We're not far away. We can't be far. Meanwhile, while I think about this, get my French trainers. 25% uh, off. I've done a whole bunch for uh, chess base, as uh, you guys probably know. Um, I've been working with chess base now for goodness me, for years and years and years and years. Legitimately, the first video projects I ever did were for chess base. If you look at my author page, you'll see the two knights defense. Uh, you'll see the Smith Mora Gambit. These were done well over 10 years ago. And since then, I've done the Gashimov Sicilian. I've done the Grand Prix attack. And the more most recent ones, as a lot of guys in chat have mentioned, the baffling B3 Sicilian 2B3. A very, very good little opening against the Sicilian. Um, the Bombastic Birds, also a fantastic opening. Um, the Birds opening, well underrated. Great surprise weapon and beyond that. And of course, the Albin Counter Gambit, which one of my favorite openings I was actually able to produce an entire series for, so I was very happy. And so I've got uh, 11 separate DVDs. Some are shorter than others. Um, please do buy them. Uh, they're 25% off. They're great value. Um, put in a lot of work. There's a lot of uh, new ideas in a lot of these DVDs. For example, in my Birds DVD, um, one of the users who's in chat said he loved my B3 novelty in one of the main variations. So there are tons of novelties everywhere. You know, it's, um, I, I can honestly say it's really, really good value. So go and get those today. Now, as so, for the... Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm back. Uh, You're back. Somebody wrote crazy line with tr probably six A's. Absolutely. And Alan Jones... Um, Requirements for chess base 16 in the laptop. I don't know by heart. Please check out the shop page and check out chess base 16. The requirements are under the point requirements. Yeah. Lawrence, how far have you come here? No, I mean, I was just talking about my DVDs. I haven't really figured this out. So, yeah, I figured out that here after king b3, c5 is just way too uh, good. d5 and then either queen b7 or queen c8 is good because... There's a queen h3 check or mm -hmm. queen takes d5 or whatever it may be. So, so this doesn't work. So let me give you the hint which uh, my colleague Thomas give, gave mm -hmm. to me, which made me move a step further. If you take a look at the black queen, mm -hmm. where 
can the black queen go to? Uh, nowhere. Well, uh, well, that's, b7 or c8. That is moment, more or less the correct answer, though. Yeah, exactly. The black yeah. queen can go nowhere. So how can we even exploit this a bit more? Okay. So, by the way, for you at home, if I say the queen can go nowhere, of course it can go to, as uh, Lawrence said, go to b7 and to c8. But of, then we have to uh, check on d6, which will give us the queen. So what you're saying is... Because the king need... cannot move anywhere. Yeah? Oh, wow. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, here it comes. The second cranberry juice boost. <laughs> No, actually, I haven't seen it. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Why did it? No, bef before, after king d3, c5, d5, he doesn't have queen b7 or queen d8 because of knight d6 check. Exactly. So king d3, c5, d5, f5, with the idea of putting the queen on f6 is the point. <coughs> okay, so king d3, d c5, d5, f5. And now can I go d6 blocking? No, d6 takes away the square. So maybe I go... Locardus gives an interesting thought. So we play f4 and on uh, c4, d5, we set him to Zugzwang. That is... No, but he's um, got f5 there. That's yes, the unfortunately, after f5. But the, the idea is very interesting. Exactly, yeah. There, uh, there is something like this involved. Isn't this a crazy, isn't this a crazy, uh, beautiful tactic? I'm sorry that I'm penetrating you with this uh, hardcore thing, Lawrence, but I thought you more than anybody else would appreciate it. <laughs> I, I mean, if I get it, I'm going to really appreciate it. I, I mean, I've got to get it. And I'm struggling to factor in F4 because the F4 has to be there for a reason, right? So, so F4 first, C5, D5. Now our threat is f5, and it would be Zugzwang. If we could play f4, f5 there, it's Zugzwang. So he has to play f5. And now if we go, but the queen is swinging across. What if we go f4 first? Oh, <gasps> if we go f4 first and he goes c5, can we go f5 there? c takes d4, king takes d4. No. No. He's onto something. So let me play. So he went with the king to f4. So what's going oh on? Oh my here? god. And you want to go c5, d5, f5, king g5. Oh no. my god. It's not 100% over. f4, f3. No, dude, that's insane. That is the most insane. Isn't this funny? Isn't this beautiful? Oh, wow. That was so gorgeous. Isn't this? Yeah, I, I love this uh, so wow. much. So, yeah, uh, for you at home, shock. if you. So the whole, I mean, we gave that's a black amazing. queen a Zugzwang. Wow. That's that's what actually happened here. The, she cannot go to. B6, C6, wow. D6. Since he can go, not go to any spot on this line, neither here at all. There is no place where the queen can go. And now she has to move because we just blocked the last possible move for the black pawn. Amazing. And that is a win for white after all. I guess it will continue. The queen takes on A3 and yeah, that is, but that's just there's a win. Not not much this pawn is too brilliant far for it. yeah i'm glad you liked it yeah well done well 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 done actually that was uh 
that was quite good, I have to say, Lawrence. Uh, Amazing. You've, you've done me proud. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what are we, so, uh, what are we talking about now? We have 15 minutes left. Um, let's, not, let's not push it too far with to buy your Fritz trainer. Everybody knows this by now. And it is true. Yes, yes you have to buy the Fritz trainer. Yeah. You do. <laughs> Everybody watching, you have to buy a copy. That's obligatory. We both have green and this Fritz trainer is green and your background is green. So is. this gives me hope after all. I think that, uh, that's what it says, tells me. If yeah. you, uh, um, it, what, what, is an, what is a crazy opening you're playing recently? And may it just be Blitz or something else? Is there something um, that you really enjoy I'm, playing? I'm playing a lot of stuff at the moment. I am enjoying playing the Jabava London though. So the London oh. system with Knight C3. I'm having a bit of success with that. We had um, Amy already here. She's introduced her Jabava London system for the trainer. Uh, Ellie, Ellie Pates. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie yeah. Pates. Yeah, that was very yeah. nice. So I would suggest go and get Ellie's uh, Jabava London. It's a very, very good opening mm -hmm. and great at uh, not just club level. It's being used at top level now. Um, Hans Niemann, especially uh, the young uh, so super well. talent, is just crushing people with it. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, interesting ideas associated with it and um that opening really uh, excites me um, it is yeah and i didn't even know i mean ali was uh, introducing a bit about her fritz trainer uh, earlier and uh, she sh it was so it was so interesting because all those moves they were in my opinion very untypical of the normal d4 d5 uh, openings or knight to f6 openings it went into yeah getting charge of the center in something like this and very, very fresh and uh, attacking. I like yeah. That. Precisely. And so that's black, interesting. Yeah. And for black, um, well, I play everything. <laughs> that's a great answer. I play everything. That's my problem. I can play everything. Um, you know, uh, I haven't got anything specific with black that I've enjoyed playing or getting good results, but, enough, um, you know, Sicilians are always interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting with a bunch of Sicilians. So that's, that can be fun. Yeah. Uh, it's so weird. Why did I, 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 I missed this train. I have the feeling the Sicilian for me is like, um, Harry Potter, right? If you do not read or watch Harry Potter in the first couple of years where it was super cool and everybody yes. has done it, then I, I just don't want to read it, I guess. Yes. So I will never read Harry Potter. And I'm not sure if I will ever play the Sicilian because I'm too much into E4, E5. It's so much fun. I don't know. Well, E5 is a great opening and it's been my stable opening for years. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes you need a to win a game and... Uh, you need to mix it up, and sometimes you've got to try something—a French or a Sicilian or or something. Something because, has spoken. <laughs> yeah, because against one e five, White has got a number of ways to immediately force things into a very very dull game. So, as part of a re repertoire, and if we're talking about just you know in general for the guys watching, mm -hmm. um, you know. I would say that it's important to have a backup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have your staple opening, have your stable opening as well, but have a backup as well. Uh, I agree. Because What's going you're on gonna, in the background with you, by the way? There's, uh, sorry, it's uh, chaos here. That's, I don't know what's going on. I don't think it's, it's your fault, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there's some crime being committed just oh, below where I am. Yeah. People are playing um, the wrong openings. That's the crime. Sometimes. Yeah, exactly. It's the openings police. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I, yeah, I would uh, heavily suggest having your staple opening. And then if you're in a situation where you're in a must win situation or you're playing somebody a lot lower rated and you don't want to make it too dry, have one of those openings as well. So you have two, two openings effectively. I like that. Yeah. Two is, yeah. Two is more than enough if you study them yes. uh, thoroughly. Guys, do you want to ask uh, Lawrence any questions? Please. Now is your chance. Also, yeah, um, please ask. We are having, as you probably you might know already, we are having an uh, almost always weekly show. It's called Trans Tactics 
Trent, uh, Lawrence Trent is giving me some uh, yeah, tough, tough nuts to solve. Um, and it is sometimes really frustrating. Sometimes it is beautiful. I think our last show, I felt like uh, on cloud number seven, I was uh, in a really... It was really, a great really, show last time, that, yeah. That, that was, uh, and it was so untypical because it was Botvinnik, right? Yeah, we focused yeah. on, on Botvinnik, who isn't known for his uh, tactical... Tactics, no. Yeah, but of course you don't become world champion without knowing how to uh, to play tactically. Absolutely. So we looked at that. And then we have our tactic section after that uh, on on chess space where we are trying to climb to two thousand five hundred because this seems I I didn't expect it, but this seems to be our magical uh, barrier because we couldn't reach it yet. I'm actually surprised exactly. because I think I was a bit too keen. I thought like, hey, let's reach three thousand. But that might be very difficult. <laughs> yeah, getting to three thousand might be a little bit of a stretch. Um, but some we'll people see. did it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some people have done it, but they probably spend crazy hours on it. And the positions yeah, do yeah. get a bit tough. I mean, so if you're our, looking to improve your tactics, go go to tactics.chessplace.com. Our really. neighbor, uh, he's. I see him on the bench, sitting in the garden sometimes, and then he is uh, solving Sudoku's for right. More than an hour sometimes. There every, you go. Almost every day. He's a bit older. There you uh, go. Yeah, why don't you do the same with chess tactics? <laughs> yeah. No, not too Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, I, I tell I a lot of I my students, it. you know, most of my students, they're studying tactics at least half an hour per day. I kind of make that as a mandatory exercise for homework. That's, the, you're, you, you must have uh, strong students. When well, does it... I, when does it pull in? When do you see the success after all of this? Oh, we have a question here. I will read it in a moment. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay, go so this is, a, this is a teasing question, though. Okay. How are you doing with your GM quest, Lawrence? It's a valid question, though. <laughs> well, it's a good question. I'm actually um, playing my first tournament for many years. I've played the odd league game, but I'm playing on Friday, and I'm going to where Arna currently is located in Hamburg. So I'm coming to Hamburg. I'm playing there. It's a very, very cool. strong closed tournament. Happy and my road, soon. yeah, my road to Grandmaster is firmly underway. Uh, I am going to be playing a lot more. And I still have the ambition to get the title um, and to, um, you know, basically in chess, there's nothing else for me left to do. I feel like, I've, <laughs> I mean, in terms of I'm never going to be a 2700, I'm never going to be a 2600, but I do believe that I, I, I can be a, a grandmaster mm -hmm. and I, I don't, I mean, I've achieved a lot of other stuff, right? I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work with chess space and other companies. I've been a commentator and I've managed, you know, Fabiano Caruana. I've, I've done a lot in chess. Yeah. I'm yeah. coaching some very, uh, some very nice guys who are doing extremely well. So becoming a grandmaster is my only personal objective left. The last slide. Would you, if so, just in case. Yes. yes. If you wouldn't. <laughs> Lars is asking, will you then be a GM before Arne? <laughs> Because I I already have my quest done. I'm getting a grand becoming a grandmaster at sixty age of sixty plus, like, just like Larry Kaufman. So yeah, right. <laughs> that's a very good question. Now, if you for some reason uh, wouldn't become a grandmaster, yes, would this be like uh, very disappointing, or would you go like, hey, I, there's enough other beautiful things I've achieved, and that is uh, something. Which is okay. I mean, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, mm -hmm. but I do know that somewhere deep inside me, I would be disappointed because I didn't give it a real go. Good. Answer. Like I haven't done real work. I haven't properly studied yet. I haven't got a coach, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I, I feel like I haven't given it everything. And mm -hmm. if I got to where I'm at without properly working, then it does remain to be seen how far I can get if I really did work. The mm. only problem I've got is that I do have a day, you know, I have a day job, I have to earn money and I can't just study chess like a lot of, 
you know, strong uh, yeah. upcoming players. So finding that balance is difficult. That is difficult, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Magnus Carlsen himself said to me that I really need to get my GM time. <laughs> but no pressure, um, Lawrence. Sorry? I'm just saying, but no, ple but no pressure, no Lawrence. Pressure, no pressure, no pressure. Mark, Mark Leffler, he's here. I didn't Mark never Leffler ever expect here. that. Oh my goodness! There you go. The one of the stay stay in here, but uh, what a, what an interesting surprise. Now our schedule is a bit shaken up, to to be honest, because probably this was the whole mix up. It was the time thing, maybe. Okay. I But hope. I'm on for five more minutes. Yes, right? you're on for five more minutes, okay. Mark. Can you hear? Oh, and Larry also. Oh, no. It was the time. There was a time issue. Oh, God. Was there? The, oh, goodness. That is... Uh, how did that happen? How did that happen? I have to ask them. Larry. Can Hello. You, Larry, it's so nice Hi. to hear you. To... To tell you the truth, Larry and Mark, um, you 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 you're more than welcome. Lawrence Trent is also here in in the chat. We're four now. Uh, I was actually expecting you an hour ago. <laughs> oh, I thought it was about to be at one, and and but Mark said that the the, the converter the time set thing said it should be two because oh, of daylight time. No. Why well, I, oh, I thought he no. knew. It was probably it was really my fault. Hello, Mark, and hello, uh, Larry. Welcome to the show. Um, uh, Lawrence jumped in a little bit for you. So uh, in this case, um, Lawrence, I, I will say goodbye. Thank you so much. For, Thank you so for much, being guys. With us. Appreciate it. Yes. And uh, I wish you a lovely evening. And I hope we. Ha I don't know. You're playing the tournament, so let's see where we schedule our we'll, show. We'll message each other. Yep, yeah, exactly. For sure. Okay. Have a good evening. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, bye. bye. This was Lawrence Trent's Fritz trainer. And this is the Komodo 3. And I was talking a little bit. Uh, first of all, hello, Mark. And hello, Larry. Larry, do, do you want to put on the, the camera or? Uh... Oh, yeah. Hold, hold on. No worries. Uh, uh, this is, uh, what, well, what, a, what an, uh, I think it was my yeah. fault. I think it was my fault, Mark. I I messed it up completely, and Larry, I apologize massively. I thought I also sent a reminder like half an hour before, but uh, probably didn't reach or or I didn't. I wrote C E T, and it is C E S T. And uh, my colleague Pascal already mentioned to me, uh, you wrote C E S T, right? And I said like, well, it doesn't matter. Luckily. Because CEST and CET is the same. It's like in almost every country. Apparently not so. So I completely messed it up. Let's make the best out of this and talk a little bit about Komodo 3. You guys made it happen and I had it installed. Now I already told the story. I just had a riddle with uh, Lawrence Trent and uh, Komodo found it in a split second while a lot of other engines didn't. So how was your work? in the last uh, couple of months to make Komodo stronger than ever. Who wants to start? Go for it, well, Mark. <laughs> go for me. Well, um, it's it's sort of a team effort now where it used to just be Larry and me. We now have a, a team of several other programs that are helping. So we have a, a one guy devoted to just training the neural network. Uh -huh. So it uses this process, this thing called neural network UE, which neural network efficiently updatable And the little trick there, if you want to get a tiny bit into the weeds, is the first layer of the neural network is incrementally updated. And it's, and it's very simple. It just says uh, you, you turn on a bit if there's a pawn on a white pawn on A3 and a white king on uh, uh, E1. Mm -hmm. And then you do the same for all the pawns in the board. So it just pairs the king location and piece location. And of course, as you move pieces throughout the board, very few of those bits are going to change, just the bits for the piece you're moving. Um, and uh, because of that, you don't have to calculate all of these weights, oh, okay. these, these hundreds of weights for each of these inputs. Uh, and you just have to calculate the rest of the neural network. But that just sped up neural networks massively. Uh, so now we can have the tactical, deep understanding of the selective search that we do combined with uh, the black box that's in the neural network that thinks more like a human. But Larry would be better talking about... Uh, how much the evaluation 
acts more like a human understanding of the game than yes than older programs that just added up a bunch of numbers larry go for it yeah yeah so even though uh the the programs up until it, the nue versions even though they were uh handcrafted evaluation people who knew things about chess such as myself and others we contributed all these ideas to how to evaluate and yet the the neural network which doesn't have any real human involvement mm -hmm. ends up with a more human <laughs> evaluation because it it tries to figure out what actually works in games and it and it the big difference is the concept of similarity see a regular chess engine doesn't think in terms of similar either either a position or, or or a rule is exactly matching something else or it isn't it's a yes or a no but with neural networks the concept of similarity was introduced so mm -hmm. a neural network will say in similar positions you do this and therefore we should try to do this so because of that the the neural network is much more like a human i mean humans will typically think Oh, I've seen positions like this before, and you play knight f5 in this kind of position. Even though you haven't seen that exact position, mm -hmm. well, that's the way a neural network thinks. So the result is that the any program that's using a neural network will seem to be more human than a program that doesn't use a network, even though it doesn't have the, the human in, uh, input. Uh -huh. It's really ironic, but it, it's true, and it's very... It's very dramatically true, I would say. It's not just a little bit true. I mean, I, I want to add that there is human input in how you trade, train the neural network, what kinds of games you trade and train it on. For example, we did a long se sequence of training on ch chess 960 games. Larry and oh. we're very interested in odds tournaments because uh, people can't beat these machines anymore, right? But if you give them, you know, a rook odd or a knight odd or something, then, then people have a chance against these strong engine so we we played a lot of those kinds of games and trained it on it so i think that larry's expertise as a chess teacher is going to be even more helpful for neural networks in the future because he knows the kind of things like it doesn't understand this thing let's generate some positions so that it can get a better understanding of of you know why this particular feature and this past pawn situation is so important so, wow, okay. so there's a lot there's tons to do even though the machine's kind of doing it itself, doing a lot of its own training. There's still human input for search and other things. And there's still how how do you teach it? If you put a baby in the woods by itself, it would not, it might grow up to be able to eat things, but it really wouldn't understand the world. They were taught. And Mother Nature decided in evolution, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make babies stupid, but infinitely trainable. And I think that's what's happening in chess engines now is, 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 um we can't come up with all the rules of chess to to, to 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 squish larry's brain and squish it into a program is just not going to work there's too much information in there but now we have a way of doing it and it's the way that that you teach your kids anything so nice one and now i finally also get the point which was one uh, claim on the package let us is it okay we try to continue for for 10 12 minutes because uh, in the next schedule now Carsten Müller is uh, kind of outside already and he's awaiting to come oh, in sorry. but we can i was sure. talking a lot about komodo so i covered a little bit on my own and um i just wanted to ask you there is um one for all playing strength freely selectable between elo 1 and 3500 so I hadn't had the chance to play against Elo one now. How is this? <laughs> is this just? It is a bit for marketing, or is it something which you can actually, which is actually a real uh, thing, which you might go like, there is some truth in it. Well, yeah, I can I can talk about that because I've been mostly uh, working on that part mm -hmm. of it, the the, the uh, Elo levels. Um, so. Uh, it's very definitely the case that as you go down on, or up on the ELO setting, it it does raise or lower the strength by something like the proper amount. I mean, like if it's if you go from fourteen hundred to thirteen hundred, the fourteen hundred version should beat the thirteen hundred by a hundred ELO or so. 
Now, there seems to be some issue about how it translates with humans because my, my experience is that at the higher levels, everything is perfect, almost perfect now. I mean, if you set it for 2000 or 2200 or 2400, it's going to be a very good match at rapid. This is all, it's all calibrated for 15 minute plus 10 second mm-hmm. games. So if the hum, if you play it at that time control and, and your FIDE rating is 2000 or 2200 or whatever, it should be a pretty good match. I mean, we're not perfect, of course, but I don't think it's going to be off by as much as 100 ELO. Yeah. But as you go down further and further, there seems to be a little bit of an issue, which we which we don't fully understand yet, in that they're, they're actually too weak. In other words, a, a player with a 1,000 ELO will, will beat the, the 1,000 ELO setting on Komodo. And we don't quite know why that is, because based on playing against the levels against each other, they they should be about right. So there's something a little weird there. So the really really low levels, like you know, goes down to one. Well, actually, the, the setting of one is actually probably worse than <laughs> than a human with an elo of one, if you can even define what that would mean. But makes sense, of course, yeah. But they, they, we, the very low levels are very, very bad. That's that's correct. <laughs> Larry played lots of games against a grandmaster who volunteered his time to do this yes. in order to tune uh, the engine at his level. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're fairly confident, as he says, of, of the higher levels of how, of the accuracy of them. But, you know. Interesting. You, you, you Maybe don't people learn quicker than we think. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the thing we are also discovering every now and then. Um, if if uh, do you want to? You're not sharing the the grandmaster name, right? I mean, it's uh, oh, it's uh, Alex Slenderman. Al- oh, oh, excellent. Okay, wow. Okay, nice. So, um, to to have one one last question, or is there something? Actually, let me ask you the question. Um, do you want to point out uh, something else? Uh, besides that it is still one of the most human like uh, engines and it is becoming it became stronger than uh, ever before is there something else very significant which uh, also changed komodo 3 uh, dramatically or like in a bigger way than komodo 2 well yeah that, I, i can also point out that the the elo levels are much more human than the corresponding levels in older versions nice. because it's not just that the program has become more human but we change the way that we we define these lower levels in a way that makes them more human the the older komodo versions which had skill levels rather than elo settings uh they had a little bit of an issue that they were a little bit too weak in the in game relative to their the nominal elo letting setting And I think we've corrected that in this one. So it's people, the, the feedback at the higher levels is that they're they're pretty good simulations of humans of that rating. I mean, they're not perfect, but they're probably better than than what most other programs that try to do that sort of thing are able to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, pretty fascinating. Uh, you've played you've paid so much uh, time and uh, an effort into to making this happen um so komodo dragon 3 just came out um will there is there are you are you continuing with your journey will there and sooner or later be a komodo 4 and a komodo 5 and what do you think do you even have some plans for for something like that or do you say like well first we got this milestone now it is time to relax a little bit and see what's happening no we're 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 not uh, retiring yet uh <laughs> we we we've we've actually already made some real improvements even even since the release of komodo 3 believe it or not oh wow uh, amazing how how we keep making progress almost you know every week we do uh, Fantastic. so you know we're we're, we're both uh, not exactly youngsters but uh Well, as long as we're making good <laughs> progress, uh, we're we're not uh, we're not ready to uh, throw in the towel. No, <laughs> no, and no, you definitely uh, do not seem that uh, like that at any way. I mean, I, I earlier I mentioned uh, how we had our interview, Larry, where um, 
<laughs> Why, where did that come from, <laughs> Mark? Someone threw, someone threw in the towel. Oh, my. <laughs> okay, I got gotcha. you. Sorry, I didn't catch you immediately. So I just mentioned, Larry, um, I, I talked about our interview where we were talking about how the shogi was actually uh, some important and interesting part of your chess journey to becoming, yeah, the U.S. champion and the grandmaster at uh, the age of 60 plus. Um, and yeah, this is why, of course, you uh, definitely do not uh, want to retire even when the next 30, 40 or 50 years are passing in. So I don't know Mark <laughs> that well yet, but uh, I would actually love to have an interview with uh, both of you in one of the next week. I hope we can make this happen because there is so much to cover and it is such a fascinating theme and it is a very, very special engine after all. So um, I will write you very soon so we can make an appointment and uh, share it to the world out there. Would you be okay with that? Sure. Yeah. There we go. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm, I have to get cast now because he's already waiting and thinking, like, what is going on? When, <laughs> when is my time to turn up? Um, I'll be back in two minutes. If you want to say anything to the chess world right now, now is the chance. And if you have any questions uh, for, for Mark and Larry about Komodo 3, now you can answer it. I'll be back in two minutes. Uh, the stage is yours. Um, you can talk as much as you want to about something. I'll be back in a moment, okay? Okay. I do my break dancing. No, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> I'm not sure that anyone else is on here. So. Larry, do you have any uh -huh. questions? Uh, yes. Uh, how do you do all this magic? <laughs> Why do I do it? There's a, a magician. I don't know if I can do this or not. But So watch the pinky here. If I shake it enough, it'll actually go <laughs> away and it comes back. So the magician wrote a book called, uh, his name's Mayor Yated, called Finger Fantasies, in which he showed how you can make each of your fingers disappear. And and then he was in a terrible automobile accident years later, and he actually lost some fingers. In it. Oh, well, so be careful have, what you write uh, in the book. Let me quickly, um, <laughs> so let me put this up here. Oh, shit. And then we can continue. Here, large amount. Guys, thank you uh, for, for entertaining the thank audience you. for a short bit. Thank you so much for still uh, joining in. That was uh, really nice. We will have an interview sooner or later. And what's the time for you now? It is two, 11 minutes after 2 p.m. So, so, the, so the next 11. time I'm making an appointment with you, I will take care that I will have the times right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I learned my lesson now. Thanks for still coming right. in. It was such a pleasure. We keep in touch. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Oh. Now, with me uh, is in front of a huge pile of DVDs. Larry, you want you you still want to stay with us? <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's gone. Mr. Dr. Carsten Müller. Hello, Anna. Nice to have you here. So let us quickly uh, announce something for you guys. Thanks for waiting, for being so patient and being still with us. This is the player types, the four player types DVD made by Carsten Müller and Mr. GM Louis Engel. Now I will put this in front here, but as you might already know, Carsten Müller has made a couple of more Fritz trainers. I mean, uh, this is just a short selection of some of his works. And there's one thing. And uh, I have to tell you this anecdote. But first, I need to share you uh, the Carsten Müller DVDs because there is just so many in chat. Because if you will buy any Carsten Müller Fritz trainer, or even the whole collection. You will have the chance to uh, participate in a raffle of 25 euro, which you will get next week for the chess based shop. So if you ever wanted to get better in end games, now is the chance to get better in end games. Now, the anecdotes goes like this, I never told you. So once uh, in my life I said, uh, it was in Malta, and I said, um, 
I'm not that good in endgames. It's actually my weakness. It's my kryptonite. I'm actually scared if I will have endgames. And what did he answer? He said, like, uh, buy the first two Fritz trainers from Karsten Müller. That's all you need to know, and you will get all the basics done. And that was a powerful message, I have to say. Uh, I never did that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, I just have uh, to be honest bit, here. Uh, it spoils the story, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, nice. Uh, you can come a bit closer here, yeah, so you're a yeah, bit out yeah, of the yeah, shape. Yeah, so, anyway. And, and the 14th, by the way, also, I think, um, as some reviewers pointed out, the 14th Endgame DVD might also be an interesting starting point, the golden... What? guidelines so. oh interesting yeah it's not so the first two of course are very theoretical uh this the second the rook end games here and the first the other um, theoretical basic end games but the 14th i think might also be a good starting point if you want to start more practical i like this good game. addition thank With you the guidelines uh, and uh, more more pe more man on the board uh, not so theoretically heavily loaded Now, since we're at it, whoever gets a Fritz trainer from Carsten Müller now has the chance to win one original DVD from Carsten Müller now. I'm not joking. He signed a lot of copies and this can be actually yours. We will send them completely randomly. All of them are, I think all of them, all of them are English, right? Yeah, so all of them are for the international audience. Thank you for doing this, Carsten. If you buy anything from Carsten Müller in the next half hour, this is part of the raffle and you can get a Fritz trainer. Okay, advertisement over. No, no, it's running all the time. It's a, it's a Dauerwerbesendung, as you say, say in German. Carsten, we prepared something. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, gosh. See, the power of endgame magics makes everything um, fall. We prepared a couple of endgames, so let us uh, let us take a look at them. I will quickly share the screen because I just had this absolutely stunning um, puzzle Sorry, uh -huh. with uh, with Lawrence Trent, which he actually uh, could find out. It was beautiful, but uh, there is our little options here. So let me. How can I? Yeah, that is it. Exactly like this. I would like to cover everything, but it doesn't let me. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Well, hmm, that is, uh, of course, a bit unfortunate. But now I have a trick. We just could do this. Ah, so this is difficult. Okay. Okay. I will push this over. Sorry, guys. I'm. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I think. No, they, they will still see that. So there is a trick, right? You have to press on uh, book. There. That's it. That's all it needed. I will let you sit here, Carsten, and you have to explain us uh, what we are going to talk about here right now. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of my all-time favorite examples, also covered in uh, several DVDs, also on the Player Types uh, DVD, uh, Shiro Flottier from the Munich Grandmaster Tournament 93. I think it's a very good example for the guideline that opposite colored bishops favor the attacker. Mm -hmm. uh, I was Shiro second in the Tournament. This is an adjourned uh, position. White to Those move. Were the times. Yeah, old days. Oh yes. Do you know what? No. Do I remember this? I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah. It's. Oh. Man, I, I use it many times. With. Uh, yeah. It's in several endgame magics with Shirov. Um, with Shirov himself uh, together also, but also on DVDs. And it developed over the years. For 15 years, I had a wrong belief. For example. Okay, first white is threatening uh, mate, uh, so if black pauses or plays anything, then um, the game white is over. mates uh, in six moves, yeah? Oh, that I didn't count, okay. We take, how do we continue? I would say the king goes up, Yes. Uh, and then the rook to the side. And everybody the in the party, like uh, uh, in the middle game. Yeah. And But the difference from endgame attacks to middle game attacks, of course, is that often in the endgame the attacking king helps the attacking army. Oh, because, yeah, this has to happen. The king has to move there. Yeah. Against threatening double check mate. Only defense is here. Check. Oh. And now it's made in two. Because the rook will take. Yeah, four. and so the bishop uh, yeah. uh, uh, is safe and next move is made. 
Oh, I just saw a uh, king. Uh, rook takes g4, and I thought that was b. But the rook can go back no, to h3. No, no, no. If you play rook takes yeah. g4 check, I can play king uh, h7 uh, and and no mate. No, oh no! Mate. Why am I so bad? By the way, uh, no, Beto Betun from Guatemala says I'm a fan of Mr. Miller. Great to learn from your ending experience. Well, I, I can just uh, tell you it's uh, always a pleasure to have the endgame magic shows with this man here. Okay, so Black has three um, candidate moves to... Yeah, three main candidate moves. Okay. So, All three uh, draw, uh, but uh, it was not... No, but, yeah. Now it seems that all three draw, but for 15 years I believe that the game move w loses. Well, now I'm really curious. So, okay, three moves. Uh, you you suggest moves. Uh, okay, and for you at home, you can also suggest uh, a move. What is uh, what is a move suggestion for Black here to actually not uh, fall apart? Yeah, Black has two rook moves or a king move. Yeah, more or less. So, okay, then. Uh, now, this is the thing, of course, this is uh, what I just learned from the experience with our shows. Uh, one of the most not obvious moves is probably going to h8 with the king. Yeah, that would be losing. Oh, no! <laughs> that is not uh, not uh, playable. Oh. Then king uh, g6. Okay, f4. Uh, then your bishop is hanging. Oh, yeah, okay, so then not only, f4. So only move here. <laughs> and then you will be losing. Because here, yeah, it's an Alex. Too many pawns. Play. It's over. Black has no, um, no, yeah, no way to avoid um, losing the bishop and then losing the game. Okay. Well, so king h8 is losing. So king g8. It's king g8. It's a king move or uh, no other king move available. And two rook moves: rook h3 or rook d3. Okay. We can't uh, look at everything, of course. We can just. This was my main uh, contribution to Alexi's tournament. Victory, it, it didn't matter, of course. Yeah. But I found it quicker than him shortly <laughs> before the adjournment. Here, black is on the verge of losing and could play maybe bishop d3 or whatever. But rook d3 is a losing mistake. Oh. And it's not so difficult. You just have to keep uh, calculating. Jeez. How? Is yeah. it not so difficult? It's uh, not so difficult. No. King. Now, if the king moves, it gets difficult. So, so uh, rook. So terrible tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, but you already had a long. Um, no, but it started. Long, I long was, way I to was, go here. It was uh, even worse in the beginning. Anyway, uh, how about rook to d7? A uh, rook to e7, of yeah. course. Okay, if we win the bishop, we win. So black must take. And now three black men, we have one in exchange and we have the deep pawn, yeah? And, and three black men are hanging. Yeah. So we are winning, but of course, um, uh, 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 if black makes any move, we are technically winning. But g3 must be looked Difficult. at. Difficult. Uh, we cannot checkmate with king h6 because that was my plan before, right? No, it's not possible. Or is it, maybe? King what h is with king h6? Um, king g g8 Eight. yeah that and then uh yeah and then it checked but then the king goes to f8 doesn't matter actually where the king goes. yeah my pawns are very uh so what about dangerous. rook oh no that's not working that is not working yeah they are so dangerous and how can i so rook takes e4 g2 rook e1 F and now the king goes to H uh, to G. Oh, God, not to H. I I found and even Alexi had to smile in this. Uh, <laughs> in this oh, that is very beautiful. When we executed the line of the board, and as this was imp he also mentioned this in uh, Fire on Board, and in a way it was important for for him to win here and then the the tournament. But course from this moment on he was more confident that he had winning chances in the adjournment position. Wow. Look at the pawns on F and uh, G2. What a beauty. Very uh, nice. Has Very something, nice. yeah? Yes. Yeah. Alex, you also liked it. Okay. So, um, yeah. But we cannot look at everything here. So, um, in the game, Lottier played... Um, excuse me, this must be... The, in the game, Lottier played uh, King uh, G8. For 15 years, I thought it would be losing... Uh, the, during the adjournment, we thought it would, it would draw. Then, 
after some time later, I, for 15 years, I believed it would be losing. And then Klaus Dietermeyer called 15 years later. And then since then, I now think it also draws. But it is uh, a very uh, dangerous way to, to go there. Okay, white plays, like in the king h8, nine, king g6, of course. Mm -hmm. Only defensive move is bishop c6, because okay. king f8 comes bishop c5. And now um, one must play um, finally rook g. Well, it is a draw anyway, but best chance is rook g7 check. Alexi and I had prepared bishop c5. And here, uh, fortunately, um, Fritz Rie had uh, back those days. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yes, I remember. We had this in our advent calendar, this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here, the only black move is, is of um, course, and, and, but Alexi knew it and Fritz Rie had already found it and Lothier hadn't used the computer. It, it was in these uh, t times. Yeah, yeah, we had it in the, in the, in the quiz. Yes. Is it a is it, uh, rook move? To... No. No, it's no, if not. the rook move, you, you lose. Uh, Lothier, if the rook moves or lose, ah, Lothier played rook d3. I think it's king h8, yes. This is the only drawing move. Rook d3, then, yeah. We, I, mm. Then we had prepared to go back, and then Alexi had prepared to take, and here, um, now for 15 years, I believed that Rook c7 would be winning, and then Klaus Dietermeyer caught. Okay, the bishop has now, on first side, many squares, but uh, only two are probably sufficient to draw. Hmm. Um... Okay, the impossible to no, I don't impossible know. So to you. You have to show us, so yeah. we can also show some other examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to just just to get the point, Bishop, there or there, we can we can then move on to other examples, just to show the the point. Um, here with the rook, Bishop on e4, Bishop b6 would be winning directly. Mm -hmm. Now Bishop b6 is bad due to rook e3 check. So now it comes like this. And in oh, this gosh. this end game, I believed uh, for 15 years to be winning, and then by a court after the six-man table bases came and could be used by the engines in the search. And since then, I now think that it's most probably a draw. Wow! I've looked at also with Vincent Keimer and other juniors and computers table ba table base and so on and so on. Maya's analysis contained a few mistakes, but it seems like all are. Uh, all can be repaired and this should be a draw but one can see that king g8 this is not your everyday way to draw and bly white could try of course many things here to, mm -hmm. to let me ask you a question because i put in this uh, example and komodo 3 was the engine which uh, found it in a finger snip so i will ask this to um larry and mark when when i'm having an interview with both of them because i just i still have a couple of questions what what do you think um is it because it has table bases or is this, do you think there will be engines in a couple of years only, which will just like be so precise, even with end games that you just, yeah, yeah, all those table bases are not needed anymore because they're already integrated or does it take a long, long time until something like this is solved? It will take uh, a long um, time. Wow. And and you 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 can see at the moment there are these made and five hundred moves and whatever and you more we they cannot be solved in a in a second. Okay, okay. There will be more table bases, of course. Now they are creating the eight man table bases. They will they will yes. be coming and they are they are created at the moment and will be coming in uh, this year, the next year, and so on. And then they are available and can be used in the search and so on. And but uh, to here we have one, two, three, four. Uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, here, this is uh, yeah, too Unfair. many men. It of course there are table-based generators, and you could try to uh, or to limit uh, the options, and then make table-based generators. So this could potential. This could be done already now, but uh, you need a machine with a lot of hardware power. Let's look at another example. Uh, yeah, let me do this. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, which one do you want to? Um, yeah, which, which DV, uh, ah, this was, uh, 
Um, which um, DVD do we want to look at? The, the World Cha- and Games of the World Champions, uh, yeah, or the Kasparov DVD? Yeah, then, 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 Dan Isle of Kasparov. Yeah. We had a guy it's- already called Kasp- uh, Gary, and this guy called Gary did some uh, interesting things, and yeah, so let's keep it on with that, Mister Silvio Dinalov against Gary Kasparov. What happened? Oh, he was young, my goodness, under 20 in Dortmund, 1980. Yeah, World Junior Championship in Germany. Just yeah, it was, was a year uh, old. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it is on the chess base um, Masterclass Kasparov uh, DVD for oh. Masterclass I did the end games and on the uh, best end games of the world champions um, DVD uh, the the second DVD. all in the link I sent in the cha- uh, chat so if you want to take a look at it if this guy called Gary is somebody who you really like uh, how about you take a look at that yeah I by the way think that Bobby Fischer is the in a way, uh, best player of all time, if you consider many things, and Kasparov Ooh. is my number two. Uh, but, if he, but not uh, best doesn't mean that uh, that um, only uh, only a chess, but looking at it a bit slightly more broadly at the imp- impact um, the world champions or the player had on uh, the chess uh, world well, as a whole. And Bobby already started uh, chess boom. Uh, you barely got the curve with that, <laughs> Carsten. Gary, if you're watching this, it's okay. He's your second favorite player, so it's fine. <laughs> I think that means. Of course, something. yeah, Kasparov was, was yeah, yeah, d- uh, definitely. And, and um, from the yeah number of games and achievements and so on and so on, but Bobby sta- stopped, of course, playing after uh, or yeah, yeah, almost stopped then because but- Bobby played on. And so from, from seen from that point of view, Gary would be above Bobby, but. Uh, Considering all aspects, uh, then uh, yeah, Bobby really started his chess boom around the world. True, of course, no doubt about that. Who was the better endgame player? <laughs> oh, oh, tough question or easy? No, that's um, that's tough. There, I maybe uh, Magnus Carlsen might be already an option. Oh, okay, but between Gary and uh, Fisher? Uh, Gary and Bobby. Ah, okay, yeah. that's of course again. Uh, yeah, that's of course uh, <laughs> an unsolvable question. That's For another a time. way unsolvable. They have slightly different styles, by the way. Also, I think yeah, mm-hmm. Bobby is a pragmatic, and Gary is an um, active whist. And of course, I'm especially as pr- impressed with Gary's. Uh, Qualities, the handling of the initiative, the attack, the dynamics of a position, and so on. There, he of course was absolutely outstanding. So, if yeah, you would look yeah. at that, then then of course Gary is the activist number. If you would look at this, uh, Gary would be a clear activist number one. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, yeah, Magnus yeah. Magnus yeah, reflector yeah. and Bobby pragmatic. So there, there we would uh, yeah look at it from another perspective. I have to throw in, if you just go like, wait, 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 what is he talking about? What is a pragmatic? What is an activist? What is a theorist? What is all of this? Well, this is really interesting. We made a, a series. We were talking about all the different player types and made a conclusion after that. Check it on the Chessbase News site. Yeah, can can even be viewed on the on the news site yeah. uh, so to get a first uh, impression. And if you have, want to have more uh, material information on the business, then you can... You know what to do. You know what to do. Okay, (laughs) jokes aside. So let's get into the endgame juice here. Yeah. Right? um, Yeah. This uh, is a typical King's Indian exchange or endgame. Gary here played a very uh, good uh, endgame. This is, of course, okay. Here, Black has uh, several uh, main moves. Yeah, this is a sideline, but a poisonous. long, of course. Yeah, it's a poisonous sideline. And here. uh, Castle Long, of course. Ulf Andersen has played some some games with it. This is quite an interesting uh, end game approach. Okay, okay. But we wouldn't be looking at it, of course, if here. <laughs> this is a uh, this is um, inaccuracy because here it, it costs too much time and the bishop pair is not so uh, valuable here mm-hmm. because white uh, the light square bishop is a problematic um, piece. I understand. Okay, here. Um, yeah, and here comes already another very big moment. Um, yeah, very, very decisive moment in a certain way. What to do uh, with Black to stop Kasparov's um, dark square power play and to change the course of the game and to play stuff. into the hands of White's um, bishop um, pair? <laughs> 
That that was a long sentence, Carsten. So, um, taking on e5 is definitely not a, a good option. So, to cut a long story short, uh, um, yeah, if you take on e5, then I'll take on e4, and then too many men are hanging, yeah? Yeah. Now everybody is hanging in your, your camp. Uh, yeah, I thought about bishop e3. Yeah. But then it doesn't help because after in which, F3... In which, in which moment? In directly, yeah. Bishop e3 is right. Bishop oh, e3, you are right. Oh, Bishop e3 is... You are absolutely right. right. Here. Well. Yeah. And to, yeah, the pawn, because the pawn is not important. Yeah. Uh, but white needs uh, initiative for his... Uh, of course, difficult to play against uh, Kasparov and so on. Probably. But white needs um, options for the, for the man. Uh -huh. And here, white has some common. It would have been a much, much better option. Counter. Nice yeah, counter, it's it's yeah. It, black is slightly better, but it's not much. It's almost equal. I mm -hmm. yeah, maybe the yeah you can ask what was the Komodo Dragon three things. <laughs> maybe it's already <laughs> e in the eyes of these already engines. Done. It might already, already be equal. I I don't know. <laughs> the these bishop pair evaluations they vary a lot from the old engines to the newer. Yeah, the bishop pair is especially how to say a topic in interesting. Um, Topic, topic for, on the, own, yeah. for the evaluation of the engine and the development of, of the uh, engines. Oh, interesting. You, can ask, so. you could ask um, the, uh, Mark and, um, and, uh, and Larry. Larry, yeah, Larry Kaufman, Mark Leffler about yeah. this. If you have any questions about endgames for me, well, we can, uh, you can tell me. I would like to. Okay, that's a very expert. big mistake. The wrong exchange. I thought about this too, yeah. Because um, opposite color bishops here have nothing to do with a draw. This is mm -hmm. just one of the myths. This is completely wrong. Pure opposite color bishop endings have a very large draw efficiency. That's right. But when more pieces are on the board, they favor this the attacker or the side with the initiative. Okay. And here, of course, it's black because black uh, yeah, white pawns e4 and c4 are both white, while uh, the pawn is still here, and this makes a big, big difference. And all and the dark squares are still open. Okay. So now black has an almost decisive advantage and Kasparov plays it really very uh, instructively, bringing the bishop, uh, preparing to bring the bishop to greener pastures. Oh. Yeah, Kasparov really plays it very, very instructive. And, Sometimes when uh, Kasparov is on a roll, he's just unstoppable. Yeah. Um, what now? It's a, it's a, it's a more Karpov move, by the way. But <laughs> Karpov, Karpov can also do can also play that uh, kind of style. He played so many later, so many games against Karpov. <laughs> yes, so but probably, this was earlier, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what to do here with Black? Interesting moment. Two approaches: a typical Kasparov well, approach or the move played well, in the um, game. Or the, the dangerous Kas Kasparov approach looks to me as if it's a uh, rook to d3, but that is very, very, very dangerous. Rook probably. to d3. Yeah, that's a bit uh, of. Uh, I, I, I don't like that so much. It's a bit of, I mean, you know, mixing, mixing both. You can, you can do it, but yeah. it's mixing all the words. It's not really. Some, it's not a clear idea. Okay. Yeah, yes, you. yes, yes, hmm. yes, yes. So, what about. H five, G five, G four. Uh, coming, coming later. Later, okay. So then I'm uh, at the end with my knowledge. Pity. Uh, excuse me. Here yeah, first, this came, but um, this is uh, what I wanted to, to have. Knight D three. Yeah, this is a very instructive moment. Wow. Um, threatening. Yeah, and threatening knight before yeah. check. And the typical the typical Kasparov approach, by the way, would be more like B five and opening more lines and play oh. attack dynamics and so on. But uh, this, of course, is better because White has no yeah what to do with with White. Well, A three. Yeah, and then we just go back, and oh, you and can't. And then we have B three. Nice. And you can't mm, play uh, A three A two. Yeah, it's, it's more like a cup of style, reflector quality, yes. yeah, cup of style of play by Kasparov. Yes, yes, yes. I now understand what you. And now you are uh, now you are uh, coming, of course, uh, and now you are slowly. of course you are you. So you were right after all, but uh, this is a Kasparov uh, approach, of I'm, course. I'm a GM soon after all. At the age of sixty plus, we already figured that out. So while this uh, knight d3 is more a cup of uh, reflector 
approach to yeah. w force Y to weaken the pawns and this uses now the moment tactically in typical Kasparov manner and so um, yeah we can he can <coughs> use it and um, then all this is ooh, just as, ooh. I think this is, this should be just a simple line by me I I, I think here the game was really the game uh, I okay, think okay. was already resolved the game was right yeah, yeah. okay well, fairly interesting. Yeah, the Masterclass series is a very, very nice um, uh, series, actually, after all, because um, you always want to read about the old uh, the historian chess classic people. But now, we, yeah, we have the DVD series for you to replay and play and learn about. Because I had so many teachers of mine who were saying, like, uh, you have to study the, the old games too. It's very, very important for a lot of reasons, right? And yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with that. With a masterclass series, it's an ideal uh, method to do it. Do we have an example of the four player types? Not not precisely here. So would... um, yeah, we can we can yeah. uh, we can take uh, Karts and Karana. Yeah, this again two... from the Karts and. Um, DVD, the endgame is Rook and same colored bishops could be called Carlson endgame and he shows <laughs> reflector um, qualities here and it's in Karana as a pragmatic so it, it would fit also to, yeah, it's on, on the Masterclass Carlson DVD, it's on the DVD um, of the endgames of the world champions and also on the player types DVD. So we, we, we how to say in English and German, yeah, we, we hit many... Uh, <laughs> Many stones. Uh, uh, yeah, in English, in English, probably it doesn't work, but, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> I have to just quickly remind you: in around five to six minutes, we have a special guest coming up, if he's coming, <laughs> but probably so. I'm I'm very confident for just fifteen minutes because he barely made it, and he said like oh, I would like to join, and so we said like of course. So also just for you to know, um, and also for you to stay and look at our secret guest because. It's going to be a lot of fun too. So, definitely. Anyway. I've also done an endgame magic already with, with him, but okay, we will. Oh, you know it already, right? Yes, okay. And I played with him already. So. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. we even analyzed uh, our game, okay, uh, one, of our, one of our games <laughs> in the endgame magic show. But okay. now I think I've given enough hints for you. <laughs> and he's a good dancer. No, okay, that's enough now. Okay. Now it's more than enough. So, okay. what, what God, to do? The, the deep insight is here. How good this, what, what is quite deep, yeah? How mm -hmm. would you evaluate, why to move? How would to evaluate this position is is equal but, or what what do you think at very first sight well it looks very equal to yeah. me of course yeah and i think it's a deep reflector quality of magnus that he no must have felt on <laughs> no that he that he knows that why is much better <laughs> yeah okay. this already i think is a reflector yeah. quality and i think one of the one of the points is of course the king the white king is better, yeah. but that's e that even I can see. <laughs> you, you all need special reflective so, qualities for that, I, yeah. I, I think. But of course, you're right. But I think what is what is more okay, more reflector like is that this difference in the bishops is so big. Here. Okay, so the white one has a perfect spot, is very active, has all, everything they they need. So he wouldn't. And this makes probably... a really very 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 big difference. Okay, and white has only one move to. And this all this shows that it's also about initiative, of course. It's, okay. It's not... Now, no, it cannot be. <coughs> the so, only but, move. But is... you don't take on b six, which. No, is... no, then we wouldn't yeah. be looking at it. That also wouldn't be a reflector quality for us. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Okay, now I have an idea, if I may. I'm I'm just guessing. Rook takes e eight check. Oh no. No, it's no, no. You and are. Then I would have taken with my rook on b six. No, no, no. You are not a, you are an active you are an, you are a hopeless activist. <laughs> oh, the, the pain okay, this pain. I take that back but no, it is a typical it's, activist it's correct. position but it uh, it's a typical activist position but it doesn't it doesn't okay. it just doesn't work. Okay, okay, okay. So you have to tell me then please. Um only Oof. only <laughs> I would have never ever ever found that. Yeah, okay, but well, unbelievable. Okay, I think the ref big reflector quality is the assessment that white is so much better. That is a big reflector. Yeah, yeah. Finding rook e4, well, I, it's possible, I think. even Would be even for me possible. 
But okay, to see that white is that much better is already not so easy for me. I, I have to make some explanations for, for me and some knowing uh, that's a computer and going deeper and only then. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I would also think that white is slightly better, but it's not, nothing real. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, it's already the question where Karana made the mistake is also, I can't Unclear. even... Unclear. It's unclear. I can't answer it. It's also our typical reflector, uh, typical reflector um, quality. Yeah. And so a G6 might already be a losing. It might might already be. Oh, there, there he is coming, Mr. Chris. <laughs> Lord. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, you can, uh, Chris. We 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 are done in a couple of minutes. Uh, stay tight. We we're we're with you in a moment. Okay. If you no problem. Use, I don't. I cannot hear you at the moment because I don't have my headphones on. But just uh, so you know. But uh, okay, where G where are we? There we are. Okay, G6 is a. Uh, <laughs> okay, G6 is a mistake. We don't know if we're losing or not. But it's also yeah. It's a but it, Karana played it and it doesn't look so bad after. Yes. Okay, so typical uh, theorist move to fix the weaknesses behind. So. I thought they would double up the rooks, but no. <laughs> no, 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 not near. Okay, this is another inaccuracy, maybe losing mistake, I don't know, but it's, uh -huh. it's, it's defending this is next to impossible anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. And then typical way to put the pawns. Yeah, this would be theorist uh, approach. My goodness. How can you? How can? Ah, yeah, you? here comes another. But this is here also. You would also play. Yeah, it's activist. Uh, activist. Finally, a move style. I would like to play. Yes, truly. Oh, but no, oh gosh, I would. This, this, yeah, this. and um, then comes another um, moment where um, how? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, how to continue? And this is a typical reflector move. Uh, Again, yeah. Okay. It's a typical. We are playing against two weaknesses. Uh, in German, it's called Lavieren against uh, two weaknesses. Okay. Uh, and often the attacker can shift the forces more quickly than the defender from one wing to the other. And here, Rook B1 is a typical example that White can shift the attack further, and Black has more problems to defend um, the King uh, side. Yeah, here one uh, beautiful line would be like this. Yeah, not coming, of course, but. <laughs> Gee, you're yeah, pushing it, it away. It's, oh. it's really. When Magnus does it, you know. <laughs> oh my god, the rook is gone. <laughs> it's so crazy. Typical reflector quality also to dominate the opponent's pieces. Yeah, active prophylaxis, um, domination restrictions, strategies, uh, typical um, qualities of reflectors. Please, guys, if you are a bit interested about something which sounds similar to this, this is your last chance. Get it. You still have 15 minutes left to be part of the raffle, which we are having right now. Get the four player types. I, I, I'm, I'm almost certain it's going to be uh, very, very interesting and informative for you. Okay. Yeah, let's take a uh, look at the winning uh, line here. Yeah, that was the game. Mm -hmm. And here... Um... Resulted now G5 would be more tenacious, but also losing this already is losing. Modern engines also give already very high. Gosh. Plus. And what now? How did Magnus convert now? And uh, hint is he could Im immediately in the end say, I didn't have to calculate anything. I knew it was always winning because it is from Fischer Keres from my great predecessors. Magnus know everything by heart, of course. Bishop E5. No. <sighs> then I don't know. <laughs> F6. And then oh we we just trade um, we the take, yeah, 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 yeah. we just ah. trade uh, <laughs> now of course not bishop takes um, takes the pawn because then we have the we have the we have the wrong rooks uh, but I don't get into the but okay it doesn't matter maybe it's maybe it doesn't matter yeah. Chris also wants to, to come, so... Yes, yes, he, yes. But yes. We, we don't take... We just don't take the pawn because we must play king b5 anyway, and now we can always play c4 to secure our c pawn because the a pawn, of course, is the wrong rook's pawn. <laughs> and this is yeah. already... And yeah, here he we, doesn't even take because... Here he we, we, of course, don't play c5 because... That would be fatal. Then we would have a draw. And here, of course... Um, Magnus knew that it was always winning because he had studied all F Fisher's 60 memorable games and knew everything by heart. And this is known from Fisher's win against um, Paul uh, Keres. Nice. Ah, oh, what a beauty, guys! Uh, you 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 know the deal, of course. 
end games is it's so important and every week you're having an end game magic show every single week and everything is being repeated and it is going to be calculated and there's new interesting and fascinating things and it's it never ends it never ends to amaze every time i'm uh, cannot keep my mouth shut because i'm so like what the heck Carsten, thank you for being with us live in the studio this was uh, a pleasure a joy uh, you still have 15 minutes left, but now I will uh, take uh, advantage of our guest, Chris Ward. Hello, Chris. Uh, nice to see you, Chris. I have to put on my headphones to, to okay, hear then, you. Yeah, I will. I will and we have to swatch. Uh, we switch. have to switch and I will leave uh, and you have Chris. And yeah, it was nice to to meet you. Have a nice <laughs> show and I will, I will leave. <clears throat> Thank you, Carsten. Best <sighs> greetings to, to Chris. Uh, so, Chris, um, okay. greetings, nice greetings to you from Carsten, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Thank you, can you hear me? Are you okay? Though? I can hear you loud. Fantastic. We meet again. We meet again. Finally. It's been far too long. It's been far, far too long. So, um, ladies and gentlemen at home for you, just quickly. Chris Ward is here. This is his only Fritz trainer at the moment it is called i have to read it because it's a long text sicilian dragon the real deal part one understanding the dragon that is absolutely correct well read so yeah. essentially the idea was um I, I can't remember how far it was pre-pandemic i came over there to hamburg and i um i filmed that in the studios yes um with the intention of that being part one of course as it says and in the first part we talked about themes and ideas you remember we had a little chat in actual fact about it the, was one about of the, the most favorable interviews we ever had on the show to be honest so brilliant and i just talked about general dragon ideas the power of the dragon bishop the, the pawn break d5 the c file all the useful things that all dragon or potential dragon players need to know yeah. in order just just have because what happens is you can learn opening theory, but there's always going to be a stage where you're on your own and you think, what am I supposed to do next? And that is when you fall back on your ideas and your plans and your themes and your tactics that you've picked up and you go, yes, I've got a checkmate here. I've never seen this exact position, but I remember the pieces are in the right squares. Let's go for it. That's checkmate. So that was good. That was it. That was the, the ideas <laughs> understanding the dragon. Now, hopefully, People have understood the dragon by virtue of that DVD. But, but now everyone wants to know, yeah, that's all very good. But what about the actual theory? How do I get to these positions? And this is where we move on to part two. Ooh, 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 what's going on? Tell so us what's more. Going, what's going down is just literally <laughs> two or three weeks ago. I can't remember. I got yeah, in track. A couple like of weeks that. ago, literally a couple of weeks ago, I was over there again, very pleased to hop on a plane get over, get out of my country. Not there's anything wrong with my own country, of course, <laughs> but just to get abroad and uh, travel. And it was great to see the folks at the uh, the Chess Pacer uh, uh, studios, the, the the warehouse there. And that's where I would, you know, spent quite a lot of time in the studio, in actual fact. And where not I'm sitting, home. actually, to be yeah, precise. Where, yeah. And that where you are. You know, I actually, funny enough, I've been a bit naughty because I have got one of those chess based backgrounds are here and I could conceivably have done the filming, at home, but it wouldn't have been the same not seeing <laughs> Pascal and the guys, of course. And of course, it forces me to do I have that extra motivation. So here was the idea. Part two was all about, well, an actual fact, the title of it, I think, a touch wood, is called The Dragon Past, Present and Future, where oh, I delve goodness, into the theory. Fantastic. I have to say, yeah, with regards to the future thing, I'm slightly concerned because truth be told, if I could predict the future, future I probably would be better served going out buying lottery tickets or something <laughs> like that. But, but, but of course, I want to keep people happy. And if people are going to enjoy these DVDs, then all the better. So in it, I basically talk about, I do delve into the variations and discuss the lines which used to be played and not maybe played so much more, what's going to be happening and the way I see theory going so far I, that's you know like you say my crystal ball may be correct it may be completely rubbish but the fact is i do because i um i do this chess publishing website where i have to look at dragon games played around the world every month Jeez. essentially i can often see the trends and i can see which variations are being played more and which moves are appearing um and the good news is for the dragon this is my conclusion the good news is 
Well, obviously, the good news is it's still playable, very playable as an open. <laughs> but there's always new ideas coming. Once upon a time, there was always the fear that Dragon Theory would be, that's it, sorted, it loses. If you learn <laughs> all this variation, you can win, or it's just a dead draw or whatever. But there's new moves being found all the time. And what I also have found, this, this, I find this incredibly difficult, but when I have to annotate games between supercomputers yeah. playing the Dragon, I think, well... I can hardly st stick on an engine, can I, <laughs> to, to double check the analysis, can I? So obviously I have to use my, uh, but, but I love the way they sort of, they have the databases of games available for humans from the last 50, 60 years. And they yeah. go, well, if it's all the same with you, we'll just play our own moves, thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Ignoring what we've created and coming up with new moves. And it is really, it's <laughs> crazy. So there are literally new, new lines cropping up all the time in the dragon. And essentially what I tried to do is I've covered, well, you know what, pretty much everything. Pretty much everything I would say I've covered. I can't say, I mean, Peter Heine and Nilsson did one of your Fritz trainers in the Dragon going back a few years, and he was yeah. deep, deep, deep in yes. lots. Of, I can't claim to have gone as deep as that in the, all the variations. I've tried to put a bit of understanding there, but I have given moves. There is no doubt about that. And the main emphasis has been on the currently fashionable lines and where they're heading rather than old theory in general. But I have tried to address why maybe some lines aren't played so much, or if people want to, want to reinvigorate old lines, where they might want to look in order to bring uh, bring life back into them. So that's called the right. second part, the dragon, past, present, and future. Love it. Sounds yeah. like a movie, and it is. The thing is, and I think uh, you at home, if you, uh, I mean, I probably, you know Chris, of course, right? Who, who, who actually doesn't, who knows some British <laughs> chess players. So let's let's face it as it is. And uh, this, it sounds a bit like a movie title. And uh, watching your Fritz trainer, your first one, yes, it is a bit like a, it's a little bit like a, it's a very nice comedy, and it's a very intelligent one too. I am, I, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that you are one of the most uh, entertaining Fritz trainers out there. So um, it's just a pleasure to to watch uh, you talk about the things. <laughs> Besides. Being absolutely precise and having loads of expertise, um, it's uh, yeah. I saw it's a high recommendation from my part. You still have at home uh, five minutes left because uh, you are taking part in a raffle. You get a twenty-five oh. euro voucher if you get uh, the Fritz trainer from Chris Ward oh. in those next five minutes. Uh, it's wow. the chance to win twenty-five euro. I would say it is a little bit of a wow. It's true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, it's uh, I'm very, very looking forward to this. Uh, it's yeah, it has to be in every collection of every Sicilian player anyway, even for so, the non-Sicilians. Yeah, like well, I mean, it? I mean, essentially, I suppose it is pretty much from a black perspective in, yeah. in terms of, but of course, white players are going to find it quite useful. I talk about particularly why certain lines aren't playable and maybe white players might want to see that. Um, and who knows, they might be converted and decide that this is the opening for them. If, you know, E5 gets a bit boring or, you know, the French defense, they're doing the exchange variation or whatever you think, I need something radical. Okay, it doesn't address the anti-Sicilians, which is a little bit of a problem in life, of course. But it's a, the only thing I would say is that I went over there to Hamburg and I did do the filming, but ended up being a bit more to it than I was hoping and <laughs> loads of stuff. And I, I'm not going to lie, I worked quite hard over those two, three days that I was there. Mm. So we've got hours and hours. So it might be over two volumes, but I can tell you pretty much everything is covered and there is a lot in the dragon, essentially. And I'm, I'm, what I'm basically trying to say is I do like to think that I bring enthusiasm to my kind of things. I'm not necessarily... You know, 12, in the 12th hour, maybe I wasn't quite as enthusiastic as in the first minute, but I tried my best, essentially. <laughs> hey, you know what? I feel a little bit for you. It's my fifth hour starting uh, very soon. And, well, uh, there you go, you see, and you, you've still got a smile on your face. I, I'm through. still very pumped and hyped. So, uh, yeah, I'm even looking forward for the last hour. I'm To be absolutely truthful and honest, I'm almost, almost sad it will end very soon. Oh, nice. So I'm going, but yeah, it's it's okay don't pity me too much so um 
I'm I'm looking forward to reenact this in November. Did you say how I just said this? I, I, my, I'm losing my speech. Uh, my reenact mind. this. <laughs> my does that, what does that? How I see. How, what does that mean exactly? You reenact. We will we will have this uh, kind of live stream again. I'm pretty certain right, about okay. this because uh, okay. a lot of people for you at home still staying here. It's uh, almost 50 people. Thanks for being uh, so tough and rough and being with me and all my guests here for all this long time. And you got this little special treatment by <laughs> Mr. Chris, GM Chris Ward. Now, I'm not uh, sure whether I've learned a lot from this particular few minutes, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. The people will... Uh, uh, You know, it's also it's always also a type of person who is there and who is explaining something. And some people uh, like it when there's like this goes this and this line is that and this is this. But the others also want to have like a story around it. And uh, it, you are this uh, perfect example of combining this. And you may even even made a big sacrifice by coming here because uh, you were uh, you're still missing out the first minutes of the Liverpool game. I Well, yeah, I will be catching up. I will be catching up on that. Don't worry about that. Uh, oh, there, look, we're joined. We've got more. more we've joined. got more people here. Marcus Rugger is joining the stream. And uh, do, Am I, am I going to get to find out who won my uh, Fritz Trainer video? Do, I will, I do I will let you round? know. I will Because, let you know, of course. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining in so spontaneously. And... Um, So, one last question. Yes. Who's Liverpool playing against now? Sorry. They're playing Southampton at home today. So, and what is your score prediction? Well, uh, they've changed their team. They've changed nine. They've only kept two players from their winning FA Cup team. They have to win to have a chance of winning the league. And maybe they can get the quadruple. But it's not a big chance. I'm not going to lie to you. So. Whoa. Wow. Okay. I, I appreciate your honesty with that. Still, I'm uh, crossing the fingers that uh, your team will win. And uh, as always, Chris, it was a super joy having you here. I uh, hope to see you in Hamburg soon enough again. It would be a pleasure. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye. Chris. And welcome to the show, Marcus Raga. Wow, look at this. I'm just uh, realizing one blue DVD. Another blue DVD and two more. That is your... I cannot put it here like this. I will just put one. The volume number one. Power openings. Grunfeld Defense Volume 1 and 2. And it has hours and hours of content about this very, very particular opening. Now, for you at home, as you know the how the game is working, I will post the link of uh, Marcus Raga's DVDs into the chat if you get one of his Fritz trainers right now then you automatically take part in the raffle you can win a 25 euro uh, voucher for the chess base shop next week um, just get the Grunfeld if you ever thought about hmm should I get the Grunfeld hmm should I get something from Marcus Rugger now is the chance Marco, sorry for talking so Thank you for having me. And then not like you have a chess chair. It is black and white. Is this on purpose? Uh it's not on purpose, but it was actually recommended to me on uh by Grandmaster Hari Krishna. So <laughs> we are not only in contact for openings, it's also like <laughs> which chair is best. How and he cool claims that? that also Firusha has the same chair, at least it looked like in the oh. So I thought that should be the chair to to work on chess to record my DVDs that that's when to he play sold, occasionally. Yeah, yeah, that's when he kind of uh, sold sold you this. Chair. But uh, he's not selling these chairs to you, is he? <laughs> he says like, well, Ali Reza Firuja has this chair too. Um, Marcos, please tell us a little bit. Uh, first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing great, yeah. Oh, It's... that's excellent. Okay. It's busy time, but it's always, always yes, nice. Yes, and still you made it happen. I really appreciate it that you took the time, although you have a lot to do. I, I know about this, and um, uh, not for a reason. You are by far the strongest uh, Austrian uh, grandmaster. H have you, uh, you, you were in the 2700s already, right? To I was, yeah. Yeah, excellent. I okay. crossed uh, like maybe two, three times. I spent a lot of time in the 2690s, 80s, let's say like this. And you're still so. kind of there. So I, I want to have an interview with you and talk about you uh, and uh, all the Fritz Trainer stuff and all of this uh, particular in, in, on another day. But for now, um, what, 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 uh, this is... Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, here. Um, 
Hi again, does the same, this is from Anti Burnout Tours. You're still in, thanks for joining. Hi again, does the same apply as before? I just purchased Kraftvoll Eröffnen, Grünfeld Indisch Band 1 and 2. Today, just a few minutes before I learned about the raffle. May I take part again? Thanks, Anti Burnout Tours. You seem to have bought a lot of Fritz trainers and I grant you the permission. You're part of the raffle, of course. Thank you for asking. Markus, why Grünfeld? Is this something which you always enjoyed or played or do you just have the overall knowledge to be very precise with this opening uh i've been playing the greenfield i think for i started maybe 10 years ago wow okay and at some point it really became sort of like exclusive weapon and it's also like occasionally i change because somehow nowadays it's forced i mean you need to vary in the opening you cannot stick with one opening, it's it's very tough when they exactly know what to prepare for. But I'm really I'm really in love with the Grünfeld. Yeah, it's my favorite opening. It's a nice. So, um, have you ever heard of uh, Matthias Deutschmann? He's a cabaretist from Germany. Yeah, and he speaks very similarly about the Grünfeld Indisch. He says it is one of his favorite openings, and I was like, "Oh wow, that's interesting." He also likes the King's Gambit, so it is. Um, he's he's the voice of uh, Fritz, yeah, or he was at some exactly point. Exactly yeah? correct. You 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 have made your homework, sir. Yes, that is correct. No, yeah. that, that I uh, like I'm... from many years ago. I remember, yeah, when. <laughs> Yes, it when is. I was using the fritz with the voice on, and then at some point I read that. <laughs> exactly like that, yeah. And I'm having a show with him uh, uh, every two weeks, and he's talking about some history. And he always, he always uh, teams uh, tends to show some openings of the old uh, games or some, yeah, even recent games. And often enough, because he knows the opening so well, the Grünfeld Indisch is part of this scenario. May I guess in, in your show, then you probably also mentioned that it's the 100th anniversary this year. It was played in uh, 1922 by Ernst Grünfeld. No way. No, this isn't. That is. Okay, guys. So if you don't get this freaking Fritz trainer now, it's really the chance for you. Do you have anything uh, prepared for us so you can invite us and show us a little bit about the Grünfeld? Yeah, I can. Uh, can I already share the screen? I will share the board, I guess. Yeah? You would be uh, more than invited to share the screen, yes. And I will put our uh, video. Oh, wow, look at this. Well, you already, you already know what you're doing because this looks very, very good. So let, us, let me put us on the side here like this. Okay, yeah, so we're touching the board. So, yeah, the Greenfelds, go, go ahead. I will drink a bit. I need some water. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the Grünfeld defense, basically, it's it's after knight c3, d5. But of course, we also have to, I mean, it's also covered in the DVD, like what happens if white starts with knight f3, what if white starts with, uh, okay, I can make the moves, why not do? <laughs> to, with knight f3 to stay in Grünfeld, Indian uh, matters, or let's say after g3, how to react there, or after f3. Well, and, I covered it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like from basically from this position, I covered, I think, every single move, even the yeah, <gasps> the most stupid ones. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. If I'm, if and, I'm really fully f committing to something, I actually, uh, to be honest, I'm doing the same. I'm all, going f all in with everything. Nice. But okay, nowadays it's really, I mean, it's changing. Yeah, like few years ago, I mean, H4 was considered a ridiculous move, yeah? And that, yeah. And probably 20 way. years ago, the people would have said, okay, you play C5, and uh, then you play the Penko, you want tempo up, you're almost almost winning, sort of. Yeah, what did I do, yeah? <laughs> and nowadays, with computers, things are tough, and even against a move like H4, it became sort of a main line, and you have to be very seriously prepared, yeah? My goodness. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. I know that uh, H4 became quite popular. Yeah. But that it is like, uh, yeah, well, it makes sense, obviously. Yeah. I mean, there are many versions of this H4, but what I wanted to, I mean, I was thinking, what should I show from, uh, from my Fritz trainer uh, DVD? And I thought I will check a bit like what has happened since the time I finished 
recording since the time I finished publishing. Yeah. And were there any of the good ideas have you been played at some <laughs> at some level? And it happened. And some of them happened and like I will start with one very interesting uh, point because it's candidates is coming up and it was very important game for the qualification for the candidates. Okay. So this was uh, <coughs> the game was um, between Rapport and uh, Vasile Graf in the Fide Grand Prix. Okay. And Vasile Graf is probably the biggest expert in the Grünfeld defense. He plays it on the highest level. But still, also he occasionally he gets into some problems. But yeah. So, but in general, yeah. he knows a lot. Yeah, like and he he knows his stuff and he plays the middle games very very well. Yeah, this so, is where it gets juicy with the middle games. E4. Mm -hmm. This is basically the main position of the green yeah. it's... So uh -huh. you say it's a hundred years old. Is this then even considered? Is this a modern opening or? I mean, hundred years is a hundred years, right? But of course, there's. But it is still like it's it's a fianchetto. You give the center to the opponent. I mean, I can imagine that hundred years ago it was very difficult, and I'm. Yes. I'm not like fully aware of all the details, but in Austria we have a very big chess historian. He also owns a chess shop in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a huge article in the Austrian chess magazine, also oh. about Jens Grünfeld and this 100 year anniversary. And I think he mentions that he was unhappy with his Grünfeld Indian defense. Okay. <laughs> so like he was, I mean, he was playing some sort of semi taraj with a very similar structure. Yeah. And then when he came for the Grünfeld Indian defense, like it came after a few years that he just, I mean, he didn't play tournament chess. He tried to fix his repertoire on D4. And then he came up with this, but he was not too happy. But later it caught on pretty nicely. Yeah? Like it was, it was soon played, I think, in the World Championship match between Aliyehin and Oive, it was played. And Good point. And the nice thing, what I like about the Grünfeld is that usually in most lines, especially in the in the main lines, black has a lot of uh, choice. Yeah. Like you're in some way you're fixed. You have to, um, I mean, the opponent knows, let's say you're playing Grünfeld, but then he picks one line. But once again, then you have a choice to choose between a couple of very good options. And actually, I was thinking in a way that I could make actually another DVD recommending a completely different Grünfeld Indian repertoire in the main lines, yeah? Like, nice. so also like I tried to, I mean, like the lines I recommended were also the lines that I was going to play at the moment of recording. Like also in the time between recording and publishing, I played a couple of games, even with the lines that I recommend. My goodness. And if you see a game and you wonder, okay, well, I mean, why is the guy not playing the line that he recommends simply because there's, there's such a wide choice and you usually yeah. can, I mean, it, it really depends on the day that you are, that you want to play that, that variation or that one. Yeah. How beautiful. So it is. Yeah. So you have so many choices, which makes it difficult, of course, on one hand, but on the other side, due to the amount of choices, it makes it, um, yeah, you can go aggressive, defensive, whatever you feel like. That's, uh, that's nice. Yeah. And I, I also try to, to keep some mixture between explaining like what, what yeah. are we doing? like some basic information, like what is why doing. For example, it's very important that this P2 pawn is on C3 for the Greenfield Indian defense. Maybe we start with some, with some, let's say, basic options. Because only due to this, we can nicely attack the center. Mm -hmm. So if the pawn would be on P2, let's say we come to the Greenfield Indian defense and we don't pay any attention, we would play D5 here. Now, white would take, white would push e4, gets this nice center. We are forced to retreat the knight. And now the knight goes to c3, bishop g7. And at first sight, you might think, okay, it's not such a big difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, white has the center, black is trying to attack the center. But with the knight on c3, first of all, we will, it will be very tough to push c5. 
because the bond is hanging. Yeah. Or the bond could move to D5. Let's say, I don't know. Let's say oh. in some position like this. Here the bond could white could take, but white could also play D5. Yes. So it would be extremely difficult to attack this center. But on the other hand, like if the knight is already on c3, this is the reason why d5 is only played once the knight reaches c3. Yeah. And white is threatening e4. Because if white would succeed in playing e4, there would be no Greenfield. Now we play this, and here we see the huge difference that, for example, uh, if white plays knight f3, we can already push c5. Exactly and we can that. pressurize the d4 pawn and also have this pressure along the long diagonal. Good. Also, yeah. queen a5 could queen be a5 very useful move. Popular, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that looks. Uh, yeah, but how how the heck can white actually defend here? There's also a couple of options, but yeah, there's a couple of only moves too here. <laughs> yeah, like here, white is like a lot of choice. Like, I mean, he can't. Either, I mean, stabilize the center, the d4 pawn by going bishop e3. He can try to move the rook from the long oh, diagonal. Okay. He can play h3 as well. Okay. To stop bishop g4 indirectly, protecting also the center. Because basically, black later could play bishop g4 and increase the pressure on d4. And by going h3, white wants to fight this. I believe I believe that uh, white will also almost always castle on the king side, right? I mean, not in this particular position, but generally, if there is a Grunfeld, that is quite <laughs> uncommon to to go on the other opposite side, or isn't it? It's quite uncommon, but there are some cases. Mm -hmm. Like one line that uh, that comes to my mind is uh, this bishop d two line. Oh. There sometimes white ends up castling to the uh, gotcha. queen side. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, you have some serious knowledge. Nice. <laughs> Guys, we still have uh, 50 minutes left. Greenfeld, if this is something which you are interested in, which you never heard of, or if you think like, well, I, I, I love Greenfeld. Well, you know what to do. You are taking part in a raffle of 25 euro. So go for it. Sorry, Marcus. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> No, but the, uh, what I wanted to say is like I tried to find this mixture between explaining also some basic things because it would be much easier to remember if you understand why you're doing some things. Yes. Of course, if you go down, I mean, the line, it would be very tough to find like smart explanation for everything. But at least in the beginning, it's it's usually there's a nice point be behind almost any move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, the computer shows the move or it's played, but to to see the point, it's sometimes not so easy and it helps a lot with the remembering, yeah? Interesting, yeah. And the game that I wanted to show, it was bishop c4. This is also a very principled oh, way. Yeah. Because the idea of white is to put the knight to e2 and, and the bishop to e3. And in this way, the knight on e2 would be placed very nicely because it covers d4, but it also covers c3. Yeah, and it maybe even help f4 at some point. Yeah, but the main point, like white wants to stabilize the center. Yes. And f4 would be, I mean, f4 could work in some ways when you are trying to attack concretely. Okay, that's my typical, <laughs> sorry. I, I... <laughs> yeah, no, there, there are many lines with f4, but from a strategic point, I mean, if the knight is on e2, there's never the move bishop g4. Okay because he will just run into f3. Gotcha. And so I don't have this white squared bishop to, to attack the center. Mm -hmm. If the knight would be on f3, this bishop could take part in this. I understand, okay. So it's castles, it's bishop e3, both sides finish the development. And the main move here is actually castling for white. This is by far the main move. And here black has this is one great example because here, like, oh. I think there are five or six lines that are playable for them. <laughs> I mean, they're still like fighting position and white players are also going for this because it's an interesting game. Mm -hmm. But black has really so many setups. 
Nice. So what what do, do you like? Uh, is this the second Fianchetto one thing which you Yeah, the for? P6 move is, mm -hmm. is the one that's my, my favorite and the one that I'm also recommending. Nice. But the move that Rapport played was Rook C1 here. Okay. And this Rook C1, the point is that uh, sometimes white will wait with castling and attack on the on the king side. And it protects additionally the, the C3 pawn. So it has some pluses, but it also has a clear minus that black can take on D4 and play queen A5 check. That's always a little bit of a threat to keep this in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And we in some positions we see this endgame with the queen on with the queen exchange. But actually, it's in most of the positions, it's quite good for black because oh. in the long run, he has this pawn majority on the queen side, which is which is some advantage. Mm -hmm. And white has a bit more space. So in general, it's good for us to exchange the queens. Of okay. course, there would be also exceptions. And even with exchanged queens, we can very nicely put pressure on the center. And for example, here, it would be already very difficult for white to keep the pawns on e4 and d4. Ah, yeah, out of a sudden the center crumbles a bit, yeah. Yeah, and it's also a very important point that if the pawns are next to each other, it, this is always ideal because these two pawns, they will cover four squares. Mm -hmm. They really control so much, but if you're forced to move one of the pawns, then nothing. I mean, everything yeah. crumbles, yeah, yeah? yeah like yeah, it's. Yeah. Now, this guy is the one square, he controls two, but in between there are so many holes. Yeah. So if white is forced to move one of the bones, it's it's usually a good sign for us. So, but there is, there is, I mean, this absurd idea of moving the king to c3, or is this, that's not an option, cannot be right. I mean, yeah. then it would be e5 or something, I guess, or no, well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a finished development, just like bishop d7. Yeah, you don't even need to rush one. because white. Like, is already if you would have the king on e3, then maybe you could could do something like this yeah. because there the king is safe. But the journey on c3 just started. Yeah. Yeah. It will have to continue somewhere. <laughs> yes, true. You. I mean, my idea, my initial idea was to get one of the rooks on the d file, but then you have to move the king again at one point. Yeah. And it's like, but okay, it just takes too long. Queen d2 is also not the move here, but I just wanted to uh, say that queen d2 is not the move. King f1 yeah. is actually the main option. Okay. To keep the uh, rook on h1 and to push h4, h5. Mm -hmm. But the interesting move that was played, it was rook c3. Okay. Oh, that is quite interesting. Yes. And this move was, I mean, by the... The time that was spent, it it took a lot. I mean, Bashir took now a, a lot of time. Yeah. So obviously he was either not remembering or even completely out of book. I mean, that is a very peculiar move. So you have to think probably a little. Did you ever have something similar on the board like that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Rook C3, oh. it's, it's really a weird move, but it was covered in the DV. In the, in the DVD, <laughs> nice. in the video course. <laughs> Excellent. So what is, what is so for you at home, what is, what, how would you continue as Black? You can throw in uh, a move or two into the chat. I'm quite curious because, of course, now you have a lot of options again here, I assume. Depends, depending on how you want to uh, continue. So there's this weird, awkward pin. I, I would assume maybe you should try to tackle this or you say like, okay, that's how it is and just go with the rook to d8 or something. And then knight e5. Very yeah, like interesting. Rook d8, it's always a move. Yeah, like, yeah. But the question is also white's next move would be queen d2 to then, uncover again. Yes. And now you need to come up with something. True. Yeah. Yeah. So this is still not working with the uh, knight to e5 and uh, because 
no just uh, i guess no the... it's it's some option yeah but yeah no but i, it's I not guess as i moved the bishop it. somewhere yeah hmm. maybe my g4 comes into <laughs> It's so, yeah, it is very, um, it's very open with so many options. It uh, gives you a bit of appetite to look at the Grunfeld a bit more. We still Yeah, and definitely the, the solution is very nice in, in many ways, like the yeah. one that I recommended here, because it nicely shows the dynamic nature of the, of the Grunfeld. And the, the, the main idea is that uh, Black has to, has to attack the center. Yeah. yeah. Like it should be something connected against the d4 pawn most of the time sometimes also it can be against the e4 pawn by pushing uh f5 e and ah, okay sometimes but actually it's it's not here but the move that i recommended it was bishop g4 okay i just saw bishop e3 uh, e6 sorry and, I and like bishop e6 is it. actually a good idea yep. we might be forced to play it later on Okay. But it's also nice to provoke F3. Okay, I gotcha. Okay, okay, okay. And now, before going bishop e6 immediately, we can now put the other rook to d8. Whoa. And now, white is not in time to capture on g4. So if the capture, I don't see it yet, to be honest. So the capture happens. Yeah, well, what would we do now? That's actually, you probably see the the chat uh is yeah chat is, uh, so what what is happening for for black here <sighs> knight but well, i'm still thinking of knight e5 but it oh there's so many options it's very very uh, it's very nice even b5 i thought about earlier it was looks very crazy can be funny so no suggestions from the chat tell us marcus what is what is it's um now we have some huge tactic it's knight takes d4 it's simply the rook on c3 and the pawn on d4 why this why cannot protect oh. both oh wow okay and oh, let's say on course. yeah 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 i understand because of course you cannot take with the queen now we can take with either piece yeah we can take with rook even yeah it also comes in consideration yeah. because rook c4 would be a threat, but the bishop is probably the easiest. Yeah. Okay, clear. And yeah. Knight e2 is hanging, everything falls apart. And Very if nice. if white plays queen d2, then we return with bishop e6. Yeah. By the way, Frederick, uh, you got it right. Knight takes d4. Very well seen, Frederick. Thanks for being here for all the time. I appreciate it. Okay, um, yeah, and then we have knight e, uh, bishop e6. Very cool. And now the bishop uh, can be exchanged on e6, and I continued here, I think, for a few more moves. It was castling, mm -hmm. which looks the most natural. And here, like, could take on d4 and go e5 later. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, where the notes stop. And Usually, when such a high-level game like a Rapport against Virgil Graf was played, this is usually tested afterwards in, like, you see from very strong grandmasters who are maybe just a little bit below them by rating. Yeah. And usually the line evolves. Yeah, And one also a big expert in the Grünfeld Indian defense, Ivic, he even played just, I think, a few days later. He just followed everywhere till here. And then he played rook d3. Oh. His opponent. And here it was queen a6. And your idea with knight e5 comes into consideration. Uh -huh. It was thrown in the end against uh, Russian Grandmaster Sadana. But actually, okay. Ivich was the one pushing. Huh. So it's it's very nice that basically, and all this happened, it was, I think, February, February or March in, I think, maybe March 2022. So it's almost like half a year after, after it was published. How cool. Yeah. So, I mean, naturally I don't want to, I mean, I, I don't want to hide anything and it's also not possible yeah, because I would feel, uh, feel bad. Yeah? Like if I know that here's, here's one idea and I will not show and wait that I have the option. <laughs> but on the other hand, I also want to explain like, uh, 
why are we making some moves in the in the opening? Because I think first of all, it's always useful for even for strong players to understand why they are doing some things, yes. or just to think about it one more time. And for a bit weaker players, it can be very useful because it uh, eases the process of remembering. Nice. You guys from Austria are always so cool and precise with chess. Maybe it's just uh, the example, but Harald schneider Zinner, of course, has his own show. He's uh, explaining it so well. I have uh, still in the making, I hope it's all done, Regina Pokorna, uh, beautifully, how much effort she put into this. It is amazing. So, yeah, guys, the Greenfeld Indisch uh, with Markus Raga, if you really want to get absolutely absolutely deep into an opening well this is the total recommendation and no wonder these are two volumes and not only one in total yeah that's a uh, 10 hours of quality content and um yeah i hope you got your copy because you are taking part into the raffle we will check everything very soon about this and next week we will announce the winners i will do that and of course i will do it like in raffle style obviously yes uh marcus uh thank you so so much for uh showing us this beautiful group <laughs> this beautiful opening to to be precise yeah thank you for having me you can unshare the screen because uh it is yeah, it's almost over i'm almost sad because it was uh, so much fun with all you nice people. There's some people I never met before, like you, also Andrew, I never uh, met before. I know uh, both of you, of course, because I've seen your content uh, often enough, but um, yeah, this is a nice opportunity to catch up with some of the Fritz trainers. I want to have a meet the Fritz trainer interview with every Fritz trainer out there and I will make it happen. So far I covered like just 10. So um, there's still a lot to to be done with you. You're one of the yeah. next ones, Marcos. I will. I will. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Okay, excellent. You you will share one of your absolute favorite games. Uh, so it's also a bit of a pleasure for the Fritz trainer themselves. It's very very nice and entertaining to watch that. Okay, Andrew, Andrew, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. I'm oh, trying to be polite. Thanks. I'm trying to be polite. You know, I don't you, interfere with other other people. You, you know, when they're so <laughs> polite, and we we appreciate this big time. It is there. You go, Andrew. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I've been here all along, really, just <laughs> listening, <laughs> listening very carefully to what's being said. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think I always uh, use the best and nicest words to 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 talk about you. But um, uh, Chris was uh, already here too. Chris Ward. Uh, for for a short brief moment, and he he me made the sacrifice not watching football. Is football something which is uh, part of your life, your hobby, or not at all? Me? Yeah, not at all. No, I I I, <laughs> I prefer rugby. To be absolutely honest with you, and I, I'm still playing cricket. Excellent. At, yeah, well, at the is... age of at the age of sixty four. Wow. Which is which is killing my body, but it, it's quite good fun, you know. But you can't stop, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know peculiarly that... British game. <laughs> yeah, and a very, <laughs> very famous one to to I think I've recently heard that it is one of the most played games in the world if you cover everything. I mean there's Australia, there's the US too and of course Well in fact many teams. European countries have uh, yeah. cricket teams um on a smaller scale, but um at the same time, a, a lot of Asian players, you know, they they uh, they populate these teams. It doesn't matter. You can have a, a team from Iceland; it will probably be ninety percent Asian. <laughs> so, you know, because yeah. they're absolutely fanatical about the it game. Can be. So uh, it, it, it is spreading, and, uh, and women's uh, cricket too, especially, is spreading. A bit like women's chess. Oh, okay. We will get all of this. I will have an interview with you, Andrew, uh, soon enough, too, because uh, as I already told Marcus, I didn't have a Meet the Fritz Trainer interview with uh, him yet, which is a pity. And now uh, you, are, I mean, you've made so many Fritz Trainers. So, uh, you yeah, I can't count them. I've, I've, I've given up counting them, to be absolutely honest yeah, with you. Exactly. This is, this is the word I want to hear from everybody who's on the show. At one point, I, I don't know how many I made. I stopped at the like th volume 300 or something. I'll what tell you one thing that never ceases to amaze me. That these guys who record in um, outside their native language. I mean, this is an unbelievable uh, thing for, uh, for an Englishman, you know, because our level of education is so poor and we're so lazy. You know, we rely on <laughs> we rely on people speaking English to us. 
And, and yet you've got all these uh, fantastic recordings uh, with people speaking in fluent English. And uh, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me and uh, and get my admiration because it must be so difficult. I could never, ever deliver a chess-based DVD in another language. It's such a, it's a very, very good point you're making. And I actually didn't think about it that often yet. So uh, you're raising something really uh, good there. Marcus, where did you learn to speak English? In school or? Yeah, in the, in the school. It's also, yeah, you have this chess. Chess connects <laughs> to, to the language. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's, uh, like that's reading all the lucky. chess books, you get used of chess expressions and so on. And with my trainers, I also had the advantage that I could practice before in German. So I knew what I was going to show very well, yeah, like <laughs> because they are also in in German. That that is very helpful, of course. Okay, so Marcus, thanks for showing up. I wish you a thanks for having evening. me. And, and... Uh, now we have Andrew here, and uh, well, it's it's almost uh, sad, but this is, you're the last guest here. Can't yes, can't, it's what we call in England the graveyard shift. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, gosh, no, please don't. <laughs> the, great the last, issue. the last of uh, the last of the line. Now, before we start uh, to to take a bit the uh, look at your Fritz trainers, let me first share all of your Fritz trainers because yes, as we already mentioned, there are plenty. So I will put this in the chat right here. Please, I mean you, you. Everybody knows you. Everybody who is with Chase Base since a couple of years knows what you have done so far and what you are still doing all the time. And so many people appreciate it for, of course, a good reason. Now, uh, one of the latest ones uh, is the hippopotamus system of defense. It's actually very, you very that recent. One? This one here? That, exactly. <laughs> this one here. Yeah, exactly. You see how good there. I am at selling myself? I had a copy here. Now, whatever you buy from Andrew Martin right now in this last half hour of the stream, you will have a chance to get a 25 euro voucher from Chessbase for our Chessbase shop. It will be credited to you next week. You're just participating in the raffle and you can really take a look at the link, uh, whatever you think of an openings or other things. Um, there's probably something which you go like, oh, I actually really want to look at this and One point about this is, I, uh, we native born Americans only know how to speak English. Is that, yeah, Frederick Ryan, that's, that's, that's also a good point, of course. The hippopotamus defense, hippopotamus system of defense. A friend uh, or a chess colleague in my chess club, he never ever played anything else than this system. And he was quite weak in the beginning, but then he became super strong and really? a real, real good chess player <laughs> after all, because he didn't, he didn't never played anything else. And he never wanted to because he loved the system uh, so much by heart. What is this system all about and why is, does it have this super funky, funny name? Well, for starters, it's a, a very uh, much a question of taste, whether you like the hippopotamus or not. I mean, I, I think the hippopotamus has plenty of enemies. They they, they tend to claim that uh, it's a load of rubbish because it gives quite lots of space early in the game. <laughs> But um, in fact, it is a system which suits patient players or creative players or some players who just want to do something a bit different. Uh, in essence, you're letting your opponent have space, which is a dangerous thing to do against a, a good player. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are uh, creating a very tense position with with uh, very few exchanges on the board. And as long as you know when to break free, I mean, and have a good sense of timing and are willing to play long games, then it can be a very dangerous weapon. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've pulled out a game for this show, which is not on the DVD, but is very, very current and very, very appropriate for oh. um, what we're what we're discussing here. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to take a look at that. I just wanted to ask you something. Now I forgot what I wanted to ask you. Andrew, it's getting late, I think. Maybe the yeah, you, you, five I and think a half hours. I think that was a graveyard shift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, I feel like a little bit like a zombie. I think I look like a zombie too at the moment. So don't get scared. Everything is fine. We're at the chess Base show. We have our discount day. It's still going on and Andrew is with me. So, um, hippopotamus, what? Oh, yeah. First of all, I wanted to read uh, what Frederick wrote. I'm only playing animal openings from now on. The bird, hedgehog, hippopotamus. Yeah, I know bird was actually human. Yes, there is There's a lot of um, uh, uh, animal openings in this uh, kingdom of chess. So, uh, yourself, 
did you ever get in touch with the hippopotamus and uh, what was uh, yeah and which time was that yeah I, i i think i've got a couple of games on my d on the dvd um, which you one played game i played time. against jim plaskett which was a total disaster i mean you have to have good judgment when you play the hippo because the point is you can get absolutely massacred if you get it wrong yes yes, uh, yes. and this happened against plaskett so i you know reveal all on the dvd and and uh, where i went wrong and uh you know what sort of accidents are, are waiting to happen in the wings but then i played a really good game against john shaw uh grandmaster from scotland uh again very creative and dynamic game where i think i got it right and um so it was a mixed experience but at the same time it was it was quite interesting you know to to see how the game developed from from an apparently cramped position Nice. Yeah. Okay. I would say um, the stage is yours if you want to share the screen and show us yeah. um, the game. Yeah. I also I wanted to point out you're you're making it makes so much sense what you're saying because this friend of mine from the chess club, um, he he sometimes he was he had a thirteen hundred rating in the very beginning and he sometimes lost against twelve hundred but he also ever so often won against seventeen hundred eighteen hundred and nineteen hundred ratings too. So that was really. If, It was so funky and uh, interesting because, yeah, it can go both ways quickly. Well, it can. That's right. And uh, this is a game from um, the World Rapid Championship played in Warsaw in 2021. Very big. And oh, uh, right. again, Hans Niemann, he's like yeah. everywhere. My goodness. Well, I don't, I don't know this guy very well. I mean, he, he seems to be a very strong player. Is that, is that right? That, that might be the case, yes. He is a freaking strong player. He's is he uh, a young going guy? to the 2700 region very soon, actually, yeah. Young guy? Very young guy, yeah. Now, okay. well, quite young. He's not even 18, I think. Or he just turned 18, something like that. Well, he's playing Onishchuk. Um, that is... Uh, I believe is a... Name. Yeah, I think it might be a veteran GM, if I'm not yes. mistaken. I, I might be doing him an injustice. He might be very young too, but I don't think so. <laughs> Anyway, the point is that the hippo seemed to be an incredibly good choice against Neiman because um, huh. what happens in this game is that White starts firing bullets right from the off. You know, he thinks he's going to absolutely wipe Black out. And um, one of the nice things about the hippo is you can start with various move orders. I mean, on the DVD itself, uh, I talk about the modern defense move order, which yeah. we see here. And I also discuss um, another way of getting into the hippo via the move B6, mm -hmm. which, uh, no, certainly not that, uh, which has the mirror. <laughs> so more, it's a different animal. Uh, yes, um, which has the, the merit of um, cutting out a lot of direct white attacking systems. Yes. I mean, I, I play Blitz a lot uh, on the internet these days, and a lot of people... Well, virtually everybody plays the system with bishop e3 if you play the modern and, move all it is very I, topical indeed i i have oh that's oh okay that is so funky yeah this so, one so, or the austrian attack with f4 yeah. but generally bishop e3 is is played i don't know whether that's been recommended somewhere but uh huh. virtually everybody plays this and um what happened in this game was that on proceeded to set up a hippo structure after the move a4 um of course white doesn't need to do that white can play queen d2 white can play f3 and after those moves black would probably go for b5 at some point but a4 forces black to adopt a kind of hippo structure here which is exactly what onishchuk does and neiman just sets up this you know direct attacking formation h4 so you know it's typical of a young aggressive uh highly talented very self-confident player that they they bash out these moves <laughs> but at the same time you can't take these moves back and this is one of the great strengths of the hippo setup you know point, black yeah. is lying low in the water almost inviting white to attack mm -hmm. and it's a very fine line between uh getting a dangerous attacking position and over extending If you see what I mean, yes. I mean, I don't know. What do you think of that move H4? Is that overextending, or is that uh, it's is that so, just natural? It is so interesting. It it seemed uh, I just had Marcus there, right? And he he was talking about the Greenfeld defense. So he mentioned that uh, H4 was for a long time a move where we go like, well, then I'm going into the Banco Gambit, and then I'm just uh, winning the game probably. But uh, now, due to the engines in theory 
um, the the H four moves are popping out left and right. Well, Actually, they are only, against only virtually on the right, everything. But... Against everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly against everything. Yeah. So it is. It is interesting <clears throat> to to um, yeah. I'm, I'm also a, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm an H four player. So even if I have I, if I'm facing the hippopotamus, I'm also always H uh, fouring. You got so, some sy sympathy for White's play here. I, I, I little, <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I, I, well, I, I probably would play almost exactly the same to tell right. you the sad truth. Let me just flip the ball for a second. Does he look better from the White side? Oh, look at. This. I don't know. I, look I, at this. <laughs> yeah, look at look at it. But I'm I'm quite suspicious about White's play. I think I, I think White could be going. Uh, a bit I mean, over to, the top, uh, right? Overboard. Over I mean, the top, yeah. you have to remember that I'm losing the majority of my games if I play chess. <laughs> so um, I, there might be some truth in it. So well, there is a kind of rule in the hippo, which I discuss on the DVD. Yeah. When white plays a4, black should probably play a6. And when white plays h4, black should probably play h6. Okay. Um, the so idea not, being, so, I suppose, uh, that if white pushes on, black's going to go g5 and, yes. and position. Often enough, there's also if... But there's, of course, g4 now, but uh, h5 is also often uh, something which counters h4. But in this particular hippopotamus, it makes a lot of sense to go for h6. I understand completely, yeah. Well, you know, I've played this sort of position a lot in Blitz, and, and, and black, <coughs> black is getting very cramped here. I yes. think the main problem is that white can blast through with f4, f5. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that is, that black, is the case. What has black got to play here apart from that? And then f4, f5 starts to look pretty dangerous. So the um, H6, G5 gives you a lot of more opportunities. I completely agree. Interesting. Well, he just developed his pieces, Knight G2. And then Black set up the classical hippo formation in the modern um, the modern way. I mean, yep. you asked yep. about the origins wow. of the hippo. Um, as I discussed on the DVD, the origins came from an English player called J.C. Thompson back in the 1950s. But his interpretation of the Black side was nothing other than crazy. <laughs> uh, again, I feature some very comical games on the DVD. I think it's on the YouTube promo. Hilarious game he played against the Grandmaster in the simultaneous display where he played one F6 and then <laughs> set up this three-row system. It's wow. an absolute joke. But um, this is far from a joke. And, and now White's got to decide how he's going to attack the black formation. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, he set up this, this turbocharged formation ready to go. I mean, the first, the first problem for White is where is he going to castle? Yes. If you think about it, he's lunged forward with these pawns. Where's he going to put his king? Mm. So that's the first issue, really. But of course, black is very passively placed, or so it seems, and uh, a long way from white's king. But the, However, yeah. Black's next move shows a really good understanding of the position, I, and he plays I, C5. Exactly, exactly. This is, yeah, and this is what you mentioned by you have to know when you have to push forward and this is exactly that's it moment. yeah precisely i mean if he doesn't do that what else could he play exactly. i mean i guess he could play e5 yeah no uh, but c5 opens up perspectives for the bishop on g7 it's such i guess that, that's systems. why it's so good it's so funny because the system it <coughs> is the, those moves are so common i mean you also always have to evaluate the position but it is really really often um this these breakthrough moves which make the difference after all yeah and yet you have to say this is actually quite an interesting position i mean this is one thing about playing the hippo you're guaranteed an interesting game yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> as long as you're willing to take the odd terrible defeat uh, as i suffered against plaskett then it's quite an interesting <laughs> opening to play and now white's got to decide whether he castles on the queen side or whether he plays rook d1 and i guess in the end neiman decided to play rook d1 okay um, which again it raises suspicions about you know where's he going to put his king so black played queen c7 mm -hmm. and now d5 which is to me already a sign that white is unsure how to get into uh black's position because um you know yeah. you think for me the logical move here would be to take the pawn taking right you, yeah you know, you've got yeah. better development you've got more space open up the game but black just takes back and if white comes forward again, I mean, you could just see, you know, this this is how white would, would play. Then I think black can coolly castle on the queen side. And the engines show that black's got a better position here. Nice. Um, it is a it is an absolutely typical hippo game, this one, mm. where, you know, white has, white has overextended already. So to his yeah, credit, yeah. 
Neiman played d5. Black took it. White recaptured. And now Black castled on the queen side, which is kind of the ultimate flexibility, isn't it, really? <laughs> and now all this h4 stuff on the king side looks a bit out of place, if you, yeah. if you ask me. Um, so, but anyway, I didn't stop Neiman with <laughs> tremendous self confidence. He starts pushing forward with his pawns. Black takes uh, the open file. White gets off the open file. <clears throat> what do you think of that move, Arna? <laughs> oh, Andrew, that is. Um... I know you've been doing this for about six hours. <laughs> it's no, but it's, it is. It is. It um... is. It's very interesting because I learned this technique from Carsten Muller. You know, he, he, I, I recorded the studio for about six hours. Then he comes on with his end game magic show and starts asking me all manner of sort of battery of really difficult questions. <laughs> I learned this Your technique. experience, I've said that chair many times, experienced the same feeling. <laughs> By the way, Condor Passant, I've ordered the DVD about the Benoni smiley face. Very good, very good. Very good. Um, uh, anyway, let's have, let's carry on because Black played King B8. White played g5. Mm -hmm. I guess he's relying on that move. But Black now, funnily enough, was the one who opened up the game. And then he played f6. Oh, that's a that's a nice move. Well, I it is. It's, it's hitting all. White on the rebound, yeah. isn't it? Um, and, you know, kind of making a target of the king on f1 because it's only Black's going to play, you know, f takes g5. And then the position's opening up. And Black will get the e5 square for a knight. So white has suddenly got to be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be fair to the players. This was a, a rapid game. Uh, but black is now hopping into to squares, which which white has left lying around. And the game has suddenly turned on its head, far from having a sort of winning attack. Mm -hmm. White is now on the defensive. And I imagine this, this was pretty uncomfortable for, for Neiman because... From what you say, and from looking at his games, he's obviously an enormous talent. You know, it's not a nice place to be on the defensive. True. But knight h4, it's, very it's, good. And this, and this just plays this game brilliantly, in my view. I mean, his plan was to, he was attacking so heavily, and out of a sudden it uh, turns around. That must be also a psychological... Um, yeah, I mean, in a game, well, when you haven't got much time to think as well, you, you can be uh, overwhelmed yeah. uh, by the, the way the game has, has changed. And now White surrenders his dark square bishop, which is, a, again, a massive concession. The knight comes back, hopefully, to defend the king. And now Black expands on the other side of the board, oh. which is a surprising twist. That, that and I think one of the reasons he does this is positional. He wants to make a target of the pawn on d5. And uh, by playing b5, he actually prevents the move c4. Um Again, it's a move which requires very good judgment because you think, well, what maybe White could get to the A file, but but I think Black's got it all covered. Mm -hmm. And the D the D five pawn is, is looking quite tender. Well, anyway, <laughs> White played um, <laughs> White played Queen to D three. Black played F five. That opens up the Bishop on G seven. Mm -hmm. Knight came back. Black pushed on. I mean, White is fully on the defensive here. And now C four which looks okay, was simply answered by bishop takes b2. And that, I think, is a very important pawn. Was. Was, yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is a strange game, isn't it? I mean, yes. you, you'd think when black was crouching in that stance after about 12 moves, it, simply nothing like this could have become possible. But um, yeah. It's one thing about the hippo. The game transforms itself. It occasionally. does. And, you know, it's so funny because I haven't seen a lot of hippo games in a longer time. And it all comes back because I've seen so many times in, in probably 15 or 16 years we were in the chess club that uh, of that guy who was always playing the same. Because you always look in, in the team games, you always look on the board and it, you always have those same moves. And it annoys you, but you also go like, it's cool. <laughs> Because it's just like sometimes it's really, really nice. Well, look at his next move. Yeah, I thought about this, to be honest. That is, um, that is a beauty. Yeah. And, so uh, you you have to take back with the bishop, though. So because pawn is too eager. But that's such a beautiful opener. 
Well, White was obviously afraid oh. of it. He played Queen to B3, didn't take the Knight, and now Knight takes yes, C4. Yes, I thought about that too. Another incredible move. Nice. And White's pieces are Falling very right vulnerable. Right. I mean, he, he retreated, but it turns out the black, the White Knight on B5 hasn't got a square. So <laughs> now the Black Bishops are raking the board. And <laughs> essentially here, White, White, is, White is losing. He played Knight A3 to save the Knight, but now another bone crusher. Rook takes f4, yes. check, and then bishop takes e2, queen e3. Well, of course, if he goes uh, king takes e2, what have we got here? Have we got c4? Is that the idea? I think that's the idea, isn't it? C4. And then a crushing check on f2. Very checkmatey. Yeah, very checkmatey indeed. So queen e3. I mean, I guess you, you've got to forgive them. This is a rapid game. Bishop e5 to block white out. Oh King takes. Queen check. Rook d3. And Take black simply took the knight. And, and white is bound hand and foot by the pin. And the eighth pawn will win. And what I liked about that game is it's completely modern. It's completely contemporary. It's played yeah. in 2021. And it's a game between two top grandmasters. And the way that black dismantled you know, who is, after all, an incredibly dangerous young player, to me says that the hippopotamus is, at grandmaster level, entirely playable as long as you choose the right opponent at the right time. <laughs> you, you, mentioned this you mentioned this club guy, and, and, and he can play it all the time. I think at the highest level, you have to choose your opponent, and maybe it can be used as a surprise weapon. Nice. But that, I thought, was a brilliant game by, by Black. Absolutely stunning, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. This is, and this is also the thing which I, um, which I thought was so annoying because you would think, obviously, or this is just my wrong thinking. It's my little brain, probably speaking, and it's also late. <laughs> but you would think that the hippopotamus is like a quite defensive opening because you are pulling your pieces back, you, and you let the opponent make h4 moves or something but it is is so often the board is actually on fire maybe it was particularly because this uh, this uh, friend or colleague of mine um was yeah always forcing it a bit but there were very often i saw a queen move to h1 or a1 uh, giving some more power to the bishop attacking the king side of the opponent like that and then pushing the pawns forward, and it was, it was uh, so explosive at one point, and it starts so little, yeah. So, well, I did and, discuss all this on the DVD. Uh, yes, I give, yes. uh, in fact, in uh, quite a while back, I wrote this book called "The Hippopotamus Rises," there we go. Uh, which uh, that was published by Batsman back in the nineteen nineties or even two nice. thousands. I can't remember which. It was a long time ago. And uh, I talk about the game plan, you know, what sort of uh, mental attitude you have to get into to play the hippo. Because if you go in with the wrong attitude, then you could get completely crushed because you're giving the opponent space to start off with. But it is a really interesting opening. And, uh, you know, uh, even if you don't want to play it, you, you could think about it and study it. And uh, I think your chess will improve as a result. It does anyway, exactly. Yeah, because... Uh... Since it is a bit, a bit of a special opening, uh, once you are covering those things, your brain gives, gets a lot of new insight about some different positions and it, you can only learn uh, from this. So, Absolutely yeah. right. Andrew, my goodness, it is uh, almost 10 o'clock. We are at the end of the show. I'm really happy that uh, you were uh, my, my last uh, um, <laughs> guest because you were bringing in the last uh, power which I needed to to also <laughs> keep you awake. This <laughs> yeah, keep you keep you awake. Yeah, with this super interesting uh, uh, Fritz trainer. You guys at home still have five minutes left. Go for it now. If you enjoyed the show, I would also um, like you to to just tell me if that was something which you can imagine should happen. Maybe in November again someday, or maybe even also next year. Maybe a bit bigger. Maybe with more raffles and with more Fritz trainers. Maybe they can give you some tactics to solve uh, life on your own. Something like that. So a little bit of feedback that would be nice also for myself to see um, how this whole concept is going on. But I have to say um, I had a huge great time with all those different... Uh, super strong um chess players here all from all over the world literally <laughs> uh 
And um, yeah, we learned something about uh, the Komodo dragon. We learned something about very special openings from the bird, as Frederick Rhein already uh, mentioned it. Uh, we didn't have the hedgehog here yet, but the bird, the hippopotamus, and yeah, you forgot <laughs> the orangutan. And the condor passant, which is also another animal in our chess kingdom, says, loves all chess products, uh, chess based products. I've ordered so much and I'm always happy. Well, we are also happy that you are happy, of course. Um, Andrew, is there anything else coming up in the pipeline? Do you have something which, uh, because you'll never stop, which is which we all love you for and appreciate. So, is Well, there yes, I, I've just uh, been in Hamburg, in fact, and uh, I've recorded a DVD on the Close Sicilian. Um, but not just the Close Sicilian with Knight C3 and G3. Uh, there are also other, uh, other systems on the DVD, the Big Clamp, which is white plane 2d3 and bishop e2 on move two, which again leads to a different kind of close Sicilian uh, type of position. So three systems in one and um, just introducing the, the listener to uh, all these different anti-Sicilian systems. And you can make a choice when you finish the DVD, which one you want to play. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. Well, this is something to look forward to uh, all you fans of Andrew Martin and his Fritz trainers. Um, yeah, I think um, that that was basically his Lars Lindhardt says fine show. Thanks a lot, Lars. Yeah, why God, you were here also all the time for everybody. There was there was never less than uh, forty people here, which is also a, a nice thing to say. I have to I have to say. Um, thank you everybody for watching, for being here. Thanks once again, Andrew, for um, for also being here. And um, everybody, I wish you all a lovely night or a good day if you're in America or somewhere else or Guatemala, uh, which we also had some some people here from. And yeah, uh, Andrew, I will just contact you to make a fix a date with the Meet the Fitz Trainer our. Uh, interview show we will have we'll make this happen in a couple of weeks I'm, I'm very busy but you know there's always there always has to be time to to make this happen here uh, well thank Axel you for, thanks for inviting me it was a pleasure andrew is great by axel uh, great show thanks again kind regards uh marcus ackerman marcus yes i got you on the list great show arnie thanks a lot guys thanks a lot for being so that's it we close it we call it a day good night Aunt. good night yes. andrew Bye -bye. And good night.